will be starting in five minutes exactly. Uh, the voice <laughs> Is the voice working now? Voice is it there? It's for all the people who are the audio on the mute? No, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I we so will be starting with the session. We will be starting with the session now. And uh, So, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the fourth advanced pediatric endocrinology symposium. This is a program which we conduct every year. It's part of the hybrid program which is done. This uh, program is being uh, run both uh, on the offline as well as online mode. So, we have got participants from across the globe who are participating. And over the next two days, we will try to focus different aspects of pediatric endocrinology and try to dissect the latest evidences which are there with regards to pediatric endocrinology. So now if we look at uh, why we need to really go ahead in terms of doing this program and what are the important factors to look at. So I'll just touch base with regards to a brief history and overview of this program. So this is organized under the banner of Grow Society, Medi Classes, and Regenerative Center for Diabetes, Endocrinology, and Research. And uh, we have, whenever we started all this, we were told that pediatric endocrine disorders are usually very rare. They are complicated. They require cumbersome workup, and they require expensive treatment, which is, that's why people use, find it difficult to really use pediatric endocrine tools, sources and tools. Now, what we realized that the major limitation was not affordability. The major limitation was mainly in terms of awareness. Awareness amongst the physicians, awareness amongst the uh, overall general public. And that's why we started a number of programs to increase awareness in that perspective. So we started around 10 years ago with a practical pediatric endocrine course. And subsequent to that, we conducted a number of programs across the various regions. And we developed modules in that perspective. So there have been over 100 workshops, and this is a fourth advanced course, which is mainly targeted towards endocrinologists, pediatric endocrinologists, and uh, and that regards. We started off with our e-learning portal in the form of the YouTube video, which provides comprehensive uh, awareness. We now have 400 videos with a huge uh, watch over the web, which cover the entirety of pediatric endocrinology. We then launched a more structured platform in terms of online learning at learning.growsociety.in, which provides specific validated tools to highlight key aspects about pediatric endocrinology and practical assessment, including the fellowship courses, uh, which are two-year hybrid programs and the other courses which are available online as well. We have got a number of publications, and today we are happy to be announcing another publication today. We have got this mobile app, which allows more systematic evaluation of pediatric endocrine disorders, which has been validated across various tools. And it's really been a help for pediatricians. We are coming up with more technology resources which will help out make and manage in a personalized, intelligent manner with regards to the pediatric endocrine care. 
So coming out of this program, we have got wonderful faculty which has come from across the country who is going to over the next uh, uh, two days focus on various aspects of pediatric endocrinology. We had recently concluded our uh, hybrid closed group workshop which was there. And now we will be starting off with a state of the art session. This session essentially involves four key aspects of, of uh, pediatric endocrinology in the form of SGA, learners, thyroid disorders, and DNP. And we have got eminent faculty who have come from different parts of the country who will be starting on this. So I require you invite Dr. Uh, Bani to invite Dr. Pra Vijay to start this uh, program. Vishnu and Dr. Himan have been involved with us for the last I'm decade or so, so it's really great to have them again on board. And now I'll invite Dr. Vijay to start off this session from that regards. He'll be talking about SGA. So Dr. Vishnu, maybe you can do the topic a bit. Implanting metabolic syndrome. So we have we have to be clear idea about what and what complications they are prone to and how to deal with it. So Dr. Vijay, yeah. uh, thank you. A big salute, and uh, I think Dr. Anurag sir needs clapping for a mega event. Actually. Dr. Anurag sir is not only a great uh, clinician, but I salute him for producing so many great clinicians. And that was the real need. What has been not perceived by the government administration and heads off to you for your efforts. And uh, we have begun this journey for last at least 11 years and so. I am associated with Dr. Anurag sir. And you can see the spectrum on things because of the gene to tell the people that how to help the society in a scientific manner. So first we have to enable ourselves as a pediatrician who are having interest in pediatric endocrinology. Because pediatric endocrinology is just decoding the things. If we are not coding, and decoding the thing properly, probably we are going to mess the things. But if we are going to have a structured program like this in various platform and hand holding, so hand holding plus after that this advanced course. So there are so many things. So if you want to learn Dr. Anurag and the team medi classes and grow society is always there. Too. So to thank you, uh, Adrak sir, for a wonderful platform, what you have created over the years together. And this chain is um, again growing well. And now uh, you are not only just the country, rather at other places also. So thank you so much. Um, so what one good news is there that uh, we are now coming out with the third world country to the signing India. And so on the healthcare system also. So now we are able to provide, to take care of so tiny people, so tiny babies, which initially were not uh, going to see their own first birthday. But again, the responsibility is that now we are going to have a greater chunk of SEA baby who has been saved by tremendous work of neonatologists as well as pediatrician. So what is scope of my talk is that what is the definition of SGA? What are the consequences of being born as What are the various domains which are going to be affected if there is a baby who is SGA? So neurodevelopmental and cognition, pubertal maturation, gonadal function, thyroid function. There are so many things which these 
babies need to taken care of. Yes, so what is the definition? That being born SGA is defined as having a birth weight and or birth length. It means that either the weight is less than minus two standard deviation or the length is minus two standard deviation or there is affection of both that is weight as well as length. Both are compromised. So that is the definition of SGA. Um, what is the catch up growth in height is defined as a growth rate of centimeter per year above zero standard deviation. What it means that more than the median for conversion gain diameter because growth velocity is not a constant parameter. Appropriate catch up growth in height is defined as growing in the normal height mean, taking into the account of mid parameter. So, this is also very important. If you are going to take a single number, what it is going to tell you that what is the status of that particular child for that particular population. But if you are going to compare with the mid parental height, this is the uniqueness of that baby. So, this is really important to understand the both things that is, where exactly the child is for mid parental expectation and where the child is for. Population. What is the short stature? Short stature is defined as a height below minus two standard deviation for A and Z. Yes. Um, very bluntly, we usually intermix the things IUGR and SGA. Whether they are saying no, absolutely not. IUGR is a diagnosis of pregnancy. So this is if you have taken ultras also, IUGR refers to inappropriate weight gain in estimated fetal weight and abdominal circumference during certain period of gestation based on ultrasound measure. So this is not a clinical, irrespective of the size of it. Most but not all infant with IUGR may born with it. It means that even if you have that documented IUGR during pregnancy, it may not be necessarily culminating to SGA. Conversely, many SGA in fact will have not experienced IUGR. So IUGR tends to cause a relatively large head and length related to birth, that is brain swelling. So this is a quite busy slide. What just I want to convey a message that we have to see whether the child is just tiny with all the things normal, that is normal faces, or this is a dysmorphic child that is associated with so many things. Because if dysmorphic, there can be some genetic association. It doesn't mean that a normal short SGA child is not going to have genetic variability. Yes, there are some role of epigenetic factor, and it is a high time to have help of genetic um, investigation too. So, SGA requires knowledge of gestational age, correct gestational age, precise anthropometry measurement at birth, appropriate reference data. So, now we have our own IUT WHO uh, combined WHO IUT flowchart. So, country and ethnic specific normative data. So, we don't have to compare our children on the CDC chart. So, this is really important that we chart we are using. Neonates can be sub classified for SGA for weight, SGA for length, or SGA for both weight and height. What are the consequences? So, consequences will be depending on that what is the age of the child. So, uh, neonatal period, infancy, childhood, and puberty. So, neonatal basically for survival. Mostly they are going to have hypoglycemia, addition of glycemia, and other things. Now they are, they are not coming to us usually. That is the job of neurologist or pediatrician. Infancy, what you have to see, see that is regular visit. And that is catch up in weight and length is highest in a CA born infant. Between three to six months with high catch up in weight and length. 
What is the catch? That accelerated postnatal weight gain increase the long term risk of obesity. So here, this is the catch. So there is always a very balanced tight rope walking that you have to maintain the optimal growth of a CA baby. On the other hand, you have to restrict over nutrition to prevent the long term metabolic complication later in. So the increase in fat mass occur earlier and is greater than increase in muscle. So lean mass is probably not increasing earlier. Rather, adiposity is more common feature in NCA children. Um, so when to say the child is not catching up? So if NCA do not achieve their genetic high potential, Falling on an average one standard deviation below mid belt. So, this is usually a normal thing. But children born as here, height below minus two standard deviation at three, have seven fold risk of remaining short. So, this is the time where you have to really intervene. So, that is, and how we are going to achieve that is, serial plotting of the child is really important. And I have discussed in the coming slide that what are the frequency that each is going to be followed up. Factors that positively influence child growth include female sex, multiple birth, taller parents, and more rapid gain. These are the factors which is going to promote the catch up growth of the child. Yes, neurodevelopment and cognition. At one point of time, we say that brain sharing. But it is really spared all the part of brain. No, there are some domains which are going to be affected, and hippocampal is one of them. So, particularly, what in the studies uh, has been seen that each they are going to have some specific domain problem. That is, they are not so enough in mathematics. Uh, they are going to have some problems with spatial organization. So, there can be some issues. To be taken care of. Both malnutrition and prenatal stress exposure seem to. No, no, carry on. Okay. So, mal during infancy growth factor in sensitiveness stimulate the growth and elongation of synapses, that is, synapto, uh, synaptogenesis, neuronal forest. Malnutrition down regulates. The growth factors that are critical for normal development. That's why it is very, very important to have good nutrition during pregnancy. And there is a concept of thousand days of nutrition. Moreover, both malnutrition and prenatal stress exposure seem to alter the pl synaptic plasticity in the hippocampus, which is one of the several mechanisms for impaired spatial learning and memory loss. In yes. So these children can have more chances to develop attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, learning difficulty. But the good thing is that it doesn't mean that all SDA are going to have low IQ. But yes, so this is a Swedish study which has been conducted, a uh, long term uh, prospective study, what they have shown that they are going to have some little bit lower IQ, but majority scored more than 85. So, thus they are within the normal range. So, if you are going to talk about the number of IQ, probably they are going to achieve less. But if you are going to take the normal range, yes, they are coming into the normal range. Pubertal maturation, gonadal function and fertility, this is really a problem if you have not taken care of, that is in the regular follow-up. So most children born as they have normal pubertal maturation. So what is the catch? Catch is that they can have slightly younger age at the onset of puberty and accelerated tempo. That is, they have started early. So um, that is just signal number one, that they have started early. Second, that progression is a bit fast. So final achievement of height is going to be reduced. So their final height is going to be reduced. So that so this is the disadvantage for 
other stages that is final life. Premature adrenarchy can occur in girls born SGA who experience accelerated weight gain during early childhood. So here is also a catch. That is, if you have not maintained the balanced nutrition, if you are just focusing that you have to increase the weight, you have to increase the weight, because parents are obsessed about that. That ये आईवीएफ वाला बच्चा है इसको किसी तरह से बचा दे अभी तो बच गया इसका वेट जल्दी बढ़ा दे प्लीज डोंट डू दैट अर्लीयर प्रीटेल मैच्युरेशन इन गर्ल्स बोर्न एसजीए इंश्योर्स फ्रॉम अ मिसमैच बिटवीन रिड्यूस प्रीनेटल वेट गेन दैट इज एट दैट टाइम देयर वाज रिड्यूस्ड एडिपोजेनेसिस एंड एक्सेलरेटेड पोस्ट नेटल वेट गेन विद ऑगमेंटेड लाइपोजेनेसिस एंड दस एंड ऑगमेंटेड नीड फॉर लिक्विड स्टोरेज so where this liquid storage is going to be because there is no storage capacity or less storage capacity so what is going to happen that these liquids have to consume in some other place so that's why there can be immature adrenarchy in the children so this mismatch might explain why girls born with accelerated postnatal weight gain have an increased risk of early onset insulin resistance one This lipidemia second exaggerated adrenarchy and premature puberty, a slight gender age adrenarchy, and higher incidence of polycystic ovary syndrome. In contrast to girl born SGA without accelerated postnatal, so it means that for children of SGA, balanced nutrition is the key to prevent so many complications. Yes, so there can be some discordance in the pubertal onset and biochemistry in the girls. I'm not going into the detail, and we have discussed that if overnutrition is there, these children are going to have signs and symptoms of metabolic syndrome and PCOS propensity. Now coming to the thyroid function, preterm newborn SGA have PSS level a bit within. High normal range, and this increased incidence of transient thyroidism. So that can happen, and these children usually don't require antioxidant or peroxin replacement therapy. Just you have to watch them. Now coming to the bone mineral density, that is, BMD is on an average lower, but within the normal range, the children got this. So again. Like IQ, range is the normal, but on the lower side. Yes. What are the metabolic? Yes. Okay. So I'll finish it up. Just uh, what are the metabolic consequences that they are going to have? Um, this glycemia and other things. And what are the risk factor that not only alone, but if there are some other risk factor that is. Ethnicity, we do have is in that is Indian family history and routine evaluation of metabolic parameter is not recommended for children born SGA, but for those with one or more risk factor which we have enumerated. Yes, so there is a fifty uh, genotype hypothesis that there are going to have some permanent change if. intrauterine environment is not conducive so that can be a counter productive in adulthood uh just one slide that um, visceral fat is rather more important you can see here that bmi can be um, having some problem that these are the two people having same bmi but one is having good lean mass and another is having More visceral fat. So this is really important to understand how to manage these babies. So clinical management of children born SGA early life that you have to promote exclusive breastfeeding. Again, this is going to have a good growth without causing adverse body composition. So this is at least six months of exclusive breastfeeding to be given. No extra supplements to be given to these children. what are the additional change challenges in low income country that good nutrition with the vulnerable society is really not going to get 
So these children are going to have severe malnutrition. So this is again, we have to see. Uh, what are the take home messages that defining SGA is being born with birth weight or length or both? Children born SGA should be carefully followed in the first year of life to evaluate their growth, weight gain, and neurodevelopment. Particularly, the very low birth weight, that is, very premature babies, they should be taken care of at least regular neurodevelopmental assessment. Avoid additional nutritional supplementation. Uh, in case of persistent short stature, minus 2.5 two standard deviation at two years or minus two standard deviation at by four or five years. So this again will uh, need uh, pediatric endocrinologist opinion. Purposely, I have not discussed the role of growth hormone therapy in SGA children who are destined to be short because it will be discussed in the later uh, presentation. Yes, genetic testing should be considered since an increasing number of underlying epigenetic causes can be found. So it is going to give you an overall scenario that how your patient is going to uh, respond to your various modality of treatment. Yes, so growth hormone treatment will be uh, discussed later in detail. Routine evaluation of metabolic parameters is only recommended for children with risk factors such as overweight, obesity, and families. So thank you so much for your patience listening. And um, these are the uh, things. Chavo. References are um, So uh, there is a paper which, is, which has been consensus guideline 23 has been published and uh, I really advise you all to follow that because that was really, a, this, that is a really very good paper. So thank you so much. I think that was a wonderful talk, Dr. Vijay. He covered the entirety of SGA in a very short time. So Dr. Vishnu, what is your experience of SGA and their metabolic complications? I have seen that uh, these children are particularly prone for uh, peculiar metabolic syndrome like PCOS, growth failure, and dyslipidemia. And, and from the acute perspective, Dr. Himang, you must be seeing a lot of these complications, acute ones as well. Yes, sir. Actually, uh, whenever uh, any child born SGA, we should sensitize the parents that uh, their growth should, should be measured properly and as, at an appropriate time, they should be uh, evaluated by the endocrinologist so that can be catch up early and they can uh, prevent from uh, permanent complication to be developing. That's a type 2 diabetes in a SGA patient. So it is preventable if we uh, sensitize the parents early. I think that's a very, very important point. So now I'll request uh, um, Dr. Dhwani to kindly hand over a momento to Dr. Vijay. And it's been a wonderful association. Dr. Vijay, please. <laughs> So, I think we'll give a big round of applause to Dr. Vijay for this wonderful presentation. Thank you. So, we'll now move forward for the next uh, session, which is on uh, the important topic of Turner syndrome. And for this session, we are really honored to have with us Dr. Vikrant Anand. Dr. Vikrant is a dynamic uh, pediatric endocrinologist and he is uh, currently working in the Mayo uh, Hospital, Mayo Medical College. He's a professor and head there and uh, he has been very much involved in pediatric endocrinology for quite some time. And uh, what we'd like him to talk about is the role of Turner syndrome and especially about three aspects about how do we diagnose Turner syndrome. What are the cardiovascular effects and what are the reproductive effects? These are the three major things Dr. Vikrant will talk about. We will have a session on growth hormone uh, next uh, part. Tomorrow we'll have the session on that. So, Dr. Vikrant, can you please? Yeah. So, thank you, sir. At the very outset, I would like to thanks Anurag Vajpayee, sir, for making me a part of this wonderful feast. So, today we are going to discuss the Turner syndrome in entirety. So, as all of us know, Turner syndrome is the most common sex chromosome aneuploidy in girls. The incidence is about 1 in 2, 2,500 live births. So, one thing should be, so the crux of the Turner syndrome, it lies in the finer genetics, which is involved in the uh, syndromes. 
so as all of us know ki xy there is a lot of difference between x chromosome and y chromosome x chromosome is a bit bulkier than y chromosome that means it is carrying extra doses of genes so the genes have to be homologous for both x and y chromosomes so it undergoes the process of lionization so after that that the homologous uh, regions which remain on both x chromosome and the y chromosome are the pseudo autosomal regions 1 and 2 that are present on both the ends of the chromosomes so it is the uh, uh, pseudo autosomal region 1 that is most commonly that is the causative uh, that is most commonly the cause for the turner syndrome so it is the sox gene dmp15 and the timp13 gene that are involved that are embedded in this pseudo autosomal region 1 and this sox gene is responsible for the growth failure for the skeletal manifestations for the mad lung deformity for the becky metacarpia and bmp15 is responsible for the development of the ovary so if bmp15 in the pseudo autosomal region 1 is affected it is going to lead to a lot of ovarian dysfunctions and timp is responsible for the cardiac defects apart from this there is pr2 region that is also present at the ends but it is important to note here that any any problem within the within this pseudo autosomal region 2 is not going to term, be termed as turner syndrome it is going to lead to ovarian failure because it has got the fragile x chromosome gene that is going to cause that is important for the sustenance of the ovarian function but you are not going to label it as uh, uh, turner syndrome so just uh, we have a brief outlook at the genetic spectrum so the most common cause is the exo typical 45x0 that constitutes about 45% of the cases apart from this it is the iso xq duplication that is the xy arm is lost and xq is duplicated we are more prone for autoimmune thyroiditis and all these manifestations there may be mosaic patterns which are responsible for the 15 to 20% of the causes of the turner syndrome apart from that there is the ring chromosome ring chromosome means some part of the chromosome have been lost and it has been refused together and it leads to a ring formation xist is involved in this and that is responsible for the inactivation of the genes and this leads to mantle retardation and syndactyly of course there can be a marker chromosome that is very important to identify because the very basis of a gonadectomy because of to prevent the notorious complication of gonadoblastoma is because of this marker chromosome marker chromosome is something that is neither x chromosome that is not y chromosome but we keep a higher probability of it being a y chromosome and that will be responsible for uh, gonadoblastoma and the increased risk of dysgenoma so when do we ask when when should we order a karyotype for a turner syndrome so it should be suspected when uh, any one of the major criteria that is some prenatal like Uh, hydrospitalis is present or the cystic hygroma is present some antenatal marker is present over there or there may be cardiac defects or there is ovarian dysfunction characteristic species may be present so if any one major criteria then we are justified to ask for a karyotype in this regards and among the minor criteria the renal involvement the growth involvement and the nails involvement and, and one more important thing to recognize to be recognized here is any women who is having premature hearing loss less than 40 years is a appropriate candidate to be asked for a karyotyping for as far as x chromosome is concerned so let us look at some of the antenatal uh, markers of uh, turner syndrome so this is very important ki what pre test probability is there so it is high when if we are ordering it for cystic fibroma or we are just and it is low when we are looking for a incidental detection so it can be in the form of increased uh, nuchal uh, translucency hydrops cystic hygroma real anomalies or short femur short long bones so ideally cvs should be done or depending upon that gestational age amniocentesis can be done one important thing to be realized here is nipt non invasive prenatal testing is unreliable so anybody who comes out to be turner syndrome on non invasive prenatal testing he or she, she should be uh, again tested after the birth to make out whether she is having turner syndrome or not it has to be confirmed so the criteria is it should be a phenotypical male female and the and the males have been excluded the atypical genitalia have been excluded and as we already talked about deletion distal to xq24 that is involving the par2 or the fmr gene that has to be included from the definition of turner syndrome so the criteria for the di diagnosis we have already talked about karyotype may at least 30 cell karyotype should be done and if the uh, index of suspicion is very high then we can often go to 50 50 cell karyotype also 
Sometimes with aging, the bone marrows, they cease to produce a number of cells which cannot be detected in the peripheral blood. So in that case, in that scenario, fibroblast urine or the buccal mucosa samples can be taken for the karyotyping. And one more, the recent guidelines which indicate that below 5% mosaicism after 50 years of age, that should again be disregarded as the cause of Jenner Turner syndrome. So malignancy and the screening for Y material. So this is a vital part of the management of Turner syndrome because anybody who is harboring Y material, he's, she is prone for gonadoblastomas. Around normal people have got a 7 to 8% risk, but the risk becomes 10 to 30% any year. When the Y line is present, so there is a slightly increased risk of other malignancies also like colon cancer, meningioma and breast cancer. And marker chromosome are features of virilization to be looked for. And it is the fish that has to be ordered for looking for Y chromosome. So this, we should, we do not have to look for Y chromosome in all the cases of Turner syndrome. It has to be looked only when there are features of virilization or there is mar the presence of marker chromosome. Okay, so this is the clinical practice guideline for the care of children, uh, Cincinnati 216 guidelines that uh, clearly shows us how, how should we follow up a patient of nephrotic, uh, Turner syndrome. So we have to look for the clinical parameters like height, SMR, blood pressure, BMI, they have to be done at the baseline and at all the visits. You have to look for the autoimmune manifestations, autoimmune problems like thyroid and Celiac disease that is done when the when the girl is about two to four years of age, and then it has to be followed annually. Apart from that, the metabolic parameters have to be looked for. Hb A1c, liver function test, and lipid parameters should be done. That that should be you should start looking for this metabolic abnormalities at around ten years of age. That is the age of puberty, and then uh, annually they have to be looked for. As far as the hearing, eye and cardiac manifestations are concerned, hearing and eyes at the baseline, you have to do an examination. And then every three monthly, you have to look for, you have to screen for these complications. As far as the cardiac issues are concerned, this is a major cause of concern because it is the most common cause of mortality in a girl with Turner syndrome. So it has to be done at the baseline and it can be depending upon the age of the girl. If it is less than 12 years of age, of course, cardiac uh, echo can be done, transthoracic echo can be good enough, but more than 12 years of age, the girl should be followed with a cardiac MRI. And then depending upon the erotic size index, we have to make out is the follow-up when the follow-up has to be done. Then of course, signal examination has to be done because of lymphedema. There is a lot of problems like horseshoe kidney, unilateral renal agenesis. So at the baseline, ultrasound looking for this renal problems has to be done. Hip examination, of course, that is the problem of the neonat neonatal age group that has to be looked for is spine x-ray, in particular for scoliosis at around five or six years of age. And in particular, we have to be very vigilant for this complication because with the growth hormone therapy, this, is, this may exacerbate and it may deteriorate. And again, there may be problems with bone density. So one important thing to be noted here is that DEXA scan has not to be done in girls before 18 years of age. It has to be done when the girl has achieved adulthood and the adult doses of estradiol have been administered to her. Because otherwise, if you are doing for younger girls, it is going to overestimate the low bone mass because of the decrease in size of those individuals. And again, Neuropsychological parameters have to be looked for the baseline and then have to be followed up. Okay, so as far as the management of Turner syndrome is concerned, it, it revolves around the pillars of the management are the growth hormone therapy, they are the pubertal induction, you have to look for the cardiac manifestations, fertility and bone health. I'm not going to discuss the growth hormone section because it is going to be taken up in detail tomorrow. So we will be discussing with the pubertal induction aspect and how to be follow the cardiac manifestations. So as far as the cardiac manifestations are concerned, it is the most common cause of mortality and morbidity in a girl with Turner syndrome. There are a number of left-sided cardiac defects that are more common in Turner syndrome in the girls with the Turner syndrome, like coarctation of aorta, bicuspid aortic valve, pulmonary venous defects, and hypoplastic left heart. Apart from that, all these are risk factors for aerotopathy, the most dreaded complication of aerotic dissection, the weakness of the wall of the aerota, and as a result, aerotic dissection may take place. So we have to be wary of this complication. And any girl should not be contemplated to have pregnancy without getting a cardiac MRI done. There may be autonomic dysfunctions like tachycardia and the loss of nocturnal depth of hypertension, which is again a risk factor for aerotopathy that has to be looked for. 
in ecg ecg has to be ordered and we have to look for short pr interval increased qt interval in particular it deserves a special mention because some drugs which are commonly used like azithromycin cisaparide voriconazole that can prolong the qt interval there may be right excess deviation and a halter monitoring has to be done if qt interval is prolonged more than 0.46 seconds so the cardiovascular management if any of the risk factors are present like bicuspid aortic wall like pulmonary venous defect like coarctation of aorta then surgery has to be done the child has to be taken up for surgery there is no need for the routine endo endocarditis prophylaxis for the girls of tunnel syndrome for minor procedures like dental problems or something and of course you have to monitor for blood pressure and if it is raised then ac inhibitors and beta blockers have to be constituted and you have to avoid qt prolonging drugs so now an important part of the management as far as the cardiovascular management is concerned is the aortic size index if the index is more than whenever you order a echocardiography you have to ask for the the cardiologist for mentioning in in particular this aortic size index if it is more than 2 uh, if it is more than 2 this is a matter of concern if it is more than 2.5 then it will be regarded as severe of course the risk factors have to be assessed for like hypertension pregnancy bicuspid aortic wall and coarctation of aorta and of course the management lies in the proper control of the blood pressure it has to be kept below 135 by 85 and appropriately it has to be managed with the ace inhibitors and the beta blockers so the intervention as per aortic size if the size is less than 2.5 no restriction of physical activity is advised if it is between 2.5 to 3 some restriction the intense activities have to be avoided if it is above 3 then of course ace inhibitors and beta blockers have to be instituted and if it is above 4 then it, he, he, she should be taken for elective surgery so the approach for the cardiac management a baseline ecg echo cardiac mri and blood pressure have to be monitored the risk factor for dissection have to be looked for then the aortic size index if it is normal then okay then it can be divided into the low risk group moderate risk group and high risk group depending upon the aortic sizes we have already talked about and the presence or absence of the risk factors then if the girl falls in the high high risk category then this trans tracheal echocardiography or the cardiac MRI have to be performed at six month interval if it is in the moderate category then it has to be followed yearly and if in the uh, low risk category, then of course it can be done five years. So two minutes are remaining. Okay. So I would just like to speed up the pubertal progression in tenor, 15 to 30 percent of the mosaic tenors, they, they tend to have entered into spontaneous puberty, six percent may achieve menarche and less than one percent pregnancy. So you have to look for FSH and AMH label, and depending upon them, you have to look for the pubertal progression. If pubertal induction is not there, you have to gradually induce the property after looking for a spontaneous puberty and the and the basics lie in the you start at 10 percent of the doses of the estradiol you increase over a 2 to 2.5 year age group interval and then progesterone has to be added after at least 2 to 2.5 years or the once the vaginal bleed has occurred the roots can be oral or the transdermal oral roots have got their own problem like it affects the igf production thrombosis dyslipidemia because it affects protein c lipase and the angiotensin 2 so the so the most preferred route is the transdermal route that is preferred so a few words about the transdermal route we can the most viable the most physiological estrogen at present available is the 17 beta estradiol it can be available in the form of gels in the forms of matrix patches or it is also available in the form of meter dose uh, inhalers so uh, it is 17 beta estradiol you have to be very gradual you have to start with 0.5 milligram alternate day for six months then 0.5 milligram daily then you have to escalate in two years time to two milligram the equivalent doses can be looked for of course ethereal estradiol and conjugated estradiol are not preferred nowadays if 17 beta estradiol it is easily available in the market and right now it is the product of choice as far as the uh, pubertal induction regime is concerned this we have already talked about the one thing that should be noted is that this is the regimen for transdermal patches of course they are available in the strengths of 25 micrograms 50 micrograms 100 micrograms they can be started as a one fourth patch for six month duration then you can one four one four for all the seven days and in this way gradually you can escalate with the help of transdermal the most physiological approach for the administration of estradiol 
a bit about the progesterone supplement didrogesterone is the most physiological one but of course it is costly it is non androgenic it has got less mineralocorticoid effects of course micronized progesterone can be uh, used in its place or if uh, the, the 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 time tested drug that is divary may be used midroxy progesterone in 10 mg for 10 to 12 days of the menstrual cycle so we have to induce the pu puberty once the puberty has been induced we have to put the patient on maintenance therapy the maintenance therapy can be well rate followed by progesterone or it can be the oc pills depending upon that depending if we can have monthly menses or three monthly menses and of course the blood pressure has to be monitored along with this the fertility options if the girl is less than 12 years of age then there is only one thing that is ovarian cryopreservation, but the studies, studies have demonstrated that it, it has got a limited role. As far as girls more than 12 years are concerned, two side, if the, it depends upon the AMH value. If the AMH is more than two, then of course you can go for oocyte preservation. And uh, if the AMH is less than two more than 12 years of, of age, then of course oocyte donation can be looked for. So artificial reproductive techniques, we have to rule out contraindications first, and then we have to look for it. So uh, again, pregnancy is the risk factor for aortic dissection. We have already talked about that any girl with Turner syndrome should not be contemplated to enter into pregnancy without having a proper cardiac evaluation done. And depending upon the ASI index, we can, if it is less than two, we can go for vaginal delivery. If it is two to 2.5, vaginal with epidural analgesia, and if it is more than two, Point five. Then, of course, cesarean section can be looked for. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Vikran, for this wonderful presentation. And you've really covered a very extensive topic. And I think the key messages probably coming out of it is one, of course, that we need to be very cautious about cardiovascular morbidity. The major cause of death in Turner ultimately may be cardiovascular and metabolic complications. And pregnancy, we talk about fertility a lot. But pregnancy and fertility, we need to be cautious. I think that's a big message that if there is aortic dissection, if there is significant hypertension, if there is a bicuspid aortic wall, be cautious in terms of pregnancy. We will be taking the questions at the end of the session. We'll see if there are some from the uh, net. So uh, I think uh, they are not yet. We'll take the, the questions in the later part. I'll request Dr. Vibha to kindly uh, facilitate uh, Dr. Vikrant. And I'll request the chairpersons to continue with the session, the next talk. Now I invite Dr. Suganda for her talk on thyroid disorder. So Dr. Suganda is uh, 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 working as a pediatric endocrinologist at the... Uh, at uh, Muradabad and she has been uh, trained under Dr. Raghupati. And uh, so we would like to hear from her about the key aspects about the management of these uh, disorders and thyroid disorders are a very wide variety of disorders. We will be focusing largely on congenital hypothyroidism with regards to the thyroid nodule as well as the thyrotoxicosis and latest guidelines what they are saying. So Dr. Suganda, welcome. And it's indeed a pleasure. So uh, we'll invite you to discuss about this important aspect. Thank you, sir, for that introduction. Uh, being associated with you is a privilege in any which way. And uh, uh, I take this opportunity to thank you for giving me this uh, stage. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, I'll be talking about state-of-the-art thyroid disorders. And uh, I'll be covering three main topics here. The newborn screening guidelines for congenital hypo, uh, management of a case of uh, graves, and an approach to a case of thyroid nodule. So let's begin with the first topic. As we all know that congenital hypo is the commonest cause of pre preventable mental retardation in India. But because of lack of newborn screening programs, many cases were being missed. And that is when ISPE uh, provided access to locally relevant guidelines for better screening and management of these cases. So these guidelines came out in uh, 2018. But before we proceed on to the recommendations, it is prudent here to know about the postnatal TSH surge. So uh, basically what happens after birth is that the TSH begins to rise after 30 minutes. 
which is followed by uh, T4 levels after a few hours. And uh, this peak uh, happens, the uh, postnatal surge peaks at around 24 hours of life and it can prolong up to uh, day two to day three and uh, uh, thereafter the decline happens. So here if a sample is to be collected for newborn screening, it should be taken uh, via a cord blood sample which is taken at birth or if a postnatal sample is to be taken, it should be collected on day three and day five. So um, uh, going on to the advantages of a cord blood sample, it is relatively painless, avoids the TSH surge and can uh, be done for early discharges. But uh, the other uh, disadvantage being that it cannot rule out other uh, screening modalities and it can be affected by uh, perinatal factors like asphyxia. While the advantages of a postnatal sample is that we can screen other conditions like uh, CAH, phenylketonuria, galactosemia. It can even be done for home delivered children, but it is uh, painful to the baby and can be affected by a prolonged TSH surge. So the recommendation is whether uh, you go for a cord blood sample or a postnatal sample, which should be collected within day three to day five, whatever uh, is uh, locally available. So then uh, the question is whether to send for a primary T4 testing along with a backup TSH or do a primary TSH level. So here when primary T4 level is done, we, uh, uh, we see that they were able to pick up all cases of primary as well as central hypothyroidism. But the major disadvantage here was that they were uh, missing out on compensated forms of, uh, of congenital hypo, which is largely seen with cases of ectopic thyroid. And ectopic thyroid, as we all know, is a, a, a common cause of congenital hypo. And then here we see that uh, they were picking up false positive cases, like in cases of TBG deficiency or a sick uh, newborn. So the recall rate was high, which eventually led to uh, this strategy being less cost effective. With uh, primary TSH uh, testing, it was seen that it was uh, able to pick up all primary cases of congenital hypo and the recall rates were less here. So this strategy of a primary TSH testing provided to be uh, more cost effective in a setup like India. So the recommendation is to do a primary TSH uh, testing. Coming on to the different scenarios of what cutoffs should we look at. So any uh, TSH which is uh, well above 80 is highly suggestive of a case of congenital hypo. Here the uh, repeat conf confirmatory sample should be sent and uh, the child should be immediately started on levothyroxine therapy, even without awaiting reports. Uh, so uh, in a different setup, if a TSH of more than 40 is encountered, an immediate recall is done. So by immediate recall, we mean that we wait for at least 72 hours of life. The next sample should be sent beyond 72 hours of life. So uh, uh, immediate recall is done, the confirmatory sample is sent, and looking at the report, we start the child on therapy. So, but if the TSH is between 20 and 40, an early recall is made. So, what do we mean by an early recall? So, here the child is called between uh, around 10 days of life. So, here we allow the factors causing a transient elevation in TSH to settle down and then we do a uh, confirmatory sampling. So, whenever we are uh, doing a recall, we send for a confirmatory sample and that sample should also include pre-T4 and total T4 levels along with a repeat TSH. And if the free T4 levels are less than 1.17 or a total T4 of less than 10, this suggests that there is hypothyroxinemia. And looking at the TSH, we can say that this child is a case of congenital hypo. So providing with a, a, a better or a simplified approach, we see, um, which is given by this flowchart. Here we see that TSH, uh, when a TSH is done and any, um, any level above 40, we should consider this as a high risk group. So send for a free T4 sample uh, in a wave of confirm confirmatory sample. Look if the free T4 is low and commence the uh, child on therapy. In uh, other situation, if we see that if TSH is less than 20 or an early uh, collection of samples or cutoff of 34 is also considered, then a, le a level less than 20 does not mandate treatment and uh, these child can be uh, follow up closely. Uh, for a level which is between 20 and 40, we what we do is repeat TSH. Call the child at two weeks of life, repeat a TSH and look at the values. If this TSH has gone down to 10, then that means this child does not require any treatment. But if it is uh, still above 20, so even at two weeks of life, a TSH level of more than 20, 
do a repeat testing uh, with free T4. And if T4 is low, start therapy. But for cases who are in between, like more than 10, but not above 20, it is better to give time, evaluate this child, and then commence therapy. Uh, then in, in few risk groups, uh, a second screening should be done at two weeks of life, like in cases of prematurity or sick newborns, or especially in cases of uh, Down syndrome or same-sex twins. So the recommendation is uh, that any child who is biochemically diagnosed to have congenital hypo uh, should undergo an uh, etiological workup in form of imaging. The imaging should never be the reason to delay initiation of therapy. And the modalities available are uh, thyroid nuclear scan or ultrasound. So both should be done if, uh, if depending on the availability and the cost involved, it is better to do both. So in a uh, thyroid nuclear scan, we use technetium 99 and we look for the uptake. So here, if the uptake is uh, at some ectopic, uh, it is an ectopic uptake, then we label this as ectopic thyroid. If the, uh, level, if the uptake is increased, then that can be a case of dishormonogenesis or iodine deficiency. But in case of absent uptake, we do an ultrasound and confirm this. If on an ultrasound, uh, there is the gland is not visualized, then probably this is a case of agenesis of thyroid. Um, and if the, if the gland is seen on an ultrasound, we do TRAB levels. So presence of TRAB levels suggests that this is maternal blocking antibodies, which is the reason here. And if the TRAB levels are absent, then probably this is a case of sodium iodide symporter defect or TSH receptor resistance. So uh, going on to the treatment, the therapeutic uh, level of initiating levothyroxine is uh, 10 to 15 microgram per kg per day. But in cases of severe uh, pre T4, uh, severe uh, low levels of pre T4, you can start with a higher dose of 12.5 to 15. The uh, frequency of retesting will be the first uh, test should be done at two weeks of life after initiating therapy. By the time uh, we expect free T4 to normalize, then four weekly by the time we expect TSH to normalize. And in case of any dose adjustment, a repeat TFT should be done after six weeks. The uh, target of uh, the target of treatment is to maintain free T4 in the upper half of normal range, which is uh, well within 1.4 to 2.3 and TSH uh, between 0.5 to 2. So that was in a nutshell about congenital hypothyroidism. Going on to the next topic, which is a management of pediatric graves. And my presentation is based on the uh, European Thyroid Association guidelines that came out in the year 2022. So as we all know, graves is an autoimmune disorder, which is characterized by the uh, excessive secretion and production of uh, uh, thyroid hormones and uh, uh, with a suppressed TSH and it is uh, characterized by presence of TSH receptor antibodies. And in some cases, we uh, can see ocular signs also known, known as Graves orbitopathy or in very few cases, we see a dermopathy which is known as pretypical myxedema. So going on to the management of uh, uh, pediatric Graves. So here, the first line of therapy is uh, use of antithyroid medication. So uh, drugs like Carbimazole or methimazole are to be used in children. Propyl thyrosol is usually not preferred because of the risk of hepatic failure. So uh, the mechanism by which these drugs act is that they act as preferential substrate for thyroid peroxidase and prevent tyrosine iodination in uh, thyroglobulin and thus they block the synthesis of uh, thyroid hormones. So the strategy here was, uh, it was uh, being seen that some uh, people were following dose titration method and uh, there was another therapy known as block and replace. So what happened with dose titration that here, the, um, uh, here we were starting with a smaller dose and then trying to uh, attain euthyroidism in children. But with block and replace, we were trying to start with a larger dose, block these hormones and render the patient hypothyroid along with levothyroxine uh, replacement in a due course. So uh, just in brief about the framework with dose titration is start with a smaller dose like generally we use carbimazole, which is started at 0.25 to 0.5 milligram per kg. And as the patient becomes euthyroid, reduce the dose by 25%. Or if the patient becomes hypothyroid, reduce the dose by 50%. And then uh, uh, with along with uh, free T3, free, uh, free T4 levels, you can titrate the uh, dose. And once the child uh, is well maintained on a low dose of, uh, of uh, carbimazole, we can 
do trap uh, levels here and if the trap levels are undetectable we can plan and stop uh, uh, anti thyroid medication in such children and uh, just as mentioned with block and replace we start with a bigger dose like somewhere around 0.75 mg per kg of carbamazole and um, if free t3 t4 t4 levels are still high and tsh is still suppressed we increase the dose here by another 25% uh, render the patient hypothyroid and start replacing this child on levothyroxine but um, uh, the recommendation here is it it was found that with block and replace therapy children were not biochemically stable so now um, as was uh, studied in this uh, trial 81 patients were studied and they were compared with block and replace versus dose titration it was seen that there was no evidence to suggest that uh, block and replace is better so in fact the guidelines say that uh, block and replace should not be practiced and we should go by dose titration method what are the side effects of atd mild pruritic rash in urticaria seen in 10% uh, liver dysfunction is seen uh, cholest in cholestatic liver dysfunction with thionamides and hepatocellular cellular damage with uh, ptu but the major side effect here to remember is agranulocytosis so if in a child who who is on atd and they develop fever or sore throat uh, it is prudent to do an absolute neutrophil count it is if it is uh, less than 500 we should immediately stop atd uh if the counts are between 500 to 1500 then we should closely monitor these children a uh, cutaneous rash are generally symptomatically managed but another point to remember here is that we should keep a watch for mucosal blistering because this can herald a uh, steven johnson's like syndrome and with liver dysfunction uh, we should always do sgpt levels if they are above three times the normal limit then atd should be stopped now when should we uh, plan to stop atd in children so it is seen that uh, generally a treatment of 3 years is required or 5 years or more if the likelihood of remission in children is low like to begin with the, uh, the dysfunction was more or they presented with a large goiter then we can plan to continue therapy for 5 years and then later try and stop therapy uh, what will help us more will be the measurement of tsh receptor antibody levels if a child who's uh, on low dose of atd with min with undetectable trab levels then this suggests remission and you can plan and stop atd in these children uh what how should the child be followed up after stopping therapy uh they should be monitored closely in the initial uh, few months like three monthly follow up in the first year of life and then every six month and then annually for the next 10 years and if pregnancy is being planned uh then a preconceptional tft and trab uh, levels should be done in these children coming on to the new modalities so uh, there were case reports uh, available that uh, some people were using rituximab and tsh or a tsh receptor uh, anti blocking uh, agents like k170 but uh, the uh, sufficient it was insufficient to suggest the use of these agents in pediatric age group but uh, we found two uh, studies where in one a uh, trial of 27 patients was being done where rituximab was being used as an adjuvant therapy to the usual dose of uh, anti thyroid drugs where uh, only a single dose of rituximab was given and uh, it was found that there was a significant increase in the remission rate at 2 years of interval similarly uh, a specific monoclonal antibody known as k170 is being used in 18 subjects with graves and graves orbitopathy and it has been found to be relatively safe and well tolerated with no immunogenic response so these two agents rituximab and k170 hold a uh, potential use uh, with respect to pediatric graves management now uh, going on to the definitive mode of uh, treatment here so two options are available radioactive iodine or uh, surgical management so uh, just like uh, iodine radioactive iodine is also taken up by the thyrocytes and with nuclear decay uh, there is emission of beta irradiation which causes Uh, apoptosis of thyrocytes and uh, tissue necrosis so uh, how to calculate the dose of radioactive iodine three methods were there one was the fixed approach where a, a fixed dose of uh, radioactive iodine was given between 200 to 800 megabecquerel uh, then another was limited personalization where we were calculating the dose so 15 megabecquerel per gram of uh, thyroid tissue which was estimated by doing an ultrasound but the third dosimetry is the preferred uh, method here so dosimetry will basically calculate the maximum dose of uh, radioactive iodine 
that can cause homogeneous distribution within the gland leading to functional thyroid ablation uh, ensuring remission Oops. so uh, going to the contraindications here that uh, pregnancy or planning pregnancy is another contraindication breastfeeding and and uh, young children are the absolute contraindications here so uh, what do we uh, do before planning radioactive iodine is that we stop ADD 3 to 7 days prior and then after the radioactive iodine is delivered we start the uh, anti thyroid drugs after 1 to 2 days and uh, first clinical evaluation should be done at 6 weeks after giving radioactive iodine and as the patient becomes uh, hypothyroid, then levothyroxine therapy should be initiated. And if the symptoms persist, a second course of radioactive iodine can only be given after a period of 12 months. Total thyroidectomy was another mode of definitive treatment where uh, sur with surgery, the overactive thyroidine was removed. And uh, this was uh, found to be relatively safe if performed by an experienced high volume surgeon. And uh, uh, the patient was uh, immediately rendered uh, hypothyroid and uh, levothyroxine should be replaced lifelong. Going on to the third topic, uh, uh, which is an approach to a case of thyroid nodule. So thyroid nodule basically is an entity which is distinct from the th surrounding thyroid parenchyma. And um, here uh, we see that the causes are extra thyroidal in a subset of patients, which is very less. And the majority of cases are thyroid benign uh, uh, conditions like adenoma, thyroglossal cyst, and ectopic thyroid, and malignancies. So here, the uh, point to remember is that the risk of thyroid nodules in uh, children is less, but the chances of uh, it being malignant are three to four times higher than in adults. You are require, uh, requested to sum up in two minutes. Yes, sir. So before we go on to the approach, let's first see about the uh, uh, the investigations here. We do an ultrasound, uh, thyroid ultrasound, which looks at the suspicious uh, features like microcalcifications, hypoecogenicity, irregular borders, and vascularity, and a taller than wide nodule. And the ultrasound should also comprise uh, to look at the cervical levels for presence of any lymph nodes. And uh, once the thyroid nodule is confirmed, we do a fine needle aspiration uh, to look at the uh, con uh, and do a cyt cytopathology. So cytopathology is based on Bethista classification and we can also do uh, genetic markers on a fine needle aspiration. So uh, while doing molecular genetics, we should remember BRAF V600E mutation, which is if found positive, uh, can be a likely cause of thyroid malignancy and red proto-oncogen mutations, which can be associated with medullary thyroid carcinoma. TSH can also be done if found suppressed and it suggests an autonomous nodule and this is usually benign, so we can do hemithyroidectomy. Uh, serum calcitonin has mentioned that uh, in patients with the medullary th thyroid carcinoma or, or high-risk groups like uh, family history of MEN2A or MEN2B, it is prudent to do serum calcitonin levels. So what do we do here is confirm the nodule by ultrasound, look for the suspicious features. If suspicious features are present, uh, then grade them according to the Bethesda classification. Uh, in uh, Bethesda, one and two are generally benign. Only a close follow-up is required. We can repeat the ultrasound at six months. And in Bethesda, three and four, suspicious features, then do a repeat uh, biopsy at six months. But in Be Bethesda, five and six, it is uh, highly suggestive of malignancy. So we should go for surgical intervention. Treatment of choice is total thy thyroidectomy because it is seen that higher chances of malignancy and even uh, extrathyroidal spread is seen in uh, children. And just to uh, uh, highlight the importance of two new agents here, that uh, some case reports are there that uh, use of lenvertinib was uh, seen with, uh, it's, it is a multiple kinase inhibitor, which, against, uh, which is active against VGFR1, 2, and 3. And it was seen to be well tolerated in patients uh, with advanced thyroid carcinomas. So this is one agent and another sorafenib, which is currently actually FDA approved for adults with cases of RCC hepatocellular carcinoma. And this also uh, pro proves uh, beneficial in, in the days to come with uh, uh, children with radioactive iodine resistant cases and children even with pulmonary metastasis can benefit from these agents. Thanks a lot, Dr. Suganda, for Thank this you, wonderful sir. session. Thank you, sir. And you have really tried to cover the entirety of thyroid, which is a big topic, in a 20-minute capsule. So I think the key messages is that we now have our Indian guidelines. We all should follow up in terms of the ISPE guidelines. 
very clear cut. Everybody should go for neonatal screening. That's, I think, the big message. In thyrotoxicosis, you mentioned about radioactive iodine, and it's becoming maybe a moment of choice, particularly in older children. And nodule, I think one thing which we always neglect is that any child with nodule, we have to be very, very cautious. And if it's bigger than one centimeter, do an ultrasound, do an FNAC. I think that's absolutely important. I'll request Dr. Vasanta Sen Gupta to kindly felicitate uh, Dr. Suganta, please. So it was uh, quite an interactive session. So we are heading towards the last talk uh, of the overview session. Um, please. Thank you. Thank you. So we are heading towards the last talk of the session, and that is going to be on disorder of sexual development. So, uh, yeah. So now I invite Dr. Manoj for his talk on DSD. Uh, Dr. Manoj Agrawal is a consultant pediatric and adults and endocrinologist at Shalvi Hospital, Ahmedabad. He has completed his training in pediatric endocrinology from Regency CDR Kanpur. He was part of the ISPAR Research School in March 2023 held in Italy and was selected for the esteemed Global Fellow School at MP 2023 in Argentina. He has authored several chapters in the Pediatric Endocrinology Textbook of Medi Classes and has several national and international publications to his accolade. Welcome, sir. So I think Dr. Manoj doesn't need an introduction for most of the audience here because he has been involved in our so many programs. And he has just very recently uh, completed his fellowship and started in Ahmedabad. So it's indeed a pleasure that we have got so many of our alumni who are now continuing the good work across the different parts of the country. They seem to be more concentrated in the western part, at least at the moment. So all three of them are in a triangle of Rajkot, Vadodara and uh, Ahmedabad. So that's there. But then Neha couldn't come in because then a couple of them are abroad. So I think definitely it is a good to have the students uh, come up and doing so well. So uh, I think the sort of sexual development is clearly a big thing, which always we tend to worry. So Dr. Manoj, you've got 20 minutes to make everything clear to everybody. Please go over to you. Uh, so thank you, sir, for giving me such a nice opportunity. And it is very, uh, very pleasant uh, uh, opportunity for me to speak in front of my Kanpur family. So if I start about the one case, then 20 year old newborn who, who presented with the vomiting and the uh, feeding difficulty. You can appreciate the genitalia as it is visualized in the this picture and treating, treating pizza, uh, pediatrician has sent back with the, this atypical agenitalia and after 10 days patient came with the hyponatremia, hyperkalemia with uh, like a picture and 17 OHP was very high and the diagnosis of 21 hydroxylase deficiency was made. While in the second case, a three-year-old boy who has a micro penis and referred for the DSD evaluation and 17 OHP was done. It was no low to no, uh, 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 normal to high. And here you can appreciate the normal strotal and normal testes and in the picture. So this case was micro penis and the evaluation for the DSD was done. So if I talk about the DSD, then DSD is often this kind of niche condition. The, because of some confusion, it is often missed or often missed. So a particular approach and what are the uh, uh, causes for the DSD that we will discuss in this entire 15 to 20 minutes. So if we talk about the prevalence of the DSD, so it defined how you are defining DSD. Suppose if you are taking the proximal hypospediasis also for the DSD evaluation, then your prevalence is very, very high. It is like one to two percent, means one in 50, uh, one in every 50 child. But evolution for the DSD required in one in thousand child. And it is not about the atypical genitalia. It is a medical and the social emergency. As we have seen in the first case, if the diagnosis of the 21 uh, hydroxylase was made previously, then we could have prevent the salt crisis as we seen in the pre uh, first case. Second thing, careful workup is required. And third thing we have, uh, while, while giving the gender assignment, we have to be very, very, very careful. We should have avoid the terms like he, she, or it. So there are the two terms. Uh, one is a psychological sex and second is the sexual identity. Psychological sex contains gender identity, gender role, and sexual orientation. What is the gender identity? How much person is representing himself or her, herself uh, to the society? That is the sexual uh, identity. Gender role. 
means my uh, boy is playing with the female toys or the boy is like to do have a makeup so this is the gender role, gender role it could be the different from the gender identity third is the sexual orientation it is based upon the sexual attraction it could be the towards the same gender or it could be towards the opposite gender if i talk about the sexual uh, uh, identity or the organic sex then it is decided by the chromosomal sex gonadal sex internal genitalia external genitalia and the hormonal sex so today we will discuss about the uh, second topic which is the organic sex so what is the basically dsd from the bipotential gonad there is a development of a uh, male and the female in between there are the various step like the chromosomal sex genetic sex gonads and the hormones and hormones act on the receptor and finally the development of the male and female genitalia happens if any discrepancy in between this stage then it can cause dsd so if i talk about the female then she have 46 xy with the uh, ovarian developmental gene ovary develops ovary produce the estrogen which act on the estrogen receptor and finally the external and internal genitalia of the female develop if we talk about the male then the, with the help of the 46 xy chromosome there will be the uh, with the help of the testicular gene like wt1 and other gene there will be the development of the testes and after testes formation there is the testosterone production and amh production will help to maintain the external and internal genitalia so if uh, is there any error or discrepancy between this step in care it can cause the disorder of sexual development so if it, uh, uh, we understand in the simple term so urogenital ridge is same for the uh, same for the boy and the girl so uh, from the urogenital ridge there will be the development of the testes with the help of the sry gene uh, and after in the testes there are the two cell may, uh, two main component one is the leading cell second is the sartori cell in the sartori cell there will be the production of the amh anti mullerian hormone which regrades the mullerian structure and in the leading cell with the help of the testosterone there is a wolfian stock retention and which cause the development of the internal genitalia while uh, 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 uh testosterone convert into the dst dihydrotestosterone and it uh, uh, it responsible for the external genitalia development kindly note that here internal genitalia is developed by the testosterone while external genitalia is developed by the dst so any uh, any uh, newborn has a deficiency of the 5 alpha reductase then internal genitalia could be normal but external genitalia could be the at atypical second in the uh, in the terms of the female from the urogenital ridge there will be the development of the ovary with the help of the dax1 uh, fox l2 on a beta a beta carotene pathway uh, uh, so it de it development occur into the ovary in ovary has a two cell theca cell and the granulosa cell here there is a no amh and there is a no testosterone so there will be the retention of the mullerian structure from the mullerian structure there will be the development of, uh, of the uterus and the fallopian tube and formation of the upper two part of the vagina happens here there is a separate development of the lower one third of the vagina so any female who has a, a, a problem in the mullerian structure can have normal external genitalia which is the mrk syndrome so a gonadal development start at the 4 to 6 week uh, with the help of the nr5 one and the sf1 and the w1 gene wt1 gene there will be the development of the bipotential gonad so suppose any child have a defect in nr5 one or wt1 then then uh, with the gonad kidneys and adrenal is also affected with the bipotential gonad if sry gene act then it it cause the testicular development with the help of the dax1 and the fox l2 gene there will be the development of the ovary so uh, now after extensive discussion uh, about the what is the uh, pathophysiology now i move towards the normal genitalia so what could be the normal genitalia for the full term male if bilateral testis is there if the complete formation of the scrotal sac with the midline fusion and if the average stretch penile length is there then it can consider as a normal genitalia for the female if bilateral separation of the labial fold with no palpable gonad with a separate urethral and vaginal opening which can consider as a normal uh, uh, normal genitalia then what is the dst 
So DSD has a two presentation, one in the newborn age and second in the uh, later age, like second syndrome. Second syndrome was five alpha reductase deficiency, while uh, um, partial AIS or AIA was the uh, king ill story. So uh, what is the DSD in the newborn? If we compare phenotypic male, if the micro penis is there less than 2.5 centimeter in term newborn with the hypospediasis, then we have to uh, do a workup for the DSD. If bilateral cryptoarchidism is there, or if unilateral cryptoarchidism with the hypospediasis, then we have to consider as a DSD. And what about the female? Uh, if inguinal or go, uh, inguinal gonad is there, if labial fusion is there, uh, and if the clitoromegaly, in terms of the clitoral length more than 9 mm and clitoral width more than 6 mm, then we have to consider as an atypical genitalia. So if we talk about the uh, DSD at the puberty or the in the uh, uh, adolescent age, then what could be the presentation? If the previously unrecognized genital ambiguity, if it is there, if the inguinal hernia, uh, hernia in, the, in the girl, then it could be the complete androgen insensitivity. If the delay and the complete puberty, if the primary amenorrhea or virilization at the girl, it could be the 5-alpha reductase deficiency or 17-beta HSD deficiency, or it could be the debris development in the boys. So if we talk about the gonadal steroid uh, biosynthesis, my, I think most of you are aware about these pathways. So if, uh, with the help of the side chain cleavage and star gene, uh, there will be the conversion of the, uh, conversion of the cholesterol to the progesterone. And with the help of the 21 hydroxylase uh, and uh, 17 hydroxylase, there will be the production of the cortisol and the aldosterone. Uh, and with the help of the 70 lyes, there will be the development, uh, there will be the conversion of the DHEs. So till uh, in the boys and the, uh, and, and the girl, this is the same continuous pathway, but with the presence of the testes, there uh, in the testes, there is a 17 beta HSD, which convert this DHEAs into the testosterone. And in the female, present of the aromatase, which convert this testosterone in the, uh, in the estrogen. So uh, in, in, if we talk about the hormonal action, then we have eight to 13 weeks window to uh, uh, develop from the, uh, 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 develop towards the testes. So if we consider the undifferentiated genitalia with the help of the LSH receptor and the placental SCG action, there will be the development of the phallus. So uh, while if we consider the hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, then there will be the labiostrotal fusion occurs. So only it present with the micro penis, not the DSD. So what could be the etiology for the DS order of sexual development? So if any problem, uh, in the nr 51 or SF1 or WT1, WT1 gene, uh, which, uh, which caused the problem in the development of the bipotential gonad can cause DSD, afterward defect present with the XY DSD. And in the other side, if the uh, defect in the dark swan gene, then and uh, further estrogen development caused uh, um, XY, XX DSD. And if we talk about the hormonal synthesis, then if, if some defect in the star and SCC gene defect, then it present with the mainly deficiency of the testosterone, aldosterone and the cortisol. So it present with the soil pasting crisis along with the three beta HSD uh, defect. If we compare about the 17 hydroxylase deficiency, then in this case, there will be the deficiency of the testosterone. So it mainly, uh, um, mainly present with the XY DSD with the hypertension. And if we talk about the 21 hydroxylase deficiency, this is the most common form of the DSD. If we compare about the uh, uh, evidence, then 90% DSD occurred by the 21 hydroxylase deficiency. It present with this uh, XX DSD with the salt wasting. And the 11 hydroxylase deficiency mainly present with the hypertension with the XX DSD. If there is a problem in the conversion from androstenodione to testosterone, which is a 17 beta HSD defect, it present as the uh, XY DSD. And if it is a problem in the aromatase, then it present with the X, XX DSD uh, uh, with the maternal virilization history. So any development uh, issues during the uh, window periods that occur due to the XY DSD, and 5 alpha reductase 2 deficiency and AIS present at the later age. So if we uh, summarize all these slides, 
then DSD may present with the gonadal dysgenesis, mainly genetic defect, over testicular DSD or MGD. Second, uh, 46 XY DSD present with the uh, deficiency of the androgen because in the uh, androgen deficiency, there will be X, 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 XY DSD. If salt loss is there, then uh, the, what could be the reason? It could be the 3-beta HSD star deficiency or SCC. In the present of the hypertension, we can uh, suspect 17 hydroxylase deficiency or if the salt stays, uh, status is normal, then it, it could be the L LSAG receptor deficiency, 17 beta HSD deficiency. If we talk about the 46 X, XX DSD, it occurs due to the excess androgen. So if salt loss, the, uh, loss is then, then, uh, then it could be the uh, 21 hydroxylase deficiency. With the hypertension, we can suspect 11 hydroxylase deficiency. And if we, uh, uh, maternal virilization history is there, when, then we can suspect aromatase deficiency. So what are the clinical features that we have, we have discussed? If genital ambiguity is there, if bilateral cryptorchidism is there, and if pre-pinostrotal hypospediasis with or without hypo uh, uh, cryptorchidism is there, then we can suspect the DSD. And what are the presentation at the childhood and the adolescent age? It could be the inguinal hernia, which is seen in AIS. Second is a cyclic hematuria. Third is the primary amenorrhea, and four is mainly infertility. And what is not DSD? So that is the most important thing that we have to answer. If any child present with the prominent clitoris, then it is not a DSD. Second, if the labial adhesion is there, then it is a not a, a, a DSD. If hypospediasis alone is, is there, then it is not a DSD. And what assessment we have to do? Uh, here, history is the most important thing. If the maternal virilization history is there, then we can consider uh, aromatase deficiency. Uh, if drug history is there, then also it ca caused the virilization, consanguinity, infertility, and sibling loss points toward the salt testing crisis. Uh, genital examination is also important, important with the genital asymmetry, gonadal, uh, gonadal assessment. And if salt wasting and hypertension is there, then we, it could be the CH variant. And the syndromic features like Upton nets can point towards the uh, smith lambley optis syndrome. So what are the initial classification we have to do? So suppose uh, this is the normal presentation of the testes and the, uh, uh, and the mullerian structure. If mullerian structure is there, then it can, call, it can cause excess DST. If only testes is there, then it is the XY DST. If there will be, uh, uh, if, if there will be the uh, both side is there, testes is also there and mullerian, uh, mullerian structure is also there. That means AMH is not properly working or there is a deficiency of AMH. So it could be the AMH defect. If both thing is not there, then it could be the reason of the anorchia. You are requested to sum up in one minute. So uh, if we assess for the lab assessment, then USG, abdomen and karyotype is uh, initial investigation followed by if we suspect the XXDSD, then we have to work up for the 17 hydroxy progesterone with the, uh, uh, with the electrolyte. For the, uh, for the XY DSD, we have to measure the hormones like LH, uh, uh, TASTE 2, AMH and inhibin, inhibin with the help of the DHT. Uh, and how we have to approach for the DSD, uh, I will summarize in one slide. If palpable gonad is there, if absent, then we have to look for the Mullerian structure. If Mullerian structure is there, then we are dealing with the XX, XX DSD. Then we have to ask for the maternal virilization. If it is there, then aromatase deficiency come into the picture. If salt wasting is there, then our most diagnosis has been done, which is the 17 hydroxy progesterone. If level is very, very high, then we can uh, 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 we, uh, we can stamp it to 21 hydroxylase deficiency. If it is low, then it could be the 3 beta HSD. And uh, with the hypertension variant, we can uh, approach toward the 11 hydroxylase deficiency. And uh, if the palpable gonad is there with the present of the uh, Mullerian structure, it could be the AMH defect, where, uh, what we uh, discussed. If AMH is very high, then it could be the resistance. If AMH is low, then it could be the AMH deficiency. So, and if we talk about the if palpable gonad is present with the absence of the Mullerian structure, then it can, it can cause the XY DSD. Then we have to look for the testosterone. If testosterone is low, then we have to look for the salt wasting. If salt wasting is there, then it could be the proximal defect like star, SCC, and 3-beta HSD. If hypertension is there, 
then it points toward the 17 hydroxylase deficiency. And if it is there is no hypertension, no salt wasting, then it could be the proximal uh, 17 beta HSD defect or 5 alpha reductase defect. So if I uh, summarize this my whole presentation in one last case, then uh, one month old male who has the atypical genitalia, you can visualize the picture uh, in, uh, in this slide and who has the palpable gonad with the stage penile length of 0.8 centimeter and there was a no salt wasting, uh, no hypertension and no, uh, growth was normal. So we can see in the uh, our algorithm, so palpable gonad was there and uh, uh, after that Mullerian structure was absent, we did a testosterone which is a low and in absent of the salt wasting our, our 2 DD uh, come into the picture like 17 beta HSD and LHSCG. So my whole uh, message uh, regarding the DSD that we have to do proper examination, we have to ask for the history and then we have to go further. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Manoj for wonderful presentation. I think the right hand, uh, this algorithm, if you use properly, it will make life very easy. And in fact, uh, we had developed along with Dhwani, Dr. Manoj and Diva, we developed a DSD interpreter based upon this algorithm which actually allows immediate interpretation and evaluation and you will get the diagnosis which is there. So whatever he has built up, that was most important to build up the theoretical aspect. And then the algorithm. So we talked about in the pump that you have got the pump, you've got the CGMS, the data, and then you have to analyze. So algorithm becomes very important. So I think this is the most important part of the overall presentation which you nicely summarize. I'll uh, now request Dr. Alka Jha, who is... Uh, working as an endocrinologist at Fortis uh, Delhi to kindly felicitate uh, Dr. Manoj. And I'll also request uh, Dr. Kamlesh Agarwal to kindly come up and felicitate Dr. Vishnu. Please come here. I'll request Dr. Rajiv Das to kindly come up and felicitate Dr. Heman. So I'll hand over to Dhwani for the further uh, proceeding. We are now moving to the next section of the talks. We have endocrine diagnostics coming up. For this, I would like to call on Dias, Dr. Vijay Jaiswal, Head of Pediatrics at LLRM uh, Medical College, Merit, Dr. Vikran Thakur, Professor and Head of Pediatrics at Mayo Hospital, Lucknow, and Dr. Alpita Bregovenshi, Associate Professor in Pediatrics at KGMU, Lucknow. Our first session in endocrine diagnostics is on hormone assays, uh, which will be taken by Dr. Anurag Bajpayee and Dr. Vibha Yadav. So you can start this. Okay. Yeah. So now I would like to invite uh, Anurag sir for endocrine diagnostics. So he is going to clear the airs regarding how the tests have to be performed and what uh, circumstances the uh, tests have to be asked for. So sir, over to you sir. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Vikrant. And uh, so this session is basically designed to work as an interactive session. So we will have Dr. Vibha. You can come maybe a bit closer to the both of them. Dr. Vibha and myself, and we'll try to see how common problems which are seen in pediatric endocrinology and how we can easily make it more comprehensive and more uh, regarding that. So why is endocrine diagnostics very, very important? Sir? Is that these are our entire in, uh, diagnostics and therapeutics is dependent upon what these tests tell us. So these hormone assays are really vital. They are really a game changer because your decision will be based upon that. Although they often are considered to be complicated and confusing. And because if you don't interpret these results properly, you will have huge implications in terms of evaluation and management. So you need tests which are precise which are accurate, sensitive, and specific. And that is what we want to look at. Now, why are these tests so difficult? 
Now we are dealing with large molecules. When you're measuring sodium, potassium, they're very small molecules. We're talking about big peptides, which are there. We are talking about ranges, which are huge. So you can have a TSH of 0.4 to 4, at least 10 times is normal. Prolactin even longer. So you have a huge range of these assays, which are there. Puberty can change. So levels in a 10 year boy of LH will be different. 14 years will be different. 18 years will be different and 80 year old will be different. So you need to interpret in light of puberty and a lot of variations, which are there, which make it very, very difficult in that perspective. So when you write a prescription and by the time you get the report, there are a lot of errors, which may happen. Errors may happen in the test that you have said in the timing of the test in the sample type that you have advised, in the way those samples were processed and the way those tests were done. So there are so many errors. So as they say, there can lot can happen by the time you take the cup and take the sip. A lot of changes can happen and a lot of errors can happen in that regards. So if we look at overall, we can have pre-analytical error, which basically mean that pre-analytical error would basically mean that you have not even done the test and you have got errors. So this is important, then the test can be erroneous and how you interpret the test. The most important part of the stethoscope is in between the ears. So most important part of an endocrine report is what you are analyzing also becomes important. Now, 50% of errors can be pre-analytical, wrong time, wrong sample, wrong tubing, label, all those things. 30% are analytical. So you your lab did a, a difficulty. So you need to be careful in terms of lab. And 20% can be post analytical. So you have interpreted it wrongly. So these all we will be discussing about. So now why do we commonly do an endocrine test, Dr. Vibha? So generally we do endocrine tests for the screening purpose uh, to make the diagnosis. And if by making the diagnosis, we can change our treatment plan. So these are the main recommendations that we do for this endocrine so test. So we need to have different types of tests when we talk about a screening strategy like congenital hypothyroidism. We need different tests for diagnosing that hypothyroidism. And when you're monitoring, you will have a different strategy. So I think these three becomes important. So don't order a test in everybody only if it is going to change your management. Then only you should write a particular test in that regard. So we can start off with the cases. Uh, it's, you can move this. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have this 10 year old boy who came to us with a growth failure. Yeah. He has a short height of 127 centimeter and weight was much affected. It was minus 4.8 standard deviation below. And his normal screening worker was all normal, but his IGF-1 level was low. So uh, some physician has done the growth stimulation test and it came out to be normal. So kindly... Advise me, sir, why this is discrepancy between this growth hormone stimulation test and this low IGF-1 value. So I think that's a very, very important point. So whenever you are evaluating anybody, you need to think about which test is important to choose. Now, this child, what you look at, first of all, look at the growth chart. If you interpret the growth chart, you will see that his weight is much more affected as compared to the height. So I don't think of an endocrine cause. I'm thinking more like a nutritional cause. Now, in this scenario, the IGF-1 level is low. Now, what are the two factors on which IGF-1 depends? Maybe the audience can say out loud. Nutrition as well as liver function. So, if you are malnourished, your IGF-1 will be low. So, this IGF-1 has got no value. If at all you wanted to do a growth hormone, you could have done that, but I would be wary about that. So again, this is a wrong test. So in a malnourished child, in a child who is less than five years of age, in a child who has hepatic disease, do not do a IGF-1. I think that's something which is very, very important. So the test to order will depend upon different scenarios. So we can order either the whole hormones. So often like thyroid, cortisol, we order the whole test. Sometimes these hormones are very short living. So they will be destroyed in the plasma. So what are the examples there, Dhani Vibha? Uh, so the hormones like peptides, uh, thyroxine. So short living will be like insulin, insulin like uh, AVP. So in this scenario, you will take co-secretor. So if you look at insulin, you will use C-peptide as a marker, which is a longer half-life or co-peptin for AVP. Then sometimes we look at effect. What is the calcium level? What is the ketone level? That will give you a clue. Now, one example is hyperinsulinism. So insulin measurement is very difficult. 
So better to look at ketone, which will give you a much bigger picture in that regards. And sometimes we do a metabolite evaluation in that regards. Thank you, sir. So we have this now 15 year old boy who came to us with obesity. He had a hypertension. And as we can see in the picture, he has abdominal striae as well. He has hypertension and it was uh, 140 by 90. When we did the overnight suppression test, it, the cortisol level was suppressed. So I thought to do the serum ACTH level and it was high. And then MRI was done and it turned out to be normal. So I was thinking I should do another test to look out for the ectopic pushing. So do you agree with me, sir? I think the main issue is that why are you doing the test? You should understand. When you talk about Cushing syndrome, there are screening tests. That this test is to just screen whether Cushing's are there or not. That is an overnight dexamethasone suppression test. Then you have got a confirmatory test like a low-dose dexamethasone suppression test. Then you have a classification test like ACTH. Now, if you look at your first test, your overnight dexamethasone suppression test is already suppressed. So, you have excluded Cushing syndrome. So, now doing an ACTH will be of no role. So, I would not be even thinking of a Cushing syndrome. So, why do an ACTH? Second, which type of sample you have taken is important. So, here you have done a serum ACTH. So, serum ACTH should not be done. We do ACTH in the in the plasma. So this is something important. So if you take the wrong sample, then the machine will give the wrong result. So if you have a garbage in, you will have a garbage out. So you need to have a proper way in which you have done the sampling. So we know there are various types of sample. Whole blood is not used in most cases only for those which are very metabolically active. So example will be blood glucose. We do the blood glucose. Otherwise, why will you do a point of care test HbA1c? You can do that. Now, once you remove their blood cells, it becomes basically a plasma. So plasma also is a very labile substance. This is also not used very commonly. You will use for dynamic changes. I think ACTH will be one in which you will use plasma as we discussed. For all other, once you remove the clotting protein, it becomes basically the serum. And for serum, you have much stable levels and you will use it for most situations. You will use serum. But which sample to choose becomes absolutely important. You can also think of urine collection, but that becomes difficult in children because of a 24-hour collection and you have to collect it for creatinine and you can think of saliva. Where do we use saliva for? So we use saliva when we want to free cortisol levels. So mainly for cortisol and saliva is a filtered. It's like a free cortisol. So it's mainly for Cushing syndrome where you will be using this. Uh, thank you, sir. We have this 11-year-old boy who presented with growth failure. Uh, he was really short. He was minus 5.4 standard deviation. And he has immature facies. His all other screening tests were normal. And he was looking uh, growth hormone deficiency to me. So I did the basal growth hormone level. It also came out to be low. So could I start the growth hormone therapy in this child on the basis of this? So do you all agree that just because of basal growth hormone, will you start growth hormone? I think everybody is saying no. The reason is that growth hormone is a pulsatile hormone. You have only few pulses of growth hormone. In between the levels may be zero. It is of no consequence at all. So we need to consider when you are ordering a test, what type of variation happened with that hormone. So if you look at growth hormone, you can have a pulsatile hormone. And a lot of these hormones like prolactin, LH, FSA, they have a pulsatility. So either you do a stimulation test like growth hormone stimulation test. Or you do a pooled sample. Now, what do you mean by a pooled sample, Viva? So, we take uh, uh, samples and then we collect all together and we take out the average value of it. Yeah. So, what we do is that we take three samples, 0, 15 and 30 minutes. And we mix all of them and then measure. So, you don't need to do it three times. Some people ask me that whether you do it 0, 15 and 30 and then average. Which What, what you are meaning by average is that you will pool all of them. So, single report will be done, not three times. But the pooling will be done. Now, you can have diurnal variation and this is the classical graph for cortisol. So, cortisol levels are highest in the morning. So, if you are looking for deficiency, do in the morning. They are lowest at midnight. If you are looking for excess, do it at midnight. So, I think this is something which is there. Then you can have the periodic variation like menstrual cycle variation for LH, FSH, for progesterone, 17 OHP, which is there. And some of them can have seasonal variations like vitamin D, thyroid and estradiol. So you need to know what variations are there and then do the test accordingly. 
So if you have a pulsatile hormone, now Vibha, what all can you do in this case? So in case of pulsatility, as you have said, we can take the pool sample yeah. and uh, we can do the uh, stimulation that as we do in the growth Definitely. hormone stimulation. So you can either do a pooled sample or you can do some things like a timed one, like cortisol you do in the morning. That's most likely. You do a co-secretory products like copeptin or C-peptide or most commonly we do a dynamic test. Now, if you think of endocrinology, it's very simple. If you're thinking of excess, you suppress it. So do a suppression test. Dexamethasone suppression test is a classical example. If you have deficiency, you stimulate. Growth hormone deficiency, you have got GNRH stimulation test. So stimulation and inhibitory test will be the ones which we'll look at. Uh, we have this 13-year-old boy who came to us with weakness and lethargy. He had pigmentation also. His electrolyte profile shows normal sodium and normal potassium. So we did the cortisol level and it came out to be uh, we did the random cortisol in fact it came out to be low so it is looking like cortisol deficiency to me because he had the symptoms of weakness and pigmentation so so uh, do you agree with me ki is it cortisol deficiency i think a very important message in endocrinology is always to think of contextual assessment so you have to see in what context this cortisol level is single low cortisol level is absolutely of no value unless you have got associated conditions where cortisol should have been high. So if you had hyponatremia, if you had hypoglycemia, if you had shock, then this cortisol will be very, very important. But otherwise, single value will be very, very varied. There is another condition if your ACTH is very high and still your cortisol is low, you are pigmented, so maybe you can do ACTH. If ACTH is more than 200, I would think this becomes significant. So this again is not going to be very important and the timing also becomes important. So whether you did it, what time? So 8 a.m. value in this case was normal again. So identify that so this was a wrong timing. So these are all pre-analytical issues we're talking. This is not the error of the lab. There is, you don't have a right to say the lab, okay, you have spoiled my test. This is our own errors that we are doing, which we want to avoid. So now if you talk about diurnal variation, as I talked last time, that if you're looking at deficiency for cortisol, do it in the morning. If you're looking at excess, do it in the midnight. That is what is recommended from that perspective. And there are other tests you can do for diurnal rhythm and dexa suppression test, which we discussed. We have this 15-year-old girl who visited us for increased facial hair growth, menstrual irregularity. And we, when we examined her, we found her perimen galvis score was 12, which is mild to moderate. And when we sh show her hormonal profile, LH was high. FSH was mildly elevated. So when I saw this report, it was looking like a case of hypoandrogenous to me. So I decided to start the E plus P preparations. So, so do you agree with me? Should I, I start? I think, yeah. So we have to be very, very cautious in this regards. The key question I will ask is what time did you do the LHFSH level? Because we know that if you talk about the menstrual cycle, in the initial phase, FSH and LH will be zero they will start rising. FSH will remain higher than LH throughout the cycle, except for around day 14 when you have the peak. So whether it is in the proliferative phase or it is in the secretory phase, whether it's in the luteal phase or whether it is in the initial phase, that's what will be very, very important. So when was this sample so actually taken? It was taken? done like in the post-ovulatory phase. Post-ovulatory phase. So ovulation and that time your LH will be very high. So anyway, LHFSH is not a very good marker, so to speak, of PCOS. And we know that high LH is an effect of PCOS and not the cause of PCOS. Here, of course, you should do it on day two of periods. And when we repeated, it was found to be normal. So again, all these things that we discussed have become very, very important. So again, this was a wrong timing, which we saw here. So if you have a cyclical variation, best is to do it according to a particular time. If you're looking at LH, if you're looking at FSH, if you're looking at testosterone, if you're looking at 17 OHP, day two to four will be the best. If you're looking at progesterone, what will be the best time? Day 21. Day 21, because that's the time when the luteal phase is already established and you will be able to get the idea from there. Thank you, sir, for enlightening me. We have this six-month-old girl who was referred to us with seizures and she had low calcium and low phosphorus level also. So what does the audience think of this case? Hypocalcemia and hypophosphatemia. 
So you've got low calcium, low phosphorus. Is it PTH or is it vitamin D? Vitamin D. I think everybody is agree. So the most important investigation in a case of hypocalcemia is phosphorus. If your phosphorus is low, you're thinking of vitamin D. Now, what are the results we got? But uh, when we, in every case of hypocalcemia, we generally do the PTH level to see whether there is a case of secondary hyperparathyroidism or not. But when we get the result of PTH level, it came out to be low. And uh, as you all said, the vitamin D level was low. So what is this confusing scenario? Why the Now PTH the question is whether the uh, egg came first or the chicken came first, the PTA, the calcium, all those things. So now uh, I would say, what do you expect with a low PTH? What is more like? With low PTH, the phosphate level should be high. So it is extremely unlikely that you have got a very low phosphorus and yet your PTH level is low. And we know which is a more robust test, vitamin D, maybe the audience can tell us, or PTH, which is less likely to be affected by the problems of assays. Vitamin D is definitely going to be much less likely to be affected. And PTH, we all know, is a very labile hormone. Often we see that PTH is sent to a collection center and they will keep it there. The time it gives their lab is like uh, a day or two. And by that time, the PTH would be lost because PTH has to be done immediately or frozen. So the problem that is there probably is that your PTH assessment was probably inaccurate. And when we did in our own in-house assay, it was found to be normal in that regard. So this was an incorrect storage. Thank you, sir. So. Yeah, maybe we can give the mic to. This, the PTH was high because the vitamin D was low. High PTH is intact PTH. So when we talked about PTH, there are various generation assays which are there. Intact PTH is the one which is basically looking at different segments of the PTH. Earlier people used to say N terminal, C terminal. Now intact PTH has got two segments they are looking at. This is the best test as far as PTH is concerned. Uh, so we got this uh, reference from the NIC for this 20 day old girl who was having seizures. Uh, she had a sort of hypoglycemia. She had a blood sugar of 22 and she was maintaining blood sugar on the GIR rate of 12, which is quite high. The hypoglycemia was non-ketotic and uh, the cortisol level was within the range for this level of hypoglycemia. Uh, so now I think the audience can pitch in that we have got a child who has refractory hypoglycemia and the ketone is negative. What is the most likely diagnosis? Hyperinsulinism. So like we said, phosphorus is the most important test in hypocalcemia. Ketone is the most important test in hypoglycemia. Yes. So now we all expect that insulin will be sky high. Now, what's the result uh, here? I expected the insulin level to be high, but what I got, the insulin level was undetectable. So can you biologically explain this scenario, Vibha? Yeah, definitely, sir. The, it could be due to the transport or the insulin. No, I am saying that can, can, can it be really true that if you did it properly, can no, you have a situation? Sir, sir if, uh, the, if the patient is maintain, requiring so much high GIR and this is non-ketotic, so definitely we have only one possibility left. That is the so this is increased insulin effect. Okay. Now, theoretically, I can say, okay, you can have a post-receptor problem, activating mutation okay. in the AKT2 pathway, which can cause that, but that's only one or two case reports have been reported. So before I go to rare condition, I will directly go to whether the insulin was done properly or not. That is also important. So insulin and PTH are two hormones. Whenever I get the report, I want to be very sure whether it was done properly or not. So when we look at this was again, I show sample instability. So whenever you are sending these things, either you send the person to that particular lab, which is doing it, or you ensure that the person comes to you with an ice pack and they have got all the frozen facility. Otherwise, the results will be very, very variable and you will not get the right result. So normally we say that things like ACTH, PTH, insulin and renin, these are the ones which you want to be frozen. Otherwise results will become abnormal. Now renin is basically an enzyme activity. So of course you require a frozen one, but never freeze AVP because that will cause a problem. IGF-1 should also not be frozen and things which are not affected by temperature are like common things like growth hormone, cortisol, vitamin D, LH, FSH. These you can send it as you wish. 
and they can be stable for a long time. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have this seven-year-old girl who visited our OPD for uh, early puberty. She had a breast test of three and the pubic hair of two. Uh, when we did the bone age examination, it was uh, advanced, it was 10 years. And when we did, did the hormonal profile, even the LHFSH ratio was high for his age. But what we got is her estrogen level was low, which was not fitting in the scenario. So do you think the audience that this child has early puberty? At seven years of age, breast is three. So we talk about slowly progressive and whatever, that's breast two usually. The bone age is three years advanced. Yes. This is definitely a early puberty. Okay. And what you are seeing, LH and FSH, both levels are high. And we say LH is the most important test to identify precocious puberty. Now the treating physician is saying estradiol is zero. So why do you need to give any DNRH analog? So the problem, what do you think would be a problem Vibha, here as far as the estrogen reports are concerned? Sir, for this estrogen report, I would say ki it would be regarding the type of uh, essay we are using. Because generally the, uh, the essays that is used for the measurement of uh, estradiol is pre prepared for the estimation of high values of estrogen. And but in this seven year old girl, the estrogen level will be like around 25, 26. So due to the improper use of essay, this could have been. So this is a very, very valid point because we need to understand what is the purpose of that essay. The estradiol level is done for reproductive age group, levels of 80, 100, 200. When you have a level of 10, 20, it will do a wrong result. Similarly, we always say glucometers are there for hyperglycemia. When you have hypoglycemia, you confirm it on a lab sample. So this becomes very, very important. So technique is also very, very crucial. So we always commonly use immunoassay, which is an easily available technique, a technique which provides us with a immediate result. But this technique has a problem because it can have a lot of overlap. It has a larger molecule, larger volume is required and peptide will be the one which are preferred. It's not a very good for a steroid molecule like estradiol or cortisol. You may not get a good result or testosterone. Now, the one which we'll prefer in those scenario will be a mass spectroscopy, which depends upon the mass and charge ratio. So it has got more specificity. It's good for smaller molecule. You need very small amount of blood and it is good for steroids. The problem with this, it's more expensive. So whenever you do precautious puberty, I would not even look at estradiol. Yesterday we were discussing so many cases in which estradiol was discrepant. So don't worry too much about estradiol. The only role of estradiol will be when it is more than 100. So what will condition will have estradiol more than 100? So, precautious so if you have estradiol more than 100, there is an ovarian cyst. Basically, that's it. Otherwise, I would not look at estradiol. Look at LH, which is a more important marker for precautious puberty. So what now, once you have done, we talked about the pre-analytical issue. The next issue is about what we want from the assay. We want from the assay that it gives us a true value, which is basically the accuracy we want that it is reliable. Every time you do, you get the same result. Basically, you don't get other results. So if you want cortisol, you get cortisol and not cortisone. That becomes important. You have a wide range. So sensitivity becomes more. You need to be stability in terms of sample. And you want a good interpretation in that regard. So these are the requirements which are there. And accuracy, basically, all labs have to maintain their accuracy. They compare to gold standard. If the lab is not doing that, you have to really question them. So you can ask, when was your last external standard done? And this is done using a Uden's curve, which you don't need to understand, but you need to ask them that whether they have a good NABH accredited laboratory, NABL accredited will be requiring to do all that things. So we have this 12-year-old boy who was a diagnosed case of 21 hydroxylase deficiency. And uh, he was on hydrocortisone dose of 15 milligram per meter square per day. And when, when on the follow-up, we did the 17 OHP level, it came out to be 4 nanogram per ml, which is a little bit high because we use the cut of 3 nanogram per ml. And when we repeated the sample, it decreases down to 2.4 nanogram per d ml. So with this uh, 2.4 nanogram per ml, should I decrease? Should I have to decrease the dose or? I think this is something you need to understand that when you do the same assay twice, there will always be variability which is there. Often people say that this glucometer is not very good. I do it after two hours, it becomes 10. So there is a biological variability. Your sugars may have changed. 
Similarly, the machine already has got a coefficient of variation. So all this value of 4 and 2.4 is same for me. I would not be too much bothered. You need to know what is the CV or coefficient of variation. So what is coefficient of variation, Vibha? So coefficient of variation is a standard deviation upon mean because we see the how much the values is deviated from the mean. So it gives us an idea about how uh, accurate is your test. In a way, how precise rather, not than accurate, how precise is your test. If you repeat it every time, how much variation you will get. So every lab is supposed to maintain a LJ graph like this. If you have this sort of a pattern, which means your values both up and down, this means that there is a random error. This is not a systematic error. So this is both accurate and precise. What about this? What do you see here, Vibha? So this is uh, deviated towards the down. This is uh, not accurate. Because so this is a systematic the... error, which you are seeing here. So this is definitely a inaccurate one. And then you have got huge variation. So it's a both random errors which are there. So we prefer the first line, which will be the best one in this regards. So as discussed, coefficient of variation is standard deviation upon mean. It should be quite low. If it's more than 10%, we start to get worried about in that regards. And we also take into account the biological variability, which is there. Now, very importantly, you often get these reference ranges. Now, how do you get the reference ranges? So one way is that this machine can measure from 0.1 to 100. So I'll say the range is 0.1 to 100. But what you need to understand is that the accuracy of that particular assay is going to be different at different levels. So what you're seeing here is this is a CV on this uh, Y axis and you've got the concentration. So it is good for the intermediate concentration, but at lower concentration and higher concentration, it gives you a huge amount of variation. So we set a limit. If it is more than 20%, I would not be using this range. So your reference range should be within 20% of variation. That's the range is the best in terms of outcome. We have this 10 year old girl who was a diagnosed case of acquired hypothyroidism. She is uh, well maintaining of uh, thyroxine of 100 microgram. On follow up, she came with a TSH report of 54. Uh, according to her, she has a good compliance uh, and she has no symptoms of hypothyroid like constipation, hair fall. But uh, this uh, high TSH is not correlating with his symptoms. So we repeated it, the TSH with other lab, and it came out to be 2.5. So, sir, why is there discrepancy between the two levels on the TSH values? So I said there can be a biological variability which is there. There could be SA variability, but this is huge. It's like 20 times. So when you have a discordant result, ask them to run it again because there is something called what is known as a carryover effect. Suppose the sample before this was done on somebody whose TSH was 1000. So there will be some amount of that sample which is carried over to the next one. So ideally your lab, if it's good, they should have a very robust washout technique. They will remove all that, but sometimes you can have a carryover effect. So if you have completely discrepant report, tell the reason and ask them to repeat it. And then maybe you will get the right report on that. Schedule. Biological variability means I will have a TSH of four today and tomorrow it may be 4.4 because it will depend upon temperature. It will depend upon what my mood are, whether I'm exercising or not. Similar like sugar, your sugar may be 99 and then 104, then 84. So it's always going to change. Temperature will change. So all this variability will be there. So this is biological variability. What we want is the analytical variability to less than biological variability. If your analytical variability is more than biological variability, your results will going to be very much abnormal. Uh, so next case, we have the 16 year old girl who presented with the complaint of Calectoria. She also showed her Harbon profile reports and the prolactin level was 16 only. She also gave a history of headache and vomiting along with headache. And so we get the MRI done. The MRI showed a large adenoma in the pituitary. So why this uh, the prolactin level is so low and uh, the MRI showed a large adenoma. So is this really a pituitary adenoma or something else on the pituitary scan? I think this is a very, very important phenomena to understand. Now, why I am looking at, I'm looking at clinical parameters. She has galactoria. So now if you have galactoria, you have to think of that prolactin level definitely has to be high. 
Now you also have a CNS lesion, a pituitary adenoma, which is classical adenoma. So I would expect the prolactin to be above 100 and very, very high. Now in certain scenarios, especially with the older assays, if your prolactin level is very high, like thousands, you can get what is known as a hook effect in which as the levels go a particular high, you will have paradoxically a low level of prolactin. So this is a scenario what is known as a hook effect. So in this scenario, you should do a diluted sample and on that you will get the right result. So I think if there is a clinical discrepancy, think of this hook effect and the other is macroprolactin, which can sometimes happen. This will happen with other things as well, like HCG, TSH and calcitonin. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have this 17-year-old girl who was a follow-up case of papillary carcinoma of thyroid. She had undergone surgery as well as the radio ablative iodine ablation. So on the follow-up, we did the thyroglobin level to see is there any residual disease present or not. But the thyroglobin level was undetectable. And when the radioactive scan was done, it shows a lesion. So whether this scan report is uh, reliable or we should do the, we should repeat this thyroglobin level. This is a very, very important clinical scenario. When you have somebody with papillary carcinoma, differentiated carcinoma of thyroid, you are really looking at whether the lesion is coming back again or not. And one way of screening is thyroglobulin. So thyroglobulin is only produced by thyrocytes. If your thyroglobulin is becoming high, it means that your recurrence is happening and then scan will pick it up. However, here what you're seeing is thyroglobulin is zero and scan shows a lesion. So what does it mean? It means there may be an error on the thyroglobulin assessment. And what we need to remember is that it may be associated with antibodies. So sometimes you may have antibodies which will interfere with the results. And this is going to cause a falsely low picture on a non-competitive essay. So you can use a GCMS-based technique to get a better thing or better do an antithyroglobulin every time. If your antibody is positive, you need to be worried about this. We have this 11-year-old boy who presented with lethargy. He had a free T4 level, which is 3.2, which is low, and the normal TSH of 3.4. And so what does it mean if your free T4 is low and TSH is less than 20? We have central. It looks like a central hypothyroidism. So now you have to think of MRI, you have to think of cortisol, you have to think of all the other anterior pituitary functions. But he had no goiter and the TPO uh, antibody was negative. When we again repeated the result, the T3 and the T4 re reports came out to be normal. So how is it possible, like how the results yes, so came I think we need to be very cautious in the free T4 assay because free T4 assay is affected by a number of factors. An important one of them also can be some of the heterophile antibodies. So when we say heterophile antibodies, these are antibodies against the animal tissues, which can cause confusion in terms of assessment. And you can have falsely low or falsely high levels, which will be there. Now, they can cause both high level and low level. So, in this rate, you do it on a different platform and you will get the right result. What is the platform in terms of lab? Uh, we can repeat it on a different lab. On a different lab. So, platform means that you're using a different reagent, basically. So, there the antibodies will not have an effect. So, this becomes important. So, different lab will give you the right result. So, again, there are a lot of reasons for erroneous results, which can be in the form of interference or the binding proteins which can have a different samples or effects which will be there. So you have to ask the lab if your results are not fitting in, they will have to reassess and evaluate from that regards. We have this 14-year-old boy who presented with gynecomasia. Uh, the breast enlargement was around tenor stage 2. The testicular volume was 12 and he has a pubic hair of grade 3. The LH level was 1.8 and the testosterone level was 120 nanogram. And when the prolactin level was done, it was high. It was 120. So, so whether this prolactin is causing this gynecomasia. So considering this high prolactin, we take the MRI head and it came out to be normal. So why this high prolactin and normal MRI and this gynecomasia, all this picture is looking very confused to me. So kindly explain. So now this. if you're looking in this picture, what we are seeing is that your prolactin is high, but your testosterone is good for this age. Now, why does hyperprolactinemia cause gynecomastia? It is through 
hypogonadism so if you have a normal testosterone it's unlikely that this hyperprolactinemia is significant and hyperprolactinemia is a not a cause of gynecomastia directly so i will be very wary of this prolactin we talked about a hook effect in which if the level is high you are saying it as low this is the other scenario in which you can have a macro prolactin in which if the levels are low you can your levels are high you actually don't have a hyperprolactinemia it's a non functional prolactin in this regard so what you do here is do a pegylated sample and you will get the right result in this perspective thank you sir now this 14 year old boy who came with a delayed puberty when we examined the child he has a pubic hair one and testicular volume of 4 ml his testosterone level was undetectable so we repeated the testosterone level and it came out to be 24 nanogram per ml so sir how should we interpret this again this is a issue about the coefficient of variation now we say that 20 is the level which we should detect now if it's plus minus 4 it may be 16 or 24 if it is 16 you will say undetectable if you say 24 it becomes detectable so this clearly does not mean that there is a huge variation but think when you are looking at that assay what will be more important for me in this case what is a better marker of pubertal onset in this case then testosterone is the testicular volume he has a four testicular volume so he is entering into puberty don't get too worried in that regards so we need to understand that sensitivity of a test will vary and therefore you may falsely say that this is undetectable if your sensitivity is a bit high when we say sensitivity this is analytical sensitivity the lowest yes. your assay can measure yes. in that regards so this becomes important and significant from that perspective so this is already we said that you have to set it according with a coefficient of variation where you get the right result so we have this 8 year old girl who presented with short stature and we measured the height the height was 128 cm which is just mi minus 1.5 standard deviation below her weight was 28 kg and all the screening tests were normal. So somebody did the growth hormone stimulation test and the growth hormone level shows 9.2 which is in the partial growth hormone deficiency. So should we treat this child? Now the first question is, do you think this child has DHD? Height is only minus 1.5 SDS. So whenever we say you, when do you do a growth hormone stimulation when the height is very short, less than minus 3 standard deviation score? minus 2 to minus 3 and less growth velocity these are the conditions so your pretest probability is very less so don't order an endocrine test if you don't think it will be positive otherwise you will get confusion now now we don't consider 9.2 as low it is 7 is considered a cutoff but some people still consider 5 to 10 as partial so this will cause confusion so this is low pretest probability now i'll just give you an example how the prevalence of the disease or the pretest probability determines the diagnostic accuracy of a test. Now, if you say that you have got 200 people, 50% have affected, or in a way you can say, I have a 50% chance that this child will have GHD. You have a sensitivity of 90, specificity of 90. There, your positive predictive value is 90%. So your positive test, 90 out of 100 would become GHD and your likelihood ratio is high. Now, suppose your probability becomes less. It's only 10%. 10% is the prevalence. The same sensitivity and specificity, your values will become much less. Your positive predictive value becomes 50%. Now, what it means is that in the first scenario, 90 out of 100 positive tests will be positive. Here, only 50 will be there. So, if you have less possibility, do not do the test. That is the key message that is there which we like to give. And this is what is shown is that the prevalence of disease will decide about the positive and the negative predictive value, which are the most important parameters to follow in that regard. So again, we have this 12-year-old boy come with the uh, delayed puberty concern. He had a testicular volume of only 2 ml and pubic hair of stage 1. He has a bone age which is uh, delayed by 2 years. And uh, or oh, this LH, FSH and testosterone all were no, low for his age. Then the MRI head was decided to do and it came out to be normal. So, so why the, this is looking like hypogonentropic hypogonadism to me. So why this, how should we approach this? this? So all of you agree that this is hypogonadotropic hypogonadism? 
So every child who is there will have hypogonadotropic hypogonads. You understand that everybody who is young, LHFH will be low. You will say it's hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So this is physiological. This is normal. Why unnecessarily we are giving and this is very common. So you have to interpret levels as far as the various ages are concerned. If you do in this phase where the hormones are zero, you will of course have no levels which are there. So never do a workup before 14 years of age. This is very, very important. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have this 12-year-old boy who presented with lethargy and weakness. His free T4 level was 3.2, which is low, and the TSH level of 12. Cortisol level was also low, and the ACTH level was 5.6. LH, FSH, and testo level all were low. So this picture is looking like mphg 2 b so, sir, what is your opinion in this case? So, yes. So, what we need to understand is that you should always interpret the end organ hormone depending upon your pituitary level. So, here you are seeing the TSH level is high. And everybody says if your TSH is high, this becomes a primary hypothyroidism. But you need to have a contextual assessment. So, FT4 and TSH have a log linear relationship. If your FT4 level is low, TSH should be sky high. This is primary hypothyroidism. If you have got a high FT4, TSH should be zero. This is thyrotoxicosis. But if you have a high level of FT4 and a high level of TSH, this becomes a TSH adenoma, very rare scenario. So don't bother about that. But this is most important. A low FT4 and a TSH less than 20 always exclude central hypothyroidism before you treat. Otherwise, they will go into crisis in that perspective. We have the seven-year-old girl who presented with kidney and muscle spasm. She had the hypocalcemia and a high phosphorus level with a normal creatinine level. And when the PTH level was done, it came out to be normal. So for me, it was, I was expecting a low PTH level. So what could be the diagnosis in this case if the PTH level is not low? So now first, if you look at hypocalcemia and hyperphosphatemia, normal creatinine, this is a PTH problem. Now, PTH should always be considered in the light of your calcium level. Here, the calcium is low. Your PTH should be very, very high. So, if your PTH is not high, we are thinking of an abnormal situation. So, this is clearly a hypoparathyroidism, which you should be very, very cautious about. So, we have this seven-day boy admitted in the NICU and we get a, got a reference for his hyperglycemia. He was maintaining his glycemic uh, levels with a GIR of 14 milligram per kg per minute. It was non-ketotic and the cortisol level uh, was 750. Even But this insulin level was 2 milli unit per ml and... Uh, uh, the insulin level is high for sugar. So, so again, is... you need to have a contextual assessment. So this hypoglycemic child should have a zero insulin. Any insulin during hypoglycemia is significant. So in endocrinology, basically, as we discussed, you need to understand what assay you are doing, how you are recommending. You need to look for the pre-analytical issues in terms of how to write the essay, how to take the sample, when to take the sample, which lab to send, then which technique to follow. Look at the lab if you have a discrepant result and always interpret in the context. What was the glucose when I did the insulin? What was the calcium when I did the PTH? What was the ketone level when I looked at insulin? What was the phosphorus when I did the PTH? All that becomes important. So I think this is what we wanted to highlight in that perspective. So we'll be over to uh, the chairperson's speech. Thank you so much, sir and Dr. Vibha. Uh, the importance of hormonal assays could not have been better explained uh, than the case-based scenarios which were just discussed. So thank you. I would like to invite Dr. Sake and Dr. Dhwani to kindly come forward for the next session on imaging. So it's indeed a pleasure to invite Dr. Sake, who is a leading intervention cardiologist in the region and Sorry, <laughs> intervention radiologist. So cardiologists have become radiologists. So, we have a confusion. so he has been really involved and we get a lot of uh, discussions with him with regards to a number of complicated cases, especially the pituitary and the adrenals and thyroid. So we are going to showcase some of the cases. So Dr. Saket, there will be a dialogue between you and Dr. Dhani and uh, it will go forward. So, because radiology is something which is extremely important for us. Yes, so as we know, 
every day in our clinic, we have children coming to us with specific signs and symptoms. We have a clinical diagnosis in mind. We get the blood investigations done to uh, that support our clinical diagnosis. But in the end, in most of our endocrine scenarios, we need radiological diagnosis to confirm and give the final diagnosis for our child. Today with us, we are extremely privileged to have Dr. Saket Nagam, Senior Radiologist at Regency Hospital. Now, we know the uh, common imaging modalities that we use in endocrine setup are the ultrasound, CT, and MRI. Of course, we will not be discussing X-ray today. Um, so let us start with... Uh, Sir, please. Yes, sir. so we'll start off with ultrasound. Uh, so could you explain the principle that ultrasound is based on? Ultrasound is, we have to go into the principles also. It's okay. like the basic. You send the sound waves, it comes back like it's, it's a practically taken from the sonar. What you submarines use, if they send the signal, they receive the signal and interpret the image on the basis of the sound waves. Yeah, yeah that's it in the short. So the advantages with ultrasound are that it is simple and cheap, no radiation exposure, and many angles and sections can be taken with an ultrasound. The major disadvantages with ultrasound is that expertise is required. And in older children, once the anterior fontanel is closed, no brain imaging is possible. So, sir, what uh, common endocrine organs can be used in ultrasound for? The adrenal is one of them. Yes, sir. Thyroid is another one. Yes. Easily accessible. And the ovaries. Okay. Yes, sir. thank you so much. Moving on to the CT scan. Uh, again, sir, could you in brief tell us? CT is an X-ray which rotates around the patient. The x-ray tube rotates around the patient. It gives a three-dimensional view. You have x-ray source at one place. You see in the upper part and on the all other sides are detectors. And the whole gantry moves in this way. The, the tube moves the clockwise direction and the same the detectors move. It takes the images out of it. So yes, it is, a, it is giving a 360 degree x-ray view of a given organ. Again, the advantages with CT are that it is a quick modality. It has lower cost than an MRI and uh, gives excellent bone visualization. Disadvantages are higher radiation exposure, poor soft tissue contrast, and the fact that it is non-portable, although we know that portable CT scans are also now being up available. The common uh, structure that one would see, endocrine structures on CT, uh, so... Stella, okay. Stella is one of them. Adrenals, okay. Pancreas, I would like to... Especially mention the part pancreas. Pancreas is best visualized on CTs. Cella, MRI can do the work. Adrenals, even ultrasound or MRI, I would say MRI is slightly superior, my personal view. Pancreas, CT is the choice of investigation. Thank you, sir. Moving on, uh, so a principle of MRI in brief. MRI principle, okay. It is like uh, you take the magnetic waves. You, they are bombard them on a boy, some on a human body, and it's basic of the hydrogen atoms get aligned because of the magnetic waves. As they return back to their normal position, the images are taken. This is the shortest one I can say. One is the word like resonance. Your you can take it in a different way. Your bo body's own magnetism and the machine's magnetism. A resonance is made between them when they do collide. A resonance appears, which is taken away, which forms the image. Yeah. So again, the advantages with MRI is that it allows excellent soft tissue visualization. It has no radiation exposure, and it is one of the mostly used um, investigation for endocrine gland visualization. The disadvantage is that it takes time in pediatric setting. It may require sedation, um, and again for Children with pacemakers and metals, or patients with pacemakers and metals, it is it cannot be done. Uh, uh, MRI co MRI compatible pacemakers are available nowadays, and most of the MRI pacemakers being used nowadays are MRI compatible. Okay. So again, sir, so the images, the organs where one would prefer an MRI in brain is one of them. Yeah, yeah. it's good in the pediatrics in the endocrine setting or pituitary adrenal. Okay, so we'll start off with imaging in pediatric endocrinology, the pituitary images. So uh, we'll start off with the anatomy, sir. 
T1, T2, two basic sequences. How do you differentiate? T1, can you give me the pointer once? I'll just show you this top before starting for the MRI. I would like to say, which one is it? No, top one. Okay. I know. I, so, this one. T1 CSF is hyper intense. Will I move the cursor here? So no. All you see around this is the third ventricle. All you can see the CSF spaces here. The whole, the black things you are seeing, T1 is CSF with black, T2 is CSF bright. Whenever you see something which is bright on T1, the T1 image here, what are the things which can appear T1 bright? The first and foremost thing which you can see is there are only a few things which are bright on T1. T2, everything is bright. Almost everything is bright on T2. T1 bright are blood. The first. The second is fat. I won't be able to show fat here. The blood, fat, melanin, and the posterior pituitary. These are the only four things. Just remember the point. Next is gadolinium, sometimes inspicited secretions. Everything is rare. The commonest three things are you have blood, uh, fat, and melanin. So when you see a teratoma, you see fat there. T1 bright, it gives you a diagnosis. You see a T mass lesion with a T1 bright signal. What can it be? It can be an apoplexy or it can be a lipoma. You have to differentiate between the two only. And third thing is melanoma. Tick? Okay. So, sir, uh, discussing the anatomy on uh, a societal section. So, what? We have already mentioned everything. Oh. <laughs> can I point to normal? No, that yes, the problem. Explaining everything. So, um, yeah. so that uh, we see the hypothalamus, the chiasm, the structures you look at in uh, on an MRI hypothalamus pituitary is identify the hypothalamus, the chiasm, and then you go back, go down and in the cellar tersica, you'll find the anterior pituitary and behind which you see the posterior right spot. What the you posterior. see, wherever the, you've seen a hypothalamus written, what you see anteriorly where the chiasm is written, chiasm. You go along, I'll just talk on the pointer. Yes, in the um, coronal section, again, um, as can be matched with the uh, adjacent uh, picture, we see the optic chiasm as the horizontal uh, disc like uh, structure. The thin stalk is what comes uh, down from there, and the uh, lower structure is the anterior pituitary with a concave upper surface here. CT uh, of pituitary is an excellent modality. Can we have something to point? Because it becomes difficult. Laptop also, we are not able to do it. You don't show there, yeah. Just pointing out it's. Okay, so this is the hypothalamus pituitary in the coronal section, sir. I'll go there. Yes. This is the pituitary. Sometimes when there is a microadenoma, how do you diagnose it in a non-contrast scan? What happens is you see a bulge on one side. The contour gets bulge up. So whenever you see a CRV pituitary, look into the bilateral contours. If there is a bulge on one side, a possibility of pituitary microadenoma remains. Okay. That's the important point in this one. And the stock deviation can be seen on the coronal images. On either side, there are carotids, and these are the cavernous spaces. These are the cavernous spaces, cavernous sinuses, and this is the internal carotid. 
any paracellular mass, if it infiltrates into the cavernous sinuses, coronal section is the best section for it. Uh, CT, as sir has mentioned, is an excellent modality to look at, look for bony involvement. So, sir, uh, what bony? There is a mass lesion. If you see there, this is whole. Uh, this complete is a mass lesion in the cella, which is extending up to the uh, supracellular region. It's causing in the uh, diaphragm cellae. This is a breakdown and destruction of the sphenoid sphenoid sinus. Again, as sir said, uh, an acute hemorrhage may be visualized. On acute, uh, acute hemorrhage. This is on CT. Yes. CT blood is bright. Calcification is bright. How do we measure calcifications blood? How do we differentiate on CT? It is on the attenuation value. A blood has an attenuation value of something around 50 to 60. The attenuation value ranges from minus 1000 to plus 1000. Minus 1000 is air, plus 1000 is calcification or bony calcification. So the everything ranges between it. What else you find negative is fat. There are only two things you find negative, air and fat. Fat ranges something between minus 100. And the blood, you can see it's less darker. It has a household unit of 54, 50 to 70. And this is something around 100 to 200. It's more brighter. Mm -hmm. So what are the key features that one will want to see in an MRI hypothalamus? What should we look at? One of the posterior, posterior pituitary. Yes, sir. Posterior pituitary is always bright on T1 weighted imaging, T1 MRI because of the polypeptides of esopressin, I think. Yes. Yeah. And the size of the uh, size of the anterior pituitary, the sphenoid sinuses, the infundibular stalk, optic chiasm. These are the main things which I've looked at. Thank you, sir. We'll move on to the cases now. We have a five-year-old girl with precocious puberty with Tanner stage two. Her height is significantly advanced and uh, bone age is at nine years. We find that the LHFSH levels are in the pubertal range, suggesting a, a gonadotropin-dependent precocious puberty. So uh, we went ahead with neuroimaging in this child and uh, this is what we see. So could you describe this image for us, sir? I'm not able to see it. Okay. So this is the optic chiasm of this part. Posterior, this area is known as the posterior to it. The area is known as tuber cinerium. The only common tumor you see in tuber cinerium is a hematoma. I don't know of any other malignancy coming out at that place. That is the only tumor and the region of tumor, uh, tumor scenario. So this was an hypothalamic hematoma. Moving on to the next case. Uh, we have a 27-year-old boy with growth failure, significantly compromised height and a pubertal staging of uh, uh, testicular volume of 2 ml and pubic hair stage 1. FT4 was low in the presence of a normal TSH, suggesting that this was central hypothyroidism. When uh, growth hormone stimulation test was done, the peak levels were 0.2, again suggesting growth hormone deficiency and undetectable LH levels. So this was a clear-cut clinical picture of MPHD. We went ahead with neuroimaging, and this is what we find. Um, Can anybody locate the pituitary? Empty cell. Okay. Yes. The cell is filled up with CSF. Yes. And... Uh, the one posterior to it is the bright spot of posterior pituitary in this one, sir? Yeah. Okay. Moving on, we have a 12-year-old boy with polyuria for one year. Initial screening tests were normal. Uh, he had a sodium of 138 and a urine osmolality of 71, suggesting that his plasma osmolality must have been around 270 to 80. So a concentrated blood, a dilute urine. We went ahead with ADP response test, which was positive. So we knew this was central DI. Now we need to know the cause in central DI. And imaging, neuroimaging was done. And I'm sorry, we don't have the right image here. <clears throat> um, but a posterior, absent posterior pituitary bright spot was uh, identified. So I want to know, say, what, uh, do we use a T1 or T2 uh, image to identify? T1. 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 And I said in a T1, what are the things bright on T1? Yes. T2, many things are bright. So don't judge on the basis of T2. And do we need to use a contrast image or a non-contrast non image? Non-contrast image for posterior. 
Moving on, we have a five-year-old boy with polyuria and weight loss, had normal screening tests. Again, uh, we see a concentrated blood and a dilute urine, positive AVP response test suggesting central DI. We went ahead with neuroimaging, and this is what we find. You have mass in the pineal region. And in the pituitary stalk. And another in the pituitary stalk, yeah. What is it? Well, I don't know. <laughs> the two lesions, so, two mass uh, lesions. For germinoma, what I said was you didn't have a plain scan. What we had was a contrast scan. You should have had a plain scan. Plain scan has, would have showed you calcification. Because of the gadolinium, the enhancement is there. Now you can't differentiate between the, the fat, fatty layers and the gadolinium enhancement. A plain image would have been more characteristic of it. No, this is a contrast image. Uh, so, as we know, for a hypothalamic involvement to cause DI, we would need a very large image. However, if even a small lesion in the pituitary stalk can cause a uh, central DI-like picture. So, the criteria for uh, pitu pituitary stalk thickening are um, uh, width of more than 3.5 millimeters at origin, width of more than 2 millimeters at insertion, and um, pituitary stalk wider than the basilar artery. Common causes in pediatric endocrinology are uh, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, autoimmune hypophysitis, sarcoidosis, and germinoma, which may cause pituitary stalk thickening. Moving on to the next case, we have a six-year-old boy with short stature, severely compromised height of 100 centimeters, had normal screening investigations, and a peak growth hormone level of 1.2 nanogram per litre ml. So low growth hormone, low cortisol, we made a diagnosis of MPHT and went ahead with neuroimaging. So, so this was the image that we got. We are not able to locate the infundibular stock, no? 16-year-old girl with delayed puberty, a compromised height of 144 centimeters, low LHFSH levels and low estrogen levels. Prolactin was 32 and cortisol was again low. So a borderline high prolactin. And this was what we got in neuroimaging. So this was again an MPHT with a slightly elevated prolactin. So this was the picture. What is it? It's a T2 image. T2. T2 fluid is bright. You find a lesion within the, within the cella which is bright on T2 suggesting a cystic lesion. The commonest cystic lesion there is that case cleft cyst. Moving on, we have a 14 year old boy with headache, had no focal deficit. MRI showed a mass lesion with prolactin of 80. To investigate for the cause, we went ahead with neuroimaging, and this is what we find. Now, so how do we identify if it is a, a supracellar mass coming down or a cellar mass that is going up radiologically? Whenever you have a cellar mass, if you have a cellar mass here, which extends superiorly, it will first widen the cella, causes breakdown, and then extend superiorly, wherever the bulk of tumor is there. Here, the bulk of the tumor is superiorly. So the mass has to be from the super, supracellar region extending downwards. So clinically, if you look at it clinically, diabetes insipidus is absent in cellar mass and uh, usually early manifestation in supracellar mass. Hypopituitarism is earlier in cellar mass and a late presentation in supracellar mass when it has come down and is causing uh, compromised anterior pituitary function. Prolactin is usually low in a cellar mass unless it is a primary prolactinoma and it is high in uh, supracellar mass where your uh, dopamine uh, causing Negative feedback on prolactin is impaired. Rim of pituitary tissue is absent in a cellar mass and is usually preserved in supracellar mass. And again, chiasmal involvement is early in a cellar mass that is progressing upward and is late in supracellar mass. Moving on, we have an 18-year-old boy with headache, had visual field complaint and very high prolactin of 414 nanograms per ml, so, uh, growth hormone deficiency and a central hypothyroidism. This is the uh, image that we got. So, sir, uh, could you describe where the... When I said, is, yeah. this is the coronal image, these are the carotids, these are the cavernous sinuses. 
the mass lesion in the cella with supracellular extension and also paracellular extension involving bilateral cavernous sinuses yes yeah, so um, cellular mass oh, cellular mass extending upward causing impingement of the optic chiasm causing visual field defect and also involving the supracellular area this was definitely a prolactinoma moving on we have this very interesting case 18 year old girl with headache presented to a neurologist with complaint of persistent headache for the last one year on examination she was found to have brisk dtrs and was advised neuroimaging now this is what we found on uh, the image yes uh, so what was interesting was that this uh, image was labeled as a pituitary adenoma and uh, being a pituitary adenoma she was referred to an endocrinologist for further workup now uh, we found that clinically she was short stature she had short stature had menarche at 12 years of age but had irregular menses since then clinically she had no goiter but we had a strong clinical suspicion of hypothyroidism in this case we went ahead with uh, blood investigation and what we found was low ft4 and a very high tsh so this is again to bring to your attention that when uh, you have a child with uh, patient especially who's come coming to you with a diagnosis of pituitary adenoma test for your um, thyroid function test because there may be a pituitary hyperplasia in the setting of primary hypothyroidism uh, next we have a 26 year old female with secondary amenorrhea had headache visual complaints recent had she had also developed recent onset polyuria passing about 7 to 8 liters per day we went ahead with neuroimaging and this is what we find so uh, so could you describe this image for us this is a contrast ct what i can see it is it is a heterogeneous mass lesion in the cella the cella has widened which is extending which is extending superiorly and also there is a cystic component in it is it and a craniopharyngioma or what is it yes sir so she was a craniopharyngioma she also has calcification yeah we could have taken a plain section this one again a contrast one okay whenever means being a radiologist we see all the images i'm used to all the images what we are seeing is one image then again it's a contrast image so differentiating different characteristics would be difficult moving on we have a seven and a half year old boy with precocious puberty who has also had a headache <clears throat> uh, workup showed a gonadotropin calcification is best seen on ct scan craniopharyngioma has calcification so it is best seen on ct scan the best analysis you can do of a craniopharyngioma is on ct scan so this was a uh, workup showed a gonadotropin dependent precocious puberty we went ahead with neuroimaging and this is what we find sir so is it within the parenchyma or outside the parenchyma how do you say within the parenchyma ct you can get confused mri we don't get confused because when you see sulci like this means it is outside if it would have been inside it would have obliterated the sulci because of the mass effect so it is something outside the brain parenchyma so it's an extra axial mass which is cystic in nature cystic because it is having a blood component fluid component now extra axial mass lesions within the brain are of this nature are arachnoid cyst or an epidermoid cyst there are two differentials for it and how do we differentiate between the two this is a diffusion weighted imaging diffusion weighted imaging this is t2 imaging we have to look into a diffusion weighted imaging on diffusion weighted imaging arachnoid cyst will appear as black and epidermoid would appear as bright so that is one sequence which we have to look after it to differentiate between arachnoid mm -hmm. and a epidermoid thank you and sir. the mass effect is still there you can look into it it has caused this is phenyl the orbital orbital margin has been displaced because of the mass lesion thank you sir so we know that management for arachnoid cyst is again supportive uh, moving on to adrenal imaging sir uh, would you describe uh, usg the supra second image if you look into it the small gland above the upper pole of kidney between the liver and the kidney is the adrenal and that's a 
coronal scan with between the IVC and the kidney, you can see a uh, coronal, I mean axial scan between the IVC and the kidney, you can see the suprarenal, the two limbs and the body. So it is classically visualized as the Y-shaped uh, structure that you see here. Um, discussing the adrenal anatomy in CP. Bilateral adrenals. How do you say adrenal is bulky or not bulky? The best thing is you have the adrenals here. These are the two limbs. How do you say these are bulky or not bulky? Just look into the diaphragm. If it is thicker than the diaphragm, it is bulky. If it is not thicker than the diaphragm, it is normal. And again on adrenals, it will be again. Yeah, same thing. Same uh, suprarenal same. position. That, that's where you'll be able to identify it in the same structure. So moving on to the case again, we have a seven-year-old boy with early puberty, had SPL of seven centimeter, but TV was two, two cc, had again hypertension. So we were thinking of an adrenal pathology, a, a, a peripheral precocious puberty, and we wanted to rule out an adrenal pathology. LHFSH were suppressed, again, supporting that this was a peripheral precocious puberty. And uh, testosterone level was high. His electrolytes were normal. 17 OHP was 20 nanograms per ml. And DOC was very high, 400 nanograms. This is the um, ultrasound of the adrenal. Let bulky see adrenals. The size of the adrenals will look. It's bulky. Yes. Yeah, so oh, this was a uh, CAH case, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, presenting as precocious puberty. Two-week-old child with birth weight of three kgs was doing well earlier, has now suddenly come up with shock and hematuria. Exact clinical examination shows a flank mass. How do we radiologically differentiate between uh, a renal vein thrombosis versus an adrenal hemorrhage, sir? Can I have an image? This is simply a bulky hemorrhage. Radiologically, in general, in your clinical practice, I mean, in your practice, uh, is so, it easy to differentiate between? No, I don't say it's easier. But when you have a hemorrhage, you have some amount of bright echoes, which you can see posteriorly where the arrow is. It's brighter. So there is some amount of blood here. And it's not easy. And if you were to uh, go for an imaging, would you? Uh, uh, I'll go for a CT. One. CT. Okay, sir. Moving on, we have a seven-year-old boy with peripheral precocious puberty, undetectable LHFSH levels, very high testosterone levels, low 17 OHP in HCG levels. So um, this is the imaging uh, that we find here. So what Large is Large adrenal mass, which has displaced the kidney. The kidney lies anteriorly. The spleen has been displaced, a large mass. And, uh, so was it malignant? Yes, sir. So this adrenal came out mass, be... if it is larger than four centimeter, there are high possibility it turn, turning out to be a malignancy. Except for myelolipoma. Except myelolipoma, all other adrenal masses, if larger than four centimeters, should be considered malignant, otherwise proof. So as sir has mentioned, if you have a adrenal mass with regular margins, less than 10 uh, Hounsfield units, a homogeneous structure, early washout and uh, a smaller size, especially one will think of an adenoma. Whereas if you have a mass larger than four centimeters, that is a denser, more than 20 ounce film units, heterogeneous, and then one would think of a carcinoma. Moving on to the next case, we had a 16 year old girl who had severe abdominal pain and constipation, had normal blood pressure and electrolytes, cortisol level was 170 nanomoles per liter. Uh, for this uh, pain in abdomen, she went in an MRI and uh, was found to have an adrenal tumor for which she was referred to endocrine clinic. So, so what is this tumor specification that you see here? Exactly the left kidney is displaced inferiorly and there is a mass lesion you can see which is bright on T2. These are all T2 images. You can see the calluses, the ureter coming out bright. So the fluid is bright. What else do you find bright on T1? If you have taken T1, it would have been bright. You see a large mass here, which has displaced the kidney, a bright mass here. 
This is a fat containing myelolipoma. Uh, moving on, we have 15 year old female with resistant hypertension, not controlled in three classes of drugs, had normal uh, plasma renin activity and electrolytes, and increased plasma metanephrines. <clears throat> so, sir, if you're thinking of a diagnosis of um, <clears throat> pheochromocytoma, uh, what, what is prefer preferred, CT or an MRI? Both of them not do, or an intensely enhancing mass, pheochromocytoma. Uh, so, could you describe? Uh, Pheochromocytoma on different images, how it... You can see a mass region on CT scan, which is indenting over the kidneys. On T1 imaging, they are, uh, they are hypo-intense, which I think they are dark. Most of the tumors, most of the things are dark on T1 imaging, except a few which I mentioned. T2 imaging, it appears at bright. Contrast enhancement, it shows heterogeneous contrast enhancement. Okay, that's it. Uh -huh. Uh, last on, we have thyroid imaging. So, uh, sir, could you describe uh, the ultrasound? You, what you see in ultrasound is a homogeneous structures, symmetrical on both the sides with the right and left lobe, almost equal, equal in size and equal in signal characteristics. So one of the things which has to be kept in mind is the vascularity. Whenever you do an ultrasound of a thyroid, the vascularity has to be checked. If there is an increase in the vascularity, it's either a Graves disease or a thyrotoxicosis. The rest of them claim you are looking look for an adenoma. That's it. Okay. Moving on to the first case, we have a 60 year old boy with uh, who's who had a very high TSH on newborn screening. Day seven TSH was hundred with a low FT four. An ultrasound was done. So, so what uh, is this? What do we see here? Are you able to see a thyroid here? Oh, so okay. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, uh, this was labeled as a thyroid agenesis, confirmed on nuclear scan, which showed no uptake. And so we know this child will require lifelong thyroxine replacement here. Three-year-old girl, difficulty in swallowing on examination at a massive base of tongue. TSA, the thyroid profile was normal. Uh, when we went ahead with the ultrasound, again, as the previous image, we saw no thyroid gland. We went for a nuclear scan, which showed an ectopic uh, Thyroid tissue, and this was a case of lingual thyroid. Seven days old female with history of um, seven day old baby with history of maternal hypothyroidism had a very high TSH on uh, newborn screening. Uh, repeat TSH was again high with low FT4, suggesting um, a congenital hypothyroidism. Now we want to know if this is transient or will persist. So we went ahead with uh, ultrasound. You see a nodule on the left side of the thyroid. There is a nodule out there. Yeah. So the thyroid gland was visualized uh, in the right position. Nuclear scan showed no uptake. And the anti-TPO levels were high. So this was basically a transient uh, hyper congenital hypothyroidism, secondary to maternal TSH uh, receptor blocking antibodies. 12-year-old girl with neck swelling had clinically a soft goiter, normal uh, thyroid function, we went ahead with ultrasound neck, and this is what we see. An anechoic structure, it's a fluid containing cyst. The colloid goiter. 18 year old girl with classical symptoms of thyrotoxicosis had right uh, nodular goiter on examination, very high FT4 with a suppressed TSH. And this is the picture that we see here. We wanted to know if this was um, Graves versus the thyrotoxic nodule. Uh, this looks like more of a thyrotoxic nodule, this one. Again, a 25-year-old girl, a lady with the goiter, had lethargy and polymenorrhea, low FT4, high TSH. And this is the picture that we uh, got on ultrasound. A heterogeneous appearance. It's not that smooth appearing. And if you put a vascularity, it will be intensely vascular. This was thyrotoxic versus? This was thyroiditis. Thyroiditis. Mm -hmm. Thyroiditis. 12 year, this is the, uh, moving on to the next case. We have a 12 year old boy who had come with neck swelling. He had diffuse goiter with a bosselated surface on palpation. An ultrasound was done, and this is the image that we see bilateral thyroid nodules with small specks of bright specks. Was it colloid? So, because you have multiple specks on it. 
So we had gone with an FNAC, which was suggestive okay. of a so carcinoma. So it was the other thing was a papillary calcifications, which you see in CA uh, papillary, papillary carcinomas. carcinomas. So yes, this Tiny was calcifications. Okay, so we are at the end of our session. Thank you so much, sir, Welcome. for being with us here today. So I'll take some inputs from the chairperson, Dr. Vikrant first. Dr. Arpita? I would agree it was an enriching session, especially these images are very confusing as far as the physicians are concerned. Thank you so much, sir. So I think the key messages that you would like to give Dr. Sake to the endocrine perspective, I think mainly they discuss about three major organs, the pituitary, the thyroid, and the adrenals. So just maybe on pituitary three, and thyroid three, something like that. Mainly we need to know what to order and how to interpret this. First is, I would like everyone, whenever the MR images come, just look into it once before going into the report or after the report also, just keep in touch with the T1, T2 and the sequences. So you get acquainted to it. That's my first point. Second is thyroid is always ultrasound and never a CT because you don't want to radiate it. Thyroid. About the pituitary, MRI is the best one. MRI is the best, ovaries, ultrasounds are the best, pancreas, I have said multiple times today itself, that CT is the best. I okay. think the other big thing which often happens in terms of ovarian imaging is that we are often labeled as PCOS. So what is your take about that? Uh, what are really the criteria we should take in terms of PCOS and the significance of that? We always mention PCOS, PCOS like uh, ovaries. Yes. We don't use the word PCOD as such. Yes. We, PCOS are bulky kidneys with peripherally arranged follicles and a ecogenic stroma. The center part is ecogenic and peripherally arranged follicles, which is larger in size. That's it. I think that's a very important message because radiologists always write PCOS like appearance. So PCOA. And we clinicians often make it like PCOD. They are not saying this is PCOS. So remember in adolescence particularly, this PCO appearance is of no consequence. Basically, we have to look at clinical features, hyperandrogenism, anovulation, and this feature will be of least significance. And that's very, very important to understand in that perspective. The other, yes, I think volume, volume of course. are important, but uh, more than 15, 15 cc are usually con uh, considered as a large for the China. Yeah. And I think one very, very important reason that we do uh, the sort of uh, evaluation is in terms of the precocious puberty. Yeah. So we look for basically the uterus and the other factors. So how do you really guide when you think that the puberty is happening and this sort of thing in the uterus shape, the size, what is the, your guide? The, uh, size of the uterus, the endometrial thickness, the solid and if the follicles are dominant or not, or they have ruptured or not, that's it. I think that's very important. So we always look at if the size, the shape has become from tubular to more globular structure, whether you've got an endometrial stripe, as Dr. Thakit has said, and whether your length is more than 32 mm. So I think these criteria will become very, very important. This was a very, very uh, intriguing and a very, very difficult session. Because especially since you came running from the <laughs> hospital, I'm sure you would have done a lot of interventions today. So this was a very good intervention on our part. Hopefully we are all more learned uh, on that. If there are any questions, we can take them. Yes, please. Mike. In, uh, doing USG neck, can we also see uh, parathyroid glands? Parathyroid glands, until uh, unless bulky, we are not able to see them. Only when they are bulky, they are seen them. Many of the times, even we report parathyroid gland and they turn out to be lymph nodes in those locations. Even I do get confused with them. Okay, so you. for parathyroid gland, then probably the best would be to go for a scan. scan the yeah. nuclear scan will always be better, especially the sesame B scan will be better. Now, one case which we actually discussed with you also was the pancreatic lesion. So not in terms of the pancreatitis or anything. Sometimes we have hyperinsulinism in which you have a very small lesion. We know that PET is better, but if you want to do CT or this thing, which one will I'll be better? Also for triple phase CT. Triple, triple phase, CT. phase CT. Pancreas is CT and we go for triple phase CT. Some of, I've got a, I've published a paper on uh, multiple insulinomas. 
the multiple insulomandibular patient, some of the lesions got enhanced in the arterial phase. When you say a triple phase, it is in the arterial phase, then again the CT is repeated in the portal phase and then in the venous phase. So some of the insulomas get enhancement, get enhanced on arterial phase, some on portal phase and some on venous phase. As we had around 8 or 10 insulomas in that particular case and everyone was enhancing in a different phase. So right. whenever you order for suspecting an insulinoma, go for a triphasic CT. I think that's a very important uh, thing that you discussed. Another case in which, which is rare, but uh, maybe the audience would be interested would be ectopic Cushing's. So we have got a very high level of ACTH. The MRI pituitary is normal. We want to localize the most common cause in children will be like carcinoids, especially the bronchial carcinoid and that. And we know the diagnostic accuracy of uh, these imaging may not be very good. Yeah. But what will be the best recommendation you will give Dr. Saket for the identification of carcinoid lesions? In I this think situation? CT scan would be the best one. CT scan, CT scan of the, the chest and mediastinal yeah. basically yeah. will be the, the, one be the best one. MRI in the chest, in the mediastinum is good. But because of the respiratory movements, the images are not that clear always. So I think uh, with, yes, Dr. Vasanta. Yeah. That uh, we just saw one uh, M uh, MRI in that it was, uh, he, he just told about, uh, it was a case of MPHD and uh, it was shown as uh, empty cella. But yep. I, according to me, I think uh, M uh, MPHD, every case will not have empty cella. And empty cella also is not vice versa. Yeah, so it can yeah. have many things. Yes, but MPHD, I think there are many presentations. Yes, no? yes, not yes. always. You, know, always so you can have a cella. tumor. You can yes. have a stock uh, thickening. You can have an infiltrative disorder. So, but yes, empty cella can have MPHD, definitely. It is that, but this is not that. No, no, no. no they are two different things. So this is a cause. So it depends. This is one of the causes. Yes. One yeah. of the causes. All empty cellars don't present will with this. Not, because yes. in adults, many times empty cellar, they yes. think that it is normal. They yeah, just it will just, depend upon most of the empty cellars are normal. Normal. <laughs> that is the thing. That's why I thought MPHD, when we think it's a big thing. An empty cellar, they No, no, you normal. have to work up. So if you have empty cellar, even if you are saying that it is normal, you should do a baseline endocrine workup before you say that it's normal. Because what is empty cellar? It means that your pituitary was damaged and it's fueled by fluid. Even if you have 1 to 5% pituitary functioning, it may be normal. But suppose 100% is damaged, you will have MPHD in that setting. So we routinely get a lot of referrals from neurologists with this empty cella. And I would say 5 to 10% will have actually a multiple pituitary hormone deficiency. So this is something which I is there. Think, uh, that's yeah. only I wanted so to that is the thing. It. And I think Thank the last you. point would be regarding the incidental lesions. So we are seeing a lot of incidental lomas, particularly in the pituitary and the adrenals. So what is your take about them? Like, uh, how do we really, we know about the diagnostic workup from an endocrine perspective. MRI, from, in both the conditions, MRI would be the best one. MRI would be the best one to do the further workup yeah. in that perspective. So I think it was a wonderful question to take. Dr. Alka has, I think, the last question here. Thyroid, uh, regarding malignancy, we do elastography. I don't... Elastography is an ultrasound itself. Mic on to. Like based on the ultrasound, we can define, uh, by and large, we can define whether the uh, lesion is benign or the malignant. Is there any added benefit of doing elastography in patient with thyroid nodules? Yeah, thyroid nodules, uh, no, it's not always that we are able to differentiate between benign and, uh, the, uh, benign and malignant. We do have to do many times. We have to do an FNC to diagnose it's as a benign or a malignant. Any added benefit yeah. of doing elastography? Elastography is helpful. It says about the thickness, the density of the lesion, elastic elasticity of the lesion. It is done in only two conditions. One is breast breast tumors and the thyroid nodules. So if a, in a malignancy you find it to be less elastic. So it will become so more it uh, is rigid. Edge. Yeah, it is more rigid. So, and anyways, we have got a very specific tyrat scoring system, yeah. which is there based upon the guidelines are there that when you should do an FNAC. 
So now we are more proactive in terms of FNAC. But one message is that whenever you're doing a FNAC thyroid in a child, it should always be ultrasound guided. Yeah. I think now you routinely, you do all yeah. of them are ultrasound guided, but definitely for children, you should definitely have an ultrasound guided uh, FNAC. So I think this was a wonderful session. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Vikas, your last question. Huh. Then. I guess, a few comments on adrenal imaging, please. Adrenal imaging. Huh. You, MRI is the best modality. Uh, in every case, you, or you start with sonography and then go for MRI. No, sonography will definitely give you, it's an easy one. You can give you a suspicion if there is a mass or not. If they characterize a mass, MR would be the best one. And Looking into a mass, ultrasound is good. And to characterize the mass, MRI is the best. So screening, you can use ultrasound and then follow up by, yeah. by MRI. But yeah. I'll give you a warning that I've seen patients with precocious puberty, particularly boys, in which ultrasound was normal. Huh, and then CT huh. and other things picked up. Yeah. So we have to be very cautious that's when you why, have a small lesion. That's why I am. So generally, you can do ultrasound as a screening. It's easily it's available. One, yeah. But it's also operator dependent. So how well the operator is. So we will be confident doing here. But otherwise, if I'm really worried about a carcinoma, I'll do a CT also and MRI from that. MRI, as I Sake said, is the best modality on that regards. So I think this was a wonderful session. I'll request Dr. Vikas to kindly felicitate uh, Dr. Saket. So, uh, we are waiting for Dr. Hemchan because his flight is getting late. Uh, any information about Dr. Hemchan? Because the next session due is with regards to Dr. Oh, Hemchan on BMD. Uh, he was just reaching very close. So, uh, meanwhile, while we are just waiting for his, I think I've got his call. So, you can pick it up immediately. So, while we are discussing uh, the BMD part, so uh, we'll call, uh, we'll see if he's coming close. We can start off the session now. So he's coming, he's just downstairs and coming up. So I'll invite uh, uh, Mr. Dr. Alapan and maybe we can discuss a bit about BMD as to why we do BMD in the clinical practice. So bone density assessment is extremely important in clinical practice and often there is a lot of confusion which is there with regards to BMD. So when do you usually order Dr. Vikrant in terms of BMD in your so practice? When the pre-test probability is very high and particularly when the Z scores are available, the particular children's soft, uh, the software meant for pediatric population are there, then uh, only so sir. Or we are, we are dealing with some fragility fractures, yes. uh, which fall so, in the range of more than uh, three fractures in the first uh, year of life. Or so I think that's a very important, important message that don't do BMD unnecessarily in everybody. In children, there are defined indications. So if you're doing in research, that is different. But otherwise, you should do BMD only in very, very specific conditions. And the other point you said that when you're doing BMD, you should look at specific score K areas which are available, like the Z scores which are available. Because if you don't have a pediatric software, you would not have a right modality which is there. So uh, while we are waiting for Dr. Hemchan, do we have a script? So, we should give a round of applause to Dr. Hemchan, who has come running from Chennai since morning. Welcome, Hemchan. I am. We just we are absolutely at the right time. So, your presentation. You said. You said. While we search up the presentation. Yes. Uh, so, Dr. Hemchan Prasad uh, has had a pediatric endocrinology training. No, 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 it's fine. It's fine. Already, I'm late. I'm sorry about that. So, um, uh, hi, everybody. So, what we have done is we have kind of had a lot of discussions and uh, 
we've kind of worked on this presentation to keep it very interactive and uh, during the presentation he'll make some mistakes which is actually wantedly done so that you know to reinforce that there is no uh, bone thing i think they, no not that I've been following, and you rightly said the uh, the practical difficulties in uh, in uh, interpretation of uh, DEXA scan, and and uh, parallelly, uh, uh, the uh, sir also reinforced the importance of doing DEXA at the right indication, not simply doing DEXA for everybody who comes with a, a suspected uh, bone mineral density, low bone mineral density. So before we start, we'll have to uh, introduce him just definitely. Because Hemchand is really a shining star of pediatric endocrinology and he did training under Dr. Vaman Khadilkar in 2011 and has been really doing wonders across the country. He is practicing in Chennai, Mehta Children's Hospital, has been involved in a lot of academic activities, uh, contributed publications in different fields including type 2 diabetes, obesity, congenital hypothyroidism, CEH, so a wide variety of presentations. He's written books also. So I think uh, again we'll give a big applause to Hemchand. And uh, now the stage is yours to take and carry from there. Fine. So on that note, let us just start off. So if you see a DEXA scan report, it is like this, full of numbers, full of names. And actually, as we go through this presentation, you realize that every bit of the DEXA scan report is important. It's not just seeing one number and saying this is normal, this is abnormal. No, every point in this DEXA report has a lot of meaning. So when we consider uh, children when to do a DEXA scan in a child with uh, 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 suspected low bone density, it's like, in, like looking at a, a tip of the iceberg. All of us know very well the children who develop uh, recurrent fractures are likely to have uh, a low bone mineral density, but also we should never forget there are a lot of chronic children who are under our care who might be at the risk of osteoporosis that we are missing. So the uh, International Society of Clinical Densitometry has kind of given uh, uh, an evolution of guidelines. If you see right from 2007, 2013, 2019, and the guidelines have become better, better and better more practical, more useful, and more friendly towards the children. So coming, when should we think of uh, osteoporosis in children? Pathological fractures, recurrent fractures. I think this is the, uh, the most important thing that practitioners we should know. Pathological fractures, recurrent fractures. What would be pathological fracture? Any single vertebral fracture without local trauma, without local disease. That's very important. Any single vertebral fracture, no local trauma, no local disease is a pathological fracture. Why should a normal child have a vertebral fracture? Any low trauma fracture in a child with chronic disease or in a drug that is likely to bring down the bone mineral density. Parallelly, what is recurrent fracture? As all of us know, more than two long bone fractures, less than 10 years, more than or equal to three long bone fractures in children below 19 years. So when you have this sort of a suspicion, you should do a DEXA scan and you should go in terms of looking for an underlying bone fragility condition. And the guidelines have very beautifully described what is uh, high, high trauma, uh, what is this low trauma fracture. Fracture that is sustained not due to a motor, uh, motor vehicle accident, uh, a fracture that occurs from a height of 10 feet, you know, when you have fall from a significant height, that is not low trauma. That fracture has to occur because that's 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 how the significant trauma is. And a fracture sustained fall from standing height at a speed not more than that of a walking speed. You're just walking and you fall down and you develop a fracture. You have to be careful. This could be low trauma fracture. So the guidelines have become better and better and have become very user friendly. And in a child, what should you do? Look at the risk of fractures, look at the fracture characteristics, do a quick screening, look for blue sclera, dental abnormality, short stature, any family history of such problems, etc. before going further. 
and in a child with a long standing chronic problem i think the list of long standing chronic problem and when one should do a dexa scan is very beautifully mentioned in this slide and of course you would find it in any textbook of pediatric endocrinology as well so on this note i think i i post this first case to uh, alapan dr alapan this is a child who comes to you 10 year old boy a significant fracture humerus he had recurrent fractures previously he also had another fracture while getting down from the car just getting down from the car he had a fracture of the tibia these are his anthropometric parameters and this is his uh, uh, his uh, dexa scan what would be your take on this uh, sir uh, the patient has a uh, three fracture in between 10 years of age and associated with a family history with blue scare so it, to me it look like a case of primary osteoporosis uh, due to osteogenesis imperfecta as the uh, bone mineral densities were also in the lower side yes i think that the screen is missing the uh, this one you can see that they, he says that the bone total body less head bone mineral density less head score is minus 2.8 so do you think it's normal or low it's low sir so what is your diagnosis sir uh, this is a case of primary osteoporosis i yes, think yes very good so he thinks in terms of osteoporosis this is case number 2 a similar 9 year old child first episode of fracture while getting down from the car it is a low trauma fracture it's the first uh, low trauma fracture and what is his bmd z score are uh, less than 2 sir this is uh, again uh, i think this is a case of osteoporosis very good he has he has thought of osteoporosis he has done a dexa scan the dexa scan has given a low bone mineral density and he is making a diagnosis of osteoporosis third case uh, this in this case sir a 10 year old boy who had a, a new onset of uh, acute leukoblastic uh, leukemia and he was on uh, induction therapy or associated with uh, prednisolone for 3 months uh, he has a spinal compression fracture associated with a uh, dexa score which was in the lower side but not uh, less than 2 so less than I, minus 2 less than minus yes so do you think this is normal or this is osteoporosis uh, this is a case of osteoporosis sir this is no normal isn't it the, the dexa is normal sir so he says the dexa scan is showing more than minus 2 so he thinks that this child does not have osteoporosis i think let us see what whether he is right or wrong so if you see the technical definitions as i said more than two long bone fractures below 10 years and more than three long bone fractures below 19 years is osteoporosis and a single low trauma fracture of the vertebra without local disease or without local trauma uh, thank you so much is low is uh, is also considering to have a significant pathological fracture and as far as chronic diseases are concerned children with systemic diseases who have a bone threat children with systemic diseases who are on drugs which are going to impact the bone health and children with chronic diseases who are unlikely to have an improvement in their under underlying disease maybe like cystic fibrosis who may not be willing for a lung transplant these group of children are at significant risk of osteoporosis as well so we understood that we have to measure bone mineral density for these children if you see a dexa report what is it that you should look for in children less than 2 years total body less head bone mineral consent content 2 to 5 years total body less head bmc and bmd and 5 to 18 years preferably total body less head bmc and bmd and spine so i think the message is once you decide that yes you have to do a dexa scan for this child you do a dexa scan which part of the report you should focus on look at the age and look at the specific area i think the important thing is you would have to look at usually done in children between 5 to 18 years on a practical note look at the bmd z score of tblh i think i repeat it again look at the z score of tblh and spine okay having done that what is how would you interpret that you look at the z score what do you mean by z score you arrange the uh, this uh, the bone mineral density of 100 children who are age and sex matched in the ascending order for 100 boys who are age 9 years you measure bone mineral density and you arrange it in the ascending order if you find that he is below minus 2 standard deviations if he is below the third percentile he has osteoporosis or low bone mass if he has above the 2z score he has normal bnd he does not have osteoporosis that is a practical understanding so remember that is not complete you always should remember we are using z scores what is it that we are using we are comparing with age and sex match children we are not comparing it with healthy adults t score is a comparison with a healthy adult we don't compare it with a healthy adult 
the fracture risk and uh, and the relationship between DEXA scan is not very clear. And always remember, children with osteoporosis can have normal bone dendral density as well. So what does it mean? I may have osteoporosis, but my DEXA scan can be normal. If the disease is very rapidly progressive, I take bulk of steroids, I may not get time for, for my Z scores to develop low enough, but I may develop a fracture because of osteoporosis. And conversely, you cannot diagnose osteoporosis just on the basis of a DEXA scan. Just on the basis of a DEXA scan, you cannot make a diagnosis of osteoporosis. Low bone mineral density without fractures is called as low bone mass. So how, how would we put it in a practical perspective? BMD Z-score more than minus 2 is normal BMD. BMD Z-score less than minus 2 without fracture is low bone mass. And BMD Z-score less than minus 2 with fracture is osteoporosis. I repeat again, BMD Z-score less than minus 2 with fracture is osteoporosis. Having understood these things, always remember how do you in this, all these softwares, etc., which we will be going through have been developed on the Western population. There are some Indian data that is available as well, which we will go through uh, specifically, but always remember, look at BMD Z scores for total body, less head and spine, and look at the Z score, look at the fracture history, look at the clinical context, and then make a diagnosis of osteoporosis. This is normative data on Indian children, which is available from one single center, 920 children, but it is going out of flavor. I we will discuss about it subsequently. And also another set of normative data which is available is from Indian children who are living in the UK. This is really uh, uh, postulated as a good robust data set where they have uh, the uh, data of the bone mineral density of about 400 Asian children, well-to-do children living in the UK. So their BMD Z scores have been used provided on three different machines. If you look at the previous data set, it was done on a single center with a single pencil beam machine. But this, you have data on 400 children living in the UK from all the available DEXA machines. So this is really becoming more popular, but the final word is not out. So having understood these things, Dr. Alapan, now revisit and tell me what is this case? What's your diagnosis? Uh, this case is a 10-year-old boy with a fracture of humerus at so three years. Two, two, two fractures, fractures he had. So is it significant fracture or insignificant? Yes, I think this is significant. He feels it is significant fracture. What is the BM? Uh, which part of this DEXA scan report would you look into? So many numbers are there. Uh, look to uh, like the total uh, in the 10-year-old boy. Uh, I would like to look the lumbar, uh, lumbar spine and total, total body, body less head. What does the Z score tell you? It's less than two, sir. Less than minus two. Minus two so what yes. is your interpretation? So this is a case of childhood osteoporosis. He's a clear a wolf staring at you. He has a significant fracture history. His BMD Z scores are low. He has osteoporosis. Okay. What about the second case? Uh, in this case, sir. How many fractures he had? There, there is only one fracture. So is it pathological? No, sir. I don't. Is think... it recurrent? No, sir. This is not. Does recurrent. he have any underlying disease that puts him at a risk of a next episode of fracture? No, sir. There is no. not. And what about the Z scores? Uh, so jet scores are on the lower side, uh, less than minus two. In the Very numbers. good. So he has low bone mineral uh, density, but he does not have a significant fracture right. history. Now, having understood the guidelines, would you label this child as osteoporosis? No, sir. I don't. Very know. good. He would not label. What is the terminology you would use? It's a low bone mass, sir. Very good. This is like looking at a sheep with a wolf's clothing. Looks as if he has osteoporosis, but this boy does not have osteoporosis. Yeah, you're saying one fracture. No, use recurrent fractures. You need recurrent fractures. More than two episodes below 10 years, more than three episodes below uh, 19 years or a single vertebral fracture. Single vertebral fracture in the absence of local trauma, in the absence of local disease. So in that case, you don't even need a DEXA. You don't even need a DEXA. And for this case, what is your interpretation? Uh, in this case, sir, there was a uh, risk factor present. The child is uh, ALL with the induction therapy and also prednisolone is there. But uh, looking at the DEXA scores, these are not very significantly low. So, but what about the vertebra? It is, has a wedge compression fracture. Present. Very good. So he has a single wedge compression vertebral fracture with a risk factor. He's on steroid therapy. Would you label this child as osteoporosis or normal? Yes, sir. I want to uh, label him as osteoporosis. So very there is a spinal fracture. Very present. good. Very good. So I think DEXA scan is one part of the puzzle. It is a, one part of the puzzle. It is not the full picture. 
So I think always remember you can have a very, very clear cut case like this case, a simple wolf staring at you. You can have a false positive, an abnormal DEXA with a normal kid. And you may have a false negative, a, a wolf hiding in a sheep. So you may have a normal a, a diseased child with a normal report. Thank you very much, Alapan. Let's go on to the next set of cases. So read what what would what read this case and your uh, interpretation. This is a 10 year old boy with a recent fracture while getting down from the car with a fracture trivia. Height jet score was on the lower side and the decks are done showing a low uh, on the less than two in the, the total uh, body less head and lumbar spine region. So according to me, sir, this is a case of uh, osteoporosis. Again. Thank you very much. Very beautiful. He he saw this child. He thought he said uh, there is a fracture. He looked at the Z score and the Z score is very significant. It's minus three. He's worried. He wants to think in terms of osteoporosis. Remember, be careful while reading a DEXA report. DEXA is a two-dimensional assessment of a three-dimensional structure. You always have to interpret it in the perspective of a pediatric software. What do I mean by this? If you look at three different cubes, all the three cubes have different sizes. All the three cubes have different area. All the three cubes have different area in bone mineral densities, but their volumetric bone mineral density is similar. If you put all the three cubes in a, key, in a piece of water, tumbler of water, they should be floating. I think that is the concept. But if you look at the aerial bone mineral density, they are different. And DEXA measures aerial bone mineral density. So it is like throwing a light torch light on these cubes and getting different areas. So in tall children, it erroneously gives a falsely high report. In short children, it gives a false low report and fools us. So if you see a child who is extremely short or extremely tall, you have to be very careful. How do you correct? So you've understood that this the poly the polycious of this child could be because that this child had a height Z score of minus 5.6. He was a dwarf. This dwarf, you're looking at that. And how would you correct this? So what there are different methodologies of correction described in literature, usage of BMAT scores, height adjusted Z scores, and Molgaard's approach. I think this, I would like to spend some time on this. So what is commonly done is Molgaard's equation or a correction that is done. So what if you, the Molgaard's approach uses three steps. If you see the DEXA report, I told you every part of the DEXA report is important. If you see a DEXA report down below, it will give you three centile charts like that. It will tell you the, the child's height in the perspective of age, bone mineral, con, uh, bone mineral consent, bone area for height, and BMC for bone area. It will give you three important percentile, and this will help you interpret what has happened. Are the bones short or are they normal? Are the bones thin or are they normal? Are the bones light or are they normal? So this kind of an understanding, this part of the DEXA report gives you. And if you look at for this particular child, case four, what he is presenting, uh, what you can see is the height for age is at very much below the third percentile. The bone area for height is at the 50th percentile. The BMC for bone area is at the 50th percentile. So what has happened because this child is short, you're getting an erroneous Z score of minus 3.4. But if you correct it for height, the child's bone mineral density is falling at the 50th percentile. So this is a classical case of a sheep who's masquerading like a wolf. You think this child has low bone mineral density, but he does not have if you correct it for height. However, if you remember the first case which Alapan presented, it's also a very classical case. If you see this child was normal stature for age, he had a, a the bone area for height at the third percentile, but his bone mineral content was below the first percentile. So mole guards correction, that part of the DEXA report helps you correct for height. If I really have to give a simplistic understanding of what is this correction for height concept, it is this. On the top side, I have arranged 100 children who are aged and sex matched for that particular age. And if your bone mineral density is below that, it is osteoporosis. Above that, it is normal bone mineral density. However, if I arrange 100 children who have the same height, remember 100 children who have the same height, and I arrange them in ascending order, I find that this child falls in the green signal. Are you able to understand the concept of height correction? In the top part, I am arranging the bone mineral density of 100 children who are age and sex matched. Below, I'm arranging 100 children who are age, sex, and height match. In that group, this child forms normal, 
in the previous group, this child has bone mineral, low bone mineral density. I think this concept of, you know, having a false interpretation of in short children is very important so that we don't overdiagnose. So now if you use a pediatric software, what is your interpretation? Uh, sir, uh, as you have rightly described that uh, before jumping into the uh, bone mineral density directly, we have to first look out for the height, whether the child was short for his age or not. And in my case, the height Z score is less than mine 5.6, which is very less. So I don't think this is a case of osteoporosis. Rather, when we correct for the height in this child, the reports could be in the normal range. Excellent. So I think very important to use a pediatric software or there are manual ways where you can use uh, uh, how to correct for height about which we will discuss in the end. So this is the fifth case. I'll again, quickly summarize this case. Yes, sir. Again, a 15 year old boy, recent fracture while getting down for the ca car. Here, height is on the lower side, minus 2.6. Tanner staging is one and bone is 11 years. By looking just at the DEXA, uh, we can say this is a case of osteoporosis again. Okay. Just looking at the DEXA scan, he says this is osteoporosis. But remember, in children with delayed puberty, the bone accrual has not started and it has not completed. So you might not be wise in comparing the bone mineral density of this 15-year-old child with other 15-year-old boys who have entered into puberty and are in stage 4. So they have significant sex hormone surge and their bone mineral density is pushed forward. So if you compare this child's height, compare it with children who, have, who are 15 years age and sex match, you would label this child as osteoporosis. But if you compare this child's bone mineral density with 100 children who have the same bone age, 100 children who have the same sexual maturity, 100 boys with delayed puberty who are biologically delayed and are standing at 10 years of age, who are still prepubertal, you would find that this child has normal bone mineral density. So in case of children with delayed puberty, always remember to use the bone age for interpretation. So, Alapan, what is your interpretation? Uh, again, sir, uh, the, the, uh, as the Tanner stage is one in a case of 15-year-old boy, so the boy definitely presented with delayed puberty and in the light of delayed puberty, we should not consider osteoporosis but just looking at the DEXA scan. Very good. So, I think you, you learned that when you see short children, you have to do a correction. You also learned that when you saw children who had delayed puberty, you had to do a correction with bone age. Okay. Alapan, this is an interesting case. Can you just summarize it up? Uh, again, a 10 years old boy, history of fracture humerus at 3 years and at radius at 7 years, uh, years while playing with cousins. We, uh, he had a also recent fracture. Uh, he, uh, he, high jet score was minus 1.7, tenor was 1 and bone age was 10 years. So he, he made a diagnosis of osteoporosis because of recurrent fractures. I think he is right. And he did a DEXA and he saw that the bone mineral density was low. He did this in 2021. So what did you do for the past one year? Uh, past one year, he was on bisphosphonate. And Very good. You gave bisphosphonate and you redid a DEXA scan. What do you see in this DEXA scan? The DEXA scan is showing the, there is a deterioration of the... Uh, Very, the, the, Very the, 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 good. There is a deterioration. So what would you do as a clinician in this, in this, in this point? Uh, at this particular point, I have to reassess whether the uh, bisphosphonate is uh, taking the... Very good. Whether body. you're giving the right dose, whether you're giving the right frequency, what else would you do? Uh, sir, I would like to consider whether the DEXA has been done in the same... Ah, yeah. Okay. So, other thing is also whether you're going for more aggressive forms of treatment like denosumab, etc. Okay. Let's come back to that. And this is the child. Yeah. You want to raise? Uh, yes, sir. 11-year-old child with uh, cerebral palsy. He remained indoor for many years with minimal ambulation. Uh, he had uh, two fractures, one in, the, uh, one in the humerus and another is in the radius. He had a sufficient vitamin D level, had uh, severe contractures on the lower limb and then orthopedic implant. Right. So what would you do? A, B or C? Would you uh, sedate? Would you do no DEXA or would you do, uh, would you give bisphosphonate? You would you wait for the third fracture? Uh, according to the guidelines, I would wait for the third fracture. He's a, he's a very strict person. He wants to stick to the guidelines. He says, no, let the child get another fracture and then only I will give bisphosphonate. Let's see what it says. Remember DEXA machines. We have three different DEXA machines that are available in our country. A, a, some are pencil beams, some are fan beams. Some of all of them are done from different technologies and every machine has its own advantage and disadvantage. But remember, the report done in one DEXA cannot be compared with the report done in another DEXA because the results are equipment and make specific. The same child, if you do a DEXA in one machine and another machine at the same day, you'll get two different set scores. That's how the 
the software is inbuilt, the normative data is different. Uh, the the uh, some uh, so all these are going to have an impact on the z score value so always remember normative data is different in different machines follow up should be done on the same machines and whenever there's a confounder like positioning difficult implant is difficult a, a practical approach has to be taken and has to be sorted so what would you what was your interpretation in this case uh, this case uh, probably the machine was different that's why the interpretation Very was good. so he was doing the right thing giving best phosphates but the test was done in a different and it has given probably if they repeat it in the same lunar gpx he may get the same report okay and for this what would you do uh, for this i'll not wait for the third fracture actually sir because he had an orthopedic implant Very also contracture so empirical diagnosis of osteoporosis should be done and you should start disposponate on this child. Very good, very good. So I think these are the uh, these are the six cases which I saw. What I want to these cases these are all hypothetical cases. But what do the cases teach us? They teach us number one that uh, fracture history and DEXA are important components of the puzzle. It's not that DEXA is the only picture. DEXA is one part of the jigsaw puzzle. That is number one. Number two, what else does it teach you? It also teaches you that. You have to always remember when you're seeing a child with short stature, when you're seeing a child with delayed puberty, you might land up with a mess and always you need to do some corrections. And lastly, what you remember is serial follow-up should be done in the same machine. So I think we have completed. I have nine FAQs. If you have time, otherwise, okay. I'm going to put the like a, a, like a question session and he's going to give the answer quickly. FAQ. Uh. Doing, doing a spine x-ray, will it help screening for osteoporosis? True or false? Uh, sir, false, sir. Very good. The x-ray has a very low sensitivity. By the time you wait for the x-ray changes to occur, already child may have some fractures. So many fa fallacies in DEXA. Can you suggest some other tool? Yes, sir. There is a pediatric QCT. Very good. Peripheral uh, quantitative tomography available in some centers. Lot of uh, advantages. It gives volumetric density and normative data has been published regarding that. But remember the radiation exposure, which people are very scared about. Is radiation exposure significant? Do you want to tell the mother? Uh, no, sir. This is not significant. Very good. The radiation exposure is much lower than even what the background radiation is there. So this is a very false notion. How frequently can one do a read exam? Sir, uh, around six months. Very good. Six months to one year. These are the guidelines. Why is head explode? Total body less head. Why not include the head also? Sir, uh, head has a less uh, chances of uh, fracture, number one. And number two, it is uh, less uh, contributing to the bone mineral density. Yes, very good. It will falsely alter the bone mineral density. Very good. Uh, uh, when, where would you diagnose osteoporosis without a DEXA? Uh, in cases already we have discussed, sir, uh, contracture implants. And, in, and infants, when you look at babies below one year of age, you have to be very careful that fracture history is sufficient. Should calcium supplements be stopped? I don't think so. Sir. No, but there are some case reports of some tablets giving some radio opaque uh, components, but it is, it is something which, uh, which is theoretical. Uh, okay, DEXA should not be done in infants, maybe two years of age because there is no normative data. True or false? True, sir. Yeah, probably true till some time back. But recently, there's an Indian study which has given the normative data on a good group of children with uh, uh, this one. And they are all vital and it's independent of vitamin D levels. So not that it should be routinely used, but this data is available. So probably for you to manually calculate. Uh, can I, ma I think this is the last question. I did a small survey. I don't know. Uh, I, I asked about 10 pediatric endocrinologists across the country. And you'll all be surprised to know more than 70% of them, including me, we don't have access to a pediatric software. Maybe probably the luxury of people working in very few tertiary care centers have the luxury of a pediatric software. We have to spend half an hour sitting and manually calculating this. Uh, so what would be your answer? Sir, true. Sir. True. Okay. So probably till you're in Kanpur, you'll say false. Once you're out, probably you have to say true. I, I've just made a small uh, video. I don't know whether it, uh, to, uh, where I have attempted to, man with this I'll just wind up. I, I don't know how to play this. It's, it's incorporated in this. It's showing, it's, it's running, it's running. So this is a DEXA of a nine-year-old child. Height is 127, weight is 20. He needs DEXA. Before doing the DEXA, I do a Tanner stage. I do the Z-score calculation. I put him in the machine. I get the two BMD Z-scores. 
somehow I get an access to a software and it says these are these Z scores. I'm taking it. I put it in the CHOP website. Children's Hospital of Philadelphia allows you to calculate Z scores based on the height. And that's the one. And this is the Indian data which I'm looking at. I open the study. I look at my make machine and I look at my area and I look at the LMS values. I manually sit and calculate the LMS and I do a height correction. Height correction equations are available. And I put, and this is the Z scores I'm getting after calculating manually. So it is uh, practically and theoretically possible to do a, to a calculation despite not having, and it largely matches with what is provided by the machine as well. So I think it, it just involves you to spend some time and uh, do a calculation of the uh, uh, Z score. So before winding up, I'll just uh, give the take home points. Remember the uh, DEXA is, is a part of a jigsaw puzzle. It is not the only picture which gives you the final uh, outcome. Remember, uh, osteoporosis is like a tip of the iceberg. Low trauma fractures and pathological fractures are the tip. But a lot of children with chronic problems also have low, or low bone mineral density, which we should not miss. Every part of the DEXA report is pivotal. Every alphabet, every word is important. Just don't look at Z scores. Look at the whole picture and then make an assessment of the child. Look at the mode, look at, is it the first, is it the follow-up, look at the SMA, look at the bone age, source of data, BMC, BMD, bone area, corresponding red score, what area you should focus on. And remember, a proper may, should preferably be done with the software, but not mandatory. You should use the ISED criteria to screen them. BMD less than minus two, diagnose osteoporosis with fracture. The, the, the DEXA scan not mandatory to make a diagnosis of uh, uh, osteoporosis. Machine specific, ethnic specific, age specific, sex specific normative data should be used to get a proper understanding of the child's bone mineral density. Always children with growth disorders, tall stature, short stature, early puberty, delayed puberty. Don't take it at the face value. There is always something hidden in between. I uh, end this with the small uh, request, probably the Growth Society is pay can initiate a multicentric study to generate normative data in normal, healthy Indian children who, uh, who are fed well and receive adequate sunlight. And probably you can amalgamate the IAP data also and uh, help us uh, to make uh, a very easier diagnosis of low bone mass in Indian children. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Dr. Hemchand, for this wonderful presentation. And uh, I think pediatric software is very, very important and we are really lucky that when Dr. Rishi and myself, we talked about getting a bone mineral density machine around 12 years ago, Dr. Kapoor, who is our uh, managing director, he uh, asked us whether we want a pediatric one. We said yes. So we are, we are one of the few centers who has got a pediatric software and that makes a difference definitely, uh, hopefully from there. Uh, I think if there are any closing remarks from the chairpersons. So such a clarity of concepts, sir. Really, I'm just flabbergasted by the way Himchan sir has presented this, and he has given such a clear view of a difficult topic, the interpretation of DEXA scan. So really, it was a wonderful talk. Dr. Arpita. Same here, sir. So many doubts got clarified. So one more question, sir. Are there any software available to correct for the bone age and the height age? Yeah, I think so. Uh, Software, I'm not this children's hospital of Philadelphia website. It gives you if you put the number area, it will give you so one Z score. It, but one thing is it 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 gives you based on the CDC height. So you it always thinks all our normal children are all uh, short, short for them. So that is one thing, but it gives a number. Probably you can use it for serial calculations, free for download, and it asks you the machine also sometimes. So I think in that way we are we are kind of uh, on safe zone. Thanks a lot. And I now request Dr. Suganda to come up and felicitate uh, Dr. Hemchan. Dr. Hemchan had a running uh, race from Chennai to airport and came here and immediately delivered the talk. Thank you, Dr. Hemchan. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I'll request uh, Dr. Dhwani to give uh, a felicitation to Dr. Uh, Vikrant and Dr. Vibha to Dr. Uh, Arpita for being the chairperson for this session.
So I like to now uh, ask Dhwani to start off with the inaugural uh, program and invite the dignitaries. Good evening, everybody. And it is a pleasure to have you all here. I would like to invite uh, first on stage, Dr. M. M. Methani. Dr. Methani is not here yet. Okay. Dr. Arun Chaurasia. Sir is already there. So Dr. Chaurasia is one of the senior most pediatricians of Kanpur and he's being uh, really an inspiration for us. Dr. Ahilya Ayavu, who is the president of Ispe Society. So Dr. Ahila is the president of Ispe and uh, she has come all the way from Coimbatore. So it's been a long day for her. Welcome Dr. Ahila. She has been here, I think, a couple of times she was here. Dr. Subruto De. Dr. Subruto is not there. Dr. Atul Kapoor. Sir, Dr. Kapoor is the managing director and uh, in charge of uh, Regency Hospital and has been really an inspiration for all of us. Dr. Rashmi Kapoor, ma'am, president of Grow Society. Dr. Rishi Shukla, sir, senior endocrinologist at Regency Healthcare. Dr. Anurag Bajpai, Dr. Yupika Bajpai, ma'am, and uh, Mrs. Rekha Sharma, ma'am. So I think uh, this has been a wonderful program that we have been having since the last three days, and it's been going on, and uh, we will now be going forward with regards to the overall program and how do we proceed from there. So before uh, we start, we would uh, definitely invite uh, the overall before the session, I'll just give a brief overview of what we have been doing and how things have been progressing. And then we'll have the launch of the session from that regards. So Uh, this is the fourth advanced pediatric endocrine symposium, which we are organizing. The first one in the form was actually started off in 2017. And since then, many of the faculty, all the guiders, everybody is the same. And we are continuing with the same team for a quite a long time. It's been really a pleasure in that regards. Now, when we had come initially, we were always thinking that pediatric endocrinology is a rare group of disorders which are complicated, which are cumbersome in terms of workup and very expensive treatment. So people used to, in a way, shrug away from pediatric endocrinology, don't want to go into this field and everybody was very scared, so to speak, about that. Now, when we thought about this, what we realized that there are three issues in any health problem, awareness, accessibility, and affordability. Now, everybody says these are not affordable, but we believe that awareness actually is the elephant in the house. And if we increase the awareness amongst the general public, amongst the physicians, we would be able to improvise the care. And this was the motto by which we established the pediatric endocrine uh, group. And then we started the growth society working in that direction. Now, if you look at the pediatric endocrinology burden in India and the specialists who are available, what we see is that we would probably have a handful, maybe 100 will be, the overall, maybe our overestimation also at the moment, but now with more fellows, the numbers will increase. So this is still is a very, very uh, small number for the burden of population for type 1 diabetes, growth hormone, thyroid, all those things. And pediatricians are approximately in much bigger number. So we need to really have a bridge in which things can improvise and connect between the two so that we can have a continual good quality care in everywhere. So currently, pediatric endocrinology is focused and centered in few cities. Some cities like Bangalore will have maybe 20 people who are there. But then some whole states will not have people who are trained at all. So we need to have more wider exposure. And that's why it's very important on part of everybody. And it's responsibility of us pediatric endocrinologists. And ISPE has been working a lot in that to really spread the message of pediatric endocrinology. We have been doing a lot of programs right from 2011. And you can see many of the same people have been involved and they have always been our inspirational force there. We started with our first program in 2011. And then since then, there have been hundreds of programs which were run in terms of workshops, in terms of advanced courses, practical courses across the country, which we have been conducting. Now, this basically is the third advanced pediatric endocrinology symposium. And from there, what we realize is that if we keep on doing workshops, how much time can we spend? Like it's not possible to do workshop everywhere. So we started off with social media in terms of YouTube platforms. 
and from there a large number of people actually were able to access and you don't need to be there all the time they can access that then we started an on site fellowship program and we have got chetan from the first batch neha from the second batch today who are there we till now had 11 fellows who are being under part of training then what we realized is that if you want to have a structured training we need to have a web based program so we started with a medi classes uh, platform which provides a lot of information started with books and then to practically use that knowledge mobile applications were developed so we have got a lot of e learning videos available on youtube with huge number of views this is something which is available covering entirety of pediatric endocrinology we have got structured learning program under our learning.growsociety.in we also offer a two year hybrid program for fellowship and a one year hybrid for diploma we had got a lot of people who come to us every six months for a week they learn the exam so it's a very intense process so we are going to have some of the announcements about the results of the fellowship program the first one we conduct a lot of online courses pretty much 3 to 4 every month so it's quite intense we have got number of publications which are there and what we are going to launch today is the second edition of our pediatric endocrinology protocols which is a completely updated book about latest protocols for pediatricians pediatric endocrinologists endocrinologists and we'll be releasing this today one major advantage we wanted to take was with regards to our application because that will provide much easy access to use because what you learn if you don't use it immediately you will forget and the errors will come in and these applications were developed and they are now become the most popular endocrinology application across the globe and we have done a lot of publications regarding the growth interpreter which allows practical interpretation of growth we have got the obesity interpreter which has been validated we have got puberty interpreter which allows interpretation of puberty for thyroid for dsd and all of them have been presented and they are in publication in different places in that regards now what we have done now is a very interesting thing which is actually a combination of all that we have done this is a bone age assisted interpretation of growth so all the pediatrician would have to do is to put some basic data it includes information like birth weight sitting height so all the rough things that we anyway write down and we measure we just write the tanner staging we match it we have the bone age interpretation and as soon as this is done it is using all the algorithms which are available and based upon this algorithm we will have lot of information data points will be available so you will have specific charts bone age interpretation lot of parameters and this will predict the likely diagnosis most likely investigation and we are validating this now so this will be a very valuable tool for screening pediatric endocrine disorders and hopefully so this is how the result will look like so you will have charts and you will have table which has got lot of interpretation and then we'll give you the final interpretation as to what is the likely diagnosis in that regards we are coming up also with a personalized intelligent emr which is going to basically decide based upon specific conditions give the inputs for every condition and once you choose those conditions you get the data you will get a output which will guide in terms of evaluation assessment so only those which are relevant will come up on that drop down menu and based upon that you will have a state of the art evidence based algorithm driven approach which will come and analysis will come this will provide information in the form of also a nutrition chart so a seven day meal plan will be there so this will also be useful for school in terms of other factors which are there in that regard so these phenomena are going to be quite helpful in that perspective we are also developing a diabody app which is basically going to help the children in terms of algorithmic dosage in terms of insulin basal bolus doses glucose tracking their exercise activity sleep and as i said based upon their height weight bmi veg non veg preference they will get the meal plan for 7 days regional data we have already developed and also reminders and also for obesity intervention we are developing this so we had got i recently we had this on site course in which we had got large number of people who had come from across the country and we had around 200 patients who were seen over the last 3 days and we had a very intense discussion which was there so this advanced pediatric endocrine symposium we are going to cover a lot of aspects of pediatric endocrinology we have already started since the morning and uh, we already had a session on the ambulatory uh, uh, care we had a session which was there basically with regards to the 
overall aspects of pediatric endocrinology, of diagnostics in pediatric endocrinology, of uh, also in terms of the advanced hybrid closed loop system. So I think uh, what we will uh, do now is that we'll carry forward with the other program. I would like to in, uh, invite the dignitaries on stage to please come forward for light, uh, lighting the lamp. So please take a seat. Uh, I will now request uh, Dr. Arendt or Asiya to kindly come up and say a few words.
Thank you, Dr. Anurag. I, on my behalf and behalf of the Growth Society, welcome you all in this fourth Advanced Pediatric Endocrinology Symposium. I hope you are enjoying academic feast here with the nice hospitality of famous hospitality of Kanpur. It's indeed a great privilege to host it at Kanpur with the gem of our society, Dr. Anurag and Regency Healthcare. On this Doctor's Day, I wish you all the best in future. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'll now request uh, Dr. Rishi to kindly come up and say a few words. Dr. Rishi is the Senior Pediatric Endocrinologist and Director of, of Endocrinology at uh, Regency Hospital. And uh, uh, he has been uh, with our team for the last 15 years and an inspirational situation. Thank you, Anurag. Uh, thank you for the invite. I think I witnessed everything. I witnessed the growth. I witnessed the good happening. And I think last year I took a DC and Dr. Kapoor asked me to start a DNB program. And I'm basically trained in endocrinology. Um, DM I did long back from PGI Chandigarh. So Dr. Kapoor asked me to, why don't you start a DNB program in endocrinology? So looking at myself and then I looked at Dr. Anurag and decided I'll quit the program of evolving endocrinology overall and I'll help him in whatever way I can. So I think this shows the way he moved forward. So with this, all the best to Dr. Anurag. Go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Rishi. I'll now invite Dr. Ahila Ayavu, who is the president of Indian Society for Pediatric and Adolescent Endocrinology. And Dr. Ahila and me go along. We have been involved in so many programs together, including ones in Coimbatore. We had the ISPE there, the PEP there. She has been here, I think, the second time in the APS program. So Dr. Ayla is really hardworking and working uh, a lot in pediatric endocrinology. She had done her training in Auckland. Along with that, she was with Dr. Agupati earlier and she had a lot of research on SGA and other aspects. So Dr. Ayla, please. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, congratulations and best wishes, Anurag. I'm always in awe of what you do and how you achieve things. I'm, I'm, I mean, I always wonder whether he gets time to sleep. Just check with his wife. And how do you find so much time to do so many things? I mean, I can't imagine doing it. And I'm in awe and I always wish you the best. And I think you've done a stupendous job. And as he said, the care has to grow across the country for every child who has a need. And I think he's filling a huge gap and improving the care of children in this country. Congratulations. And I'm always in awe of you and best wishes for everything that you want to do. Thank, okay. Thanks a lot, Dr. Ahil. I'll now invite Dr. Rashmi Kapoor, who is the Chief Pediatrician at uh, Regency Healthcare and is the uh, uh, President of Growth Society to kindly come and uh, say a few words of introduction. Thank you, Dr. Anurag. And uh, I welcome all of you. Uh, you must have had a wonderful session for last uh, from Wednesday, Thursdays and Friday because the uh, number of cases that Anurag has in his repertoire is beyond anyone's belief. You know, the cases that you used to read, they were rare kind of things and they are there. You see them and you feel, oh, it's this. So you really must have had a wonderful time. And as Dr. Ahilya said, we all are in awe with the Dr. Anurag because I don't know how he finds time to play badminton, how he finds play to uh, keep Yutika happy by talking to her, really, because when he does so much of work, we really uh, feel that he must be a superhuman. Congratulations to you, Anurag, and the Growth Society, and welcome all of you. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, I'd like to now welcome uh, Dr. Atul Kapoor, who has been an inspiration to all of us and has uh, been always encouraging us with regards to improving the care across this region and expanding the vision that he has in terms of uh, overall medicine and uh, in that regard, sir. Thank you. Good evening, friends. Welcome to Kanpur. I'm sure that we've taken good care of you in the last three, four days. So everybody is, has been talking about Anurag. What, what is left for me to say, actually, I was wondering. Well, 
we started way back in 1995 when Rishi joined us as the head of department of endocrinology. We are now nearly 30 years old, not 30, 28 years old. And uh, then Anurag came 15 years back. Since then, I've been seeing, you know, a great, you know, work being done by the department. And when I requested Rishi that we have a DNB program, the idea was that besides we have fellows, 11 to 12 fellows thus far, but probably uh, once they, we have the program, then uh, we can also provide them degrees. We currently run DNB programs in the hospital in about uh, seven subjects, I think, right? Pathology, pediatrics, uh, GI surgery, and uh, medical oncology, and uh, pulmonology, gynecology, what else is it? Radiology, right. <laughs> Anesthesia, right. So, so many, uh, we are running DNB programs in so many specialties. And I think this year, currently, we'll be adding two, three more. So, we have a huge faculty. We have about 150 doctors working in the hospital. We have about, uh, briefly, five hospitals in Kanpur. One in Lucknow. And uh, currently, three are, you know, in the process of being established, Gorapur, Varanasi, and another bigger one in Kanpur. So that's Regency Healthcare. I am uh, extremely thankful to Rishi and Raj for carrying this department forward and putting it on the national as well as the international map. And Raj is a great worker and uh, I've been watching his growth from time to time. I wish him all the best in life. You're doing great work. And we wish you do more in the next 10 years. Bye and thank you. Yeah. I'll now invite Dr. Yutika to come up and say a few words. Thank you, Dr. Anurag. And thank you, everybody, for being here. And um, uh, the last few, three days, I would say that you got the chance of experiencing the humidity of Kanpur. Sorry from our side that our AC was not working, but you were a great sport. And um, uh, besides this, we look forward to the, uh, you know, the remaining part of the conference. So welcome everybody to this conference. Thank you. So I'll request Dr. Rashmi and Dr. Katul to kindly come up and we'll hand over the certificate of training and Dr. Yutika kindly stay as well. So as discussed, we had a number of training programs going on. And uh, for that, we had the first batch of people who have completed two years of training along with four visits, which were there, which was conducted uh, in that regard, which were done. So I'll now be inviting uh, the ones who have successfully completed the training program. And it's really an honor to invite them because they are now are coming up in our fraternity and we like to spread the knowledge from that perspective. So we'll start off with the, the ones who have completed the two-year program with the on-site visits on four times and extensive uh, in, uh, evaluation for the fellowship in uh, medical classes fellowship in pediatric endocrinology. I'll invite first Dr. Vikas Mehrotra from Aligarh. Dr. Vikas is no uh, stranger to anybody. He is very well known and uh, everybody knows him and he's done a lot of work in terms of pediatric endocrinology and diabetes. So Dr. Vikas few words, Dr. Vikas. Thank you, Dr. Vajpayee. Uh, it's a uh, really uh, an honor and privilege to be part of this uh, platform. Uh, I still remember 2010 when I was Secretary Indian Academy of Pediatrics and Dr. Rashmi Ma'am came to Aligarh for PASS course. Have you remember? In the, in the evening, when I left her to the hotel, she asked me to call. When I called her, she said, uh, I've got, uh, you know, Anurag with me, 2010 or 2009. It started with the journey. And then uh, I met with Dr. Anurag with my three-year-old child and uh, uh, Shlok. And then his journey started. And I was a part of every program he had got. And uh, with all grace of uh, and blessings of Anurag Vajpayee, sir, sir is the right word, Dr. Rashmi, ma'am, and Atul, sir, the Shuloka has qualified NEET with flying color this year. <laughs> the counseling has started. 
so journey goes like this and i will continue my aim of optimum insulin replacement therapy for each and every child this is my aim i i keep on working for this today we have got around 240 kids with me we are providing them 24 hour helpline through kilkari foundation for type 1 we have got teaching classes for insulin pump therapy and all is free of cost so this mission should go on and every child should be given optimum insulin replacement therapy this should be the motive this is not the end i will be the part of every program which will be there in kanpur every training learning will keep on going and every part of india and every child of india should get optimum care thank you very much for thank you sir Uh, Dr. Vishnu Agarwal, who is an associate professor in SMS Jaipur, and Dr. Vishnu has also been involved with us for the last ten years. i want to say only one thing that anurag sir is the toughest paper setter in my knowledge <laughs> tips for uh, forthcoming batch to clear the exam with the dr anurag sir is that keep close eye on the genetic defects <laughs> and keep eye also on statistical analysis <laughs> thank you thank you dr vishnu Uh, Dr. Pragya Somani, who is from Bhilwada, and uh, she has been coming now for I think this is the fifth visit Dr. Pragya had done, and she has been very active in spreading pediatric endocrinology in that region. Dr. Pragya, please. it has been a privilege to learn from anurag sir and the way he teaches the way he uh, he invokes a desire to learn is really uh, unremarkable uh, we never when we joined the courses we never thought that we would <clears throat> undergo such rigorous training but it was it was a very good experience and uh, we would always be like to be under his guidance Dr. Pradeep, Dr. Pradeep is the associate professor in AIMS Patna. Dr. Pradeep is not there. Okay, so Dr. Kamlesh Agarwal. Dr. Kamlesh uh, is uh, assistant professor in SMS Jaipur, and he has been involved with us for the last two years as well. it was a great great uh, honor for us uh, to be uh, as a student of dr anurag bajpay sir as uh, we know that in our pediatric training we the pediatric endocrinology part is very much uh, uh, teaches us and after that in uh, before the training which we were it was very difficult for us but uh, after the training as uh, the way he teaches us uh, that the in the simplest way you can understand a difficult topic in very much uh, easy easy way thank you thank you dr kamlesh now we'll go forward on the diploma course we have got two people who finished the diploma course of one year with two on site visits we have got dr sibhi kumar or sibhi kr is from uh, kerala and uh, he is very active in terms of pediatric endocrinology so dr sibhi sir it's a great honor uh, for me uh, to be a student of uh, dr anurag sir uh, actually uh, when uh, the the uh, among pediatrics i think uh, the pediatric endocrinology is the uh, most complicated part in pediatrics but uh, after i am getting a chance for being a student of him it was uh, he was learn uh, i was I, i was able to learn in a simple way so great Thank, thank you thank you dr sibhi 
Dr. Yash Srivastava. Dr. Yash is Associate Professor at uh, Ames Rishikesh, and he is looking after pediatric endocrinology along with other specialities there. It's a great honor for me to receive this uh, certificate from uh, the medic classes. And Dr. Anurag sir is a great teacher and uh, he has made a difficult subject of endocrine so easy for us to understand. And uh, I really will try to uh, deliver this knowledge which I have gathered to my patients in the And uh, thanks Dr. Anurag sir. And Thank all you, Dr. Right. Now we had many people who came for the on-site visit. So we have got Dr. Musa Kuti. Dr. Musa Kuti is actually from Ireland. He is practicing there as a pediatric diabetologist. So he had a special interest in endocrinology. So he came to our center and earlier he visited also our center and now he's doing the program. So this was the on-site. Good to share experience, Dr. Musa. It's a great honor to be here with the growth team and with the Dr. Anurag as well. It's an immense pleasure that I got chance to get trained under him. Uh, actually, I, my plan was to get some in, acquaintance. But by involving uh, into this program, I get more and more insight and, and, and the motivation to learn, even at this age. So that's a great pleasure to be associated with him. Thank you very much. Uh, we have got next Dr. Anjali. Dr. Anjali is from... Uh... Cozy code. Dr. Anjali. I think Dr. Anjali is not there. Uh, we have got Dr. Rajib Das, who is from Bardhaman. He is in the medical college there as an assistant professor. So he's also been very keen in terms of learning uh, pediatric endocrinology. Good evening, everyone. I am delighted to be here to attend the program. It was a great program and I learned a lot. Thank you, sir. We have got Dr. Tania Tofel. Dr. Tania is from Bangladesh and she is currently doing PhD in endocrinology from there. She did training from UK as well. So she was very keen in terms of pediatric endocrinology. So she's come all the way from Dhaka. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm really mesmerized with the way that learning occurs here, even in online pl platform. I came to know via YouTube regarding SARS uh, venture about pediatric endocrinology. And every day I'm learning new things. And I want to learn one more thing from Sir, that is his time management skill. Thank you. Dr. Smriti. Dr. Smriti is from ESI. She's an assistant professor in the ESI Medical College in Delhi. Thank you, sir. I would like to thank sir and the whole team. And I would like to uh, compliment sir for his energy and making the class so interesting. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, we have got Dr. Saji Kumar. Dr. Saji Kumar is currently in Bahrain. He is originally from Kerala, but I think he, he is originally from Tamil Nadu, but he is currently in Bahrain practicing there. So he has also come long way from uh, for the course. Good evening, all. Uh, sir. Uh, very thank you for that cases, the volume of cases, very amazing to see each and every small cases. And uh, as uh, earlier mentioned, that uh, the energy from morning to evening speaking and uh, keeping us engaged and the fellows who are coordinating and other things, very well, thank you. We've got Dr. Padma Priya. Dr. Padma Priya is from Trichy in Tamil Nadu. She is the assistant professor in the medical college there. And uh, she was very keen to learn pediatric endocrinology and spread the message in that uh, part. Uh, we already Tamil Nadu a lot has a lot of pediatric endocrinologists, but probably in that region we need to be more. From that 
Yes, Dr. Parman. Good evening, all. I feel so blessed to be here as a student of Sir. Sir, all we are appreciating you for many things, but I wanted to ask you a secret. What is the reason behind the memory power you have, Sir? <laughs> I wonder how you remember all genes. But once we enter, once he called me by name, I was really stunned how you came to know even the name, college and everything. So blessed to have, uh, be a student of you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we will, <laughs> that's a secret. Uh, Dr. Vidhu Ashok. Dr. Vidhu is from uh, Calicut and she is uh, practicing there in, and also working in the medical college there. So Dr. Vidhu, please. This is my first on-site visit, so it was really nice to attend, to see the cases, and very happy to be associated with sir. Thank you. And Dr. Priyanka Srivastava. Dr. Priyanka Srivastava is from Bhopal. She is working as an assistant professor there in the medical college. Good evening all. This was my first on-site visit and I feel so blessed to be a part of this program and also be a part of SIRS, uh, to be a student of SIR because I got a major insight of the program once I attended the on-site one. I did not know that we'll be getting so many cases to and exposure to such nice program. So it was really nice. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Vinod, Dr. Vinod is from Ames Rishikesh. Please. Dr. Vinod. <laughs> Actually, I'm getting late, so I wish okay. you the certificate previously. This is there in the back. Certificate is already there. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm getting late, and my pen is there. <laughs> okay, no worries, no worries. <laughs> Anyways. Uh... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, hope you don't miss the train. Uh, so, it's a very, you know, uh, very good session we had over the last four years. We go through all the rare cases and the way of teaching is so good. I mean, most of the places we go through lots of conferences. So, in between during this session, you know, we have a sleep, lots of time, lots of time. But over the period of the last four days, I had a never a sleep like that. So, because of such an interesting session and all. So this is the first, you know, such a kind of uh, teaching session I had. So very wonderful learning I had. Thank, thank, you, thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Dr. Arpita Bhraguvanshi. Dr. Arpita is uh, Associate Professor at King George Medical University, Lucknow. And she is doing actually a research also on type 1 diabetes. Uh, and uh, so Dr. Arpita, you can say a few words. Good evening, all. Uh, it's an honor to be a student of Dr. Anurag Bajpesa. I would say he's a blessed teacher. And this is my third on-site visit. And every time I come here, I go wiser. And I'm infused with the, that positive energy he emits. So, yeah, it's an uh, it's a, always a pleasure. And I always look forward to these visits. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Nitya. Dr. Nitya is... Uh, Dr. Nitya, are you there? So, Dr. Pradeep is also come now. So, we'll. Okay. So, Dr. Pradeep uh, was not there. <laughs> okay, please come. So, Dr. Pradeep is uh, associate professor at uh, Ames Patna, and uh, he was part of the fellowship program, and he's been involved for a long time with us. Pradeep. Uh, good on, good evening all. Uh, this certificate means a lot to me. Uh, I am emotionally involved with this certificate. Uh, it started in 2019 and uh, I was associated with sir and we have done lots of things, many research age and uh, we have started courses at Ames Patna also. Maybe in couple of years, I'll be starting 
pediatric uh, endocrinology fellowship and this has happened because of sir only thank you sir dr nitya dr nitya uh, is from uh, uh, trishur in kerala and she has been very active in terms of interesting cases and presentations in pediatric endocrinology thank you sir so this is, a, this is my second on site with it as uh, ahila madam was telling actually sir is actually big, bridging a gap between uh, our interest in pediatric endocrinology to a systematic course like this so i was telling maybe because of uh, several reasons like we are not able to do it a fellowship course to come over from our home and then stay in a, a site for one one and a half years but this is actually almost equivalent to a good on site course sir lectures are amazing we all know and uh, there are so many things we have to learn from sir as uh, patmar sir said starting from his memory to everything the uh, the each uh, the most important thing what what i found is like his concepts are very very clear so, so uh, you wake him up from sleep in the middle of the night and ask him a, ask ask him a, a biochemical doubt no worry sir has answered the 1 2 3 4 that's it so <laughs> maybe we won't be able to reach that much but still i think uh, at least um, some part of it we may all be able to imbibe as uh, students thank you so much sir for this yeah. Yeah. dr alka dr alka jha is uh, endocrinologist at fortis uh, healthcare in delhi and she has been very keen uh, in pediatric endocrinology for the last two years coming to sir is always a aha moment for me thank you sir for nurturing my passion for pediatric endocrinology thank you dr vasanta sen gupta dr vasanta is uh, in a private medical college in kolkata and she joined a fellowship and uh, when we were talking we were discussing which is i think you retired uh, from uh, that so it's a real good passion that she wanted to learn more at this age and comes in the second visit thank you sir for actually i have got nothing else to tell everybody has talked so much but one thing i'll tell that i am really reliving my postgraduate days and enjoying to my heart's content <laughs> that's all <laughs> uh, dr abul hasan dr abul hasan is from chengalpet uh, medical college in chennai and he joined recently in our program so this is his first visit dr abul ji good evening everybody after finishing my md i thought that's all don't do not interested to do, do any courses that's enough but my friend padma priya my ug met she joined in the course after one month she will be calling weekly once did you join the course did you join the course that she will be calling me so uh, uh, let's see let's see i will say after some time she told to ask asked me to do uh, see the videos pre videos of sir that too i saw, saw the first growth chapter uh, that time i was really confused oh, no no i can't do that huh? but she forced me again join the course after joining the course after finishing this uh, going uh, finishing this on site visit i have developed some confident i think i think i have developed in future i think uh, i may become a uh, okay endocrinologist i think thank you very much sir thank you dr abul uh, dr tanmay verma dr tanmay verma is from jaipur and uh, he has just finished his senior residency from sms and working in a private uh, medical college hello everyone uh, this is for the first time i visited for the on site course and for this advanced pediatric symposium i remember uh, 11 or 12 months ago i met sir for the first time in regency when naran was his fellowship candidate and and the at that time i realized that pediatric endocrinology is having this level of uh, work and this regency has already achieved this kind of work experience and patient exposure and since in last 4 days when i am with, with sir in, including all the lectures and pedi- practical aspects 
I can surely say after two years, I'll become a good pediatric endocrinologist under cells guidance. Thank you. Dr. Ruchi Mishra. Dr. Ruchi is from is assistant associate professor in uh, ESI uh, Delhi. And we actually did a program long time ago in ESI that was 10 years ago. That was our practical pediatric endocrine course. I think everybody said a lot, but uh, this is my first time that I've come here. And like uh, Madam said, there are a lot of cases that you read about and here I could see a lot of them. We may not be able to accomplish so much academically, but if we could uh, inculcate a little bit of passion and zeal that you have, I think that would be a compliment for us. And uh, sir, I would like to compliment your team also. And one more thing, like Dr. Vishnu said, you are a hard uh, exam setter. I was wondering when we have to set exam, it is so difficult to sort out those questions. So many of them we copy from the previous papers. And you managed to make not four, five uh, options for an MCQ, commendable, <laughs> I think. So kudos to you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Doctor. Just, uh, like to tell you that uh, for our DNB students, I always give Anurag the statistics part. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Mamta Lalwani. Dr. Mamta is uh, from Raipur. She is working in Ekta Hospital as well as the uh, Raipur Institute of Medical Sciences. Uh, so she has just joined recently the course. Uh, good evening, all. Uh, this is my first on-site visit. I'm really, really glad that I have joined this course and your team is awesome, sir. And your way of teaching is too awesome, sir. Looking okay. forward to learn more from, from you. Thank, thank, thank you, you sir. Uh, Dr. Suraj Gohen. Dr. Suraj is from uh, Guwahati. So uh, he joined recently. He's a pediatrician there, but he had a keen interest in pediatric endocrinology, Dr. Suraj. Good evening. Uh, I am privileged to be here. I have seen so many cases in a very short span of time. I would like to thank Grow Society and Anurag sir and the whole team. Thank you. Dr. Bharani Anand. Dr. Anand. Dr. Anand is from UK. He is doing pediatric endocrinology there. I think he's not here at the moment. Uh, Dr. Swati Pandey. Dr. Swati Pandey, she is doing our course from, she's from Bangalore and uh, she has joined our course recently. Thank you so much, sir. I never thought the endocrine is so much of vast and uh, so many things are there to learn because it is one of the most unexposed area during the residency. Because of you, I have seen so much. Now I actually developed interest in this field and I want to pursue ahead. Thank you so much. Dr. Princey Joseph. Dr. Princey. Is Dr. Princey not there? Okay. Uh, Dr. Nitin Pandey. Dr. Nitin Pandey is from Lucknow and he is one of the most uh, interested and involved guy in basic uh, endocrinology and physiology. So he'll have all the insights of physiology with him. In 2012, when I was doing my PG in Lucknow, AGMC, uh, I joined Sir's course uh, in Little Safe Hotel in Kanpur. So at that time, everything went over my head. <laughs> then after completing my PGs, I started practicing. And in general practice, if you do practice dedicatedly, you'll get a lot of patient. So I didn't got any time to read. But after listening to sir's video from YouTube, I got a I got lot of interest in endocrinology. So I joined sir's course now. I'm, I'm enjoying a lot this course. Thank you. Dr. Bifina Bega. Dr. Bifina is uh, uh, from, uh, she's uh, from Ernakulam. And she is, this is her second visit. Uh,
and this is my second on site visit and uh, after each visit i know i am improving a lot uh, thanks to sir's meticulous eighth detailed way of teaching and uh, during the course during the three days we see about 200 cases especially the rare cases in pediatric endocrinology thank you sir thank you dr prithna dr prince is here i think dr prince is from kottayam kerala so thank you sir for giving me the opportunity to interact with all these patients and the big crowd actually thank you for um, all the uh, nice things and all uh, and also to um, i want actually to uh, say my gratitude to see uh, see all our doubts being well cleared it's a very op uh, wonderful opportunity for that to clear or all our doubts even the simple doubts will be cleared in a very good way thank you sir thank you the big thing dr shivam shukla who is from fatehpur and he has done our basic course so i'll invite him as well so dr shivam good evening to all of you and uh, i am extremely privileged for having anurag sir as my mentor and i will uh, remain uh, ever ever uh, indebted to him because he is guiding me under him and uh, surely uh, sooner or later i will be a better pediatrician under him yeah thanks sir thank dr rashmi and dr uh... so uh, thanks uh, uh, all of you for this wonderful uh, program at the end i'd like to thank uh, the entire uh, team which was responsible for this program to happen and uh, first of all i'd like to thank uh, dr rishi dr uh, atul kapoor dr rashmi kapoor dr yutika dr chaurasia who has been always part of grow society and encouraging us with doing all the work our fellows dr vibha dr uh, alapan and dr dhwani have been really working hard for the last so many days please come up and they have been really working hard with all these things all these days i think three big round of applause for them then we have got uh, nikhil haryom aditya and prashant who have also been working hard so all the patient that you get they will have to call at least 10 times and they will have to call at least double the number of patients to get them in so it was a huge work so nikhil come quickly so all of them have been really involved in that regards all the staff of uh, regency city clinic was really involved in that and they did a wonderful job ravi ji is not there and uh, so it was like a whole maintenance work was done wonderfully all the people who are involved from the pharma part everybody we like to thank them for making this possible it was a wonderful effort we have got our own team who come from fatehpur every time ravidat ji is there durgesh ji is there and then the whole team rishi ji umesh ji they are all involved intrinsically in this regard so i like to thank everybody and all the faculty that is very very important they have come from different parts of the country we got dr ahila who has come from coimbatore dr sobrato who is from kolkata himchand came running from chennai and then we had got dr sugandha from uh, muradabad we had got uh, dr vijay dr vikrant uh, who has come and then our trio of fellows dr chetan dr riddhi and uh, dr manoj all three of them have come and most importantly all of you it is very very important to thank all of you for being here because that's what makes us inspire us to do more work on that so i like to thank all of you and now i'll request dr vibha and dr dhwani to kindly facilitate the the honored guests who are here so so dr atul kapoor good dr rashmi kapoor dr rishi
डॉक्टर अहिला डॉक्टर चौरसिया डॉक्टर युतिका एंड मिसेस रेखा शर्मा so this has been a wonderful inauguration program and thanks all of you we will now continue with our next part of session so dhwani you can carry forward from here uh, before we move forward i would like uh, you all to stand up for a national anthem national anthem अशुभ आशीष मारे before we wind up i am really glad to announce that dr subrato has come finally i think he had taken a detour to have cuisines of lucknow <laughs> to indulge in them so dr subrato can you please come up and say a couple of words of uh, encouragement so dr subrato is the preeminent uh, endocrinologist in the east of india and uh, he has always been an inspiration and been part of all our programs yes dr subrato namaskar well uh, what can i say every version of anurag it was 1.2 and now where is it 10.0 it rolls on and uh, the quality keeps rising and the most important thing is he has managed uh, to attract a lot of young minds who are interested in pediatric endocrinology produce the conduits and uh, he's had the support from his uh, seniors his colleagues his wife to name a few but most importantly his students and so without taking any more time uh, yes the detour was worth it because i had a dashing driver he said koi nahi lucknow the hamare wo back side mein hai chaliye but wahan se hum log jab nikle tab hume wo we got the wrath of the rain god or beach may we were traveling at the rate of 5 miles an hour so koi nahi whatever ends i mean whatever ends well ends well and i'm on time for the next session and uh, you have kept marvelously on time so once again a big hand for this great effort which year after year anurag uh, like a magnet draws us here thank you thanks dr subrata so i think we will uh, thank all the uh, dignitaries for their uh, valuable time that they took and come here and dr dhwani you can now carry forward with the second part of this program moving on we have an interesting session on glucose disorders uh, for the next session i would like to call on guys dr shivendra verma who is an endocrinologist at gsvm uh, college nagpur uh, kanpur Dr. Vikas Marotra was a senior pediatrician at Kilkari Hospital, Aligarh. Dr. Pradeep Sir, associate professor uh, at AIMS, Patna. Can you please have you on the dais, please? Dr. Shivendra Verma, Dr. Vikas Marotra, and Dr. Pradeep Sir.
For the first talk, I would like. So this is a session now on glucose in 2023, and uh, we will have the first part. So we will be inviting uh, Dr. Ahila. Uh, is there, Dr. Ahila? Yeah, yeah. Please, please. So. Uh, we will invite, this is a session on glucose. We will have a lot of new talks about developments and then we will have a grand round at the end. So Dr. Ayla will be talking about newer insulins and meanwhile, we'll request Dr. Pradeep to uh, start off the session. And Dr. Vikas, kindly come up for the uh, program. He's busy, I think. Okay, so good evening all. Uh, the glucose part is basically the heart of pediatric endocrinology. We see lots of diabetes patients. We have lots of doubts. And uh, next, I think one and a half hour. There are lots of sessions. Our doubts will be cleared. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's good to see Subrato also. Anyway, thank you so much for being here. And uh, Dr. Anurag told me that all of you already have a background in uh, all your regular insulins and how you use insulin in treatment. Um, can I ask for a show of hands, how many of you use split mix regime where you use NPH and regular as twice daily dosing? How many of you use in your patients? Not one. How many of you use a basal bolus regimen with a regular insulin and a glargine? And how many of you use a long acting, extra long acting uh, insulin like Traceba with a faster acting aspart? One or two, three, yeah, four. So I think, uh, so Anurag was very specific that uh, the regular part would all be there. So I thought, uh, three. So all of us have been... Uh, using different kinds of insulin. And Dr. Rishi was saying how frequently you check blood sugars. Out of the pay, uh, uh, doctors here, for those who deal with pay, children with diabetes, how frequently do you get your patients to check blood sugars? Dr. Pradeep, how frequently do your blood patients check blood sugars? Ma'am, that depends actually uh, on resources. But I, I usually persuade them to at least six times. Or how? How many days in a month? Uh, maybe daily. Okay. So, and anybody else has any other opinion? Because the most integral part of management... Oh, thank you. Sir. This one. The main uh, part and the integral part of management of diabetes will be blood sugar checks and tailoring doses. Nobody can wear the same dress. I cannot wear a dress which would fit Dr. Vikas and that would not fit Dr. Pradeep or Anurag. So, each of us have a different way and different sizes, the same holds good for insulin. So it has to be tailored to that child and it cannot be a generalized statement where you say you take three units today, two units tomorrow, and then for the dinner, you take five units. It cannot be like that. Your food varies and the amount of variety of food in India is available abroad. There you have limited food and all food uh, will, be, will show up how much of carbohydrate you have and it is easy to tailor doses there. But it's quite tough here. So in that sense, I thought I will talk first about split mix regime. For a long time, we were doing split mix regime where we were mixing NPH and regular twice daily. But you can never get a good control. And for the concept of Subrata, which he's deeply interested in, is glucose in range, which can never be achieved with the split mix regime. You have to have at least 70 to 80 percent of your blood sugars in range to get the best long-term outcomes you are aiming for. So this was our previous regime. 
So I just drew it out by hand. So we used to do regular and NPH twice daily. But then you used to have a lunch which was very short on carbs or very little. So the practice was a bit rigid and very tough for families to follow and children hated it. The next one is we use a glargine as a basil. And then we give regular for breakfast, lunch and dinner. We follow this for smaller children who like to have a smaller snack in the mid-morning, mid-afternoon and late in the evening. So our uh, night dinner is usually a bit early so that you finish off your regular by the time you go to sleep so that you don't get a low. For older children, we go to a different uh, methodology. So we now go to our first case. It's a three-year-old boy who's had type 1 diabetes for the last 18 months and they are unable to plan their meals. The mother had decided to give one dosa and egg masala with half a cup of milk. And he usually needs two units of Humalog. She gave the insulin and he just shut his mouth and said, refused to open his mouth. The mom is frantic. She says, he's going to have a low, what will I do now? And what, what else could I have done? Or is there anything else I can think of to improve this? And can I get out of the stress again? So what can we do? Wouldn't it be great if you could have an insulin which could be administered after a meal? So the objectives of developing a new mealtime insulin was to improve the postprandial blood glucose, to have a flexible mealtime dosing and to improve the profile when you use a pump. The targeted action profile for future mealtime insulin was more rapid abs absorption after insulin and faster onset of action and greater potential for early glucose lowering. lowering. So whenever you have a carb meal, particularly most of our carbs are finely refined. It has a huge fast up, up stick and then it starts dropping slowly. Only for complex carbs, you have a slow rise and a slow fall, which is not something children like. They are more addicted to faster and uh, more tastier food, which is usually highly polished carbs. So we look at the insulins. So this is the insulin you get from the normal pancreas. So the insulin comes from uh, the sugar that is sensed from the portal circulation. So you absorb the food in the portal circulation and the uh, pancreas responds to it. So this is from the normal pancreas. This is a regular human insulin. So you are unable to cover the sharp uptick. Then you have the rapid acting insulin, but still it's action a little bit later compared to your regular insulin, which you would take. And then the ultra fast acting. Even now we are still unable to match nature. We are still a little bit away from matching nature. So this was the idea behind starting ultra fast acting uh, insulin. So BioChaperon Lispro is on the way and LumeJev is the new uh, ultra fast acting uh, Lispro, which is coming up from uh, the uh, Lispro manufacturers. We have Treprostinil Lispro. Again, it's a local vasodilator and citrate increases the vascular permeability. So it causes a quick onset of action. And then we have the fast acting insulin as part. It has niacinamide, which or modifies the absorption and arginine, which increases the stability. So you look at this, this is the faster as part, which is a new formulation. Niacinamide is a vitamin B3 and L-arginine is added for stability. And these are naturally occurring substances. So you don't have side effects because of the use of the faster acting as part. Compared with insulin as part, what does faster as part do? Twice as fast onset of appearance in the bloodstream. So if you look at the onset of action, it is faster. It comes on earlier. And you remember, you have a huge uptick when you take the carb and it is trying to match that. But actually always take everything with a pinch of salt or a grain of salt. In practice, we are not seeing the same effect for every child a similar way. If you look at ASPART, you can actually predict what the action would be, the duration of action, the onset of action. But ASPART, faster acting ASPART works beautifully in some patients. For some, it doesn't work well at all. But if you look at the basic pharmacology, pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics, the prediction is that it will work really as almost as near as possible to a natural insulin. Two-fold higher insulin exposure within the first 30 minutes because your uptick is faster in the first 30 minutes with your carb meal. So they, it uh, tries to match the insulin, um, the glucose and tries to keep it under control. So faster acting insulin helps to overcome the limitations. Regular insulin should be administered 30 to 45 minutes before your meals. 
aspart glulosine and lispro should be administered about 15 at least 15 minutes before the start of a meal faster aspart may be administered up to 2 minutes before the start of a meal or are when necessary up to 20 minutes after a meal without compromising a1c control and hypoglycemia risk remember that 20 minutes if you give faster acting aspart after 20 minutes you messed up the whole thing you will have huge amounts of hypoglycemia you cannot predict the duration of action you cannot predict the way the child is going to handle if it is 30 minutes past the meal take it with a pinch of salt whether you give aspart or faster acting aspart you are looking at hypoglycemia you have to monitor much more closely so only before only from 20 minutes after a meal that's the only range up to which you can give a pias but again remember it is even then it is better to give it before a meal if it is possible only for children who cannot or for whom you cannot predict whether they will take a meal or how much of carbs will go it is okay to give after a meal or on special situations like a function they're going for a marriage they're taking going to take a lot of sweets or something like that then it is okay to give after the meal so these are studies which have looked at faster acting aspart and they've looked at the first one the top line is the faster aspart and the younger one so it is non inferior to the regular aspart the only advantage is it's the onset of action is a definitely faster and the earlier peak you get and tries to overcome the earlier peak in, uh, car, in i mean glucose after taking a carb meal so you have a left sided left sided shift in the onset of action doubling so the initial action is faster than earlier 2.5 fold increase in the initial glucose lowering effect within 30 minutes of subcutaneous injection earlier offset of exposure and effect faster as part more closely resemble the meal time insulin secretion in healthy in individuals giving faster as part the potential to further improve postprandial glucose control change from baseline in one hour postprandial glucose increment is in favor of faster as part versus nova rapid okay these are all data but in practice when you give yes remember you have to check the blood sugars frequently and as dr pradeep said it's always before and 2 to 3 hours after a meal look at how well it is monitored I mean how well they responded if you have the luxury of using a cgms it cannot be counted i mean it cannot be better than that because that will also tell you the trend in which it went remember your libre is not a continuous glucose monitoring system it is a uh, it is an intermittently measured blood glucose your continuous glucose monitoring systems are dexcom and only guardian connect so you cannot consider libre as a cgms it is actually an intermittently measured blood sugar uh, monitoring system so please it's actually trying to predict based on 15 minute or 10 minute measurements and it tries to predict what is happening between those measurements so it is not actually a cgms it is an agms so if you want to see the perfect effect and the perfect curve and see how it responds it has to be either a dexcom or a uh, or it should be guardian connect so this is the meal time flexibility um, is, is there an arrow in this Okay, yeah, yeah, I'll do it with this thing. Okay, then that's fine. So you look at the. I'm sorry. Uh, if you look at look at all the three points, that blue one, the dark blue one is the faster aspart, which is given before the meal. The second one, the lighter blue, is given faster aspart after the meal, and the third one is the nova rapid, which was given before meal. if you look at it if you give a faster acting aspart after the meal it is still inferior to your nova rapid aspart has to be given before meal to get the best effect but in children where it is not possible or in special situations you can give it after a meal so don't make it a habit but when you need it and in certain special situations you can go though they say it is non inferior but it is not superior or better lium jev is the next insulin lispro aabc injection which has been approved by the fda for faster acting lispro and this actually appears in the circulation within a minute so lium jev demonstrated superior reduction in blood glucose spikes at both 1 hour and 2 hours after a test meal compared to humalog 
time action profile, it ap appears in the bloodstream within a minute. It enhances insulin microvascular absorption and diffusion. So over a period of time, we had NPH. Then we had our uh, recombinant insulin. Then you had the first long-acting insulin, the glargine. Then the detimide. And the last, now you have the glargine 300 and the deglutec. So these are the longer-acting insulin. And what is the last insulin added last week? If any of you have been reading any JM would have seen. So I could has come. It's once weekly insulin for type 2 diabetes. We, I'm not sure whether it's going to come for pediatrics because your hypos also is going to be for a week long if you give Vicodec and then try to manage type 1 diabetes. So glargine 100 units per ml and detimir. So glargine is A21 asparagine in insulin is replaced by glycine and it is added to B30. So anyway, it is an acidic pH. Whenever you give glargine, have you ever asked your patients what is the complaint? It gives a stinging sensation and some children hate it. That is why I always ask families to give glargine in the gluteal region. The burning sensation is a little bit less. So it is in an acidic pH. It works. Actually, they say it works for about 24 to 26 hours in practical situations. Again, in real time life, we see it working well for about 18 to 24 hours. That is why I personally prefer giving glargine in the night. But again, remember, you might have a small spike and then it will start dropping. So you have to worry about hypoglycemia also. Detimir, it is better to give twice daily, though they say the duration of action is for long. It is still better to give detimir twice daily. They say the uh, spectrum of action and the control of blood glucose basically is much better when given twice daily than once. Next one, a 15-year-old boy, type 1 diabetes for the last 8 years, takes glargine 23 units at 8 to 10 p.m. Morning sugars are not stable, shifts glargine to the evening. For some people, because of the small peak, they can have a low at about 2 o'clock or something and they can have a rebound high in the morning. So some of them shift the glargine to the morning because anyway, in deep sleep, you might not have too much of activity or food intake. So it works better. But I haven't seen glargine work very well for morning doses because they start having early morning high because of your counter-regulatory hormones. So morning sugars continue to be variable. What are the possible alternatives? So glargine 300, it is the same glargine, but much more concentrated. 1.5 ml has 450 units. So that's 1 ml has 300 units. So it alters the pharmacokinetic profile. It occupies a tighter space. So it's not able to release faster. So it releases slowly. And that is how the same glargine, when it is concentrated, works slowly. So it delivers the same dosage of insulin as glargine 100, but at one third of the volume, this reduces the surface area and ultimately results in a slower and gradual release of monomers of glargine 300 as compared with 100. So this is a pictorial depiction. Small volume more compact and more gradual and slow release. 100 units, it releases faster and that's why the duration of action is a bit different. So if you look at Tugio and Lantus, the duration of action of Tugio is 36 hours is what is uh, said by uh, the uh, pro produ production uh, unit of uh, Lan uh, Tugio, but actually it works for about 30 hours. That's when it starts dropping down. Lantus works for about 18 to 24 hours. But the curve is a much more flatter curve. You don't get the slight rise and you can avoid the hypoglycemia, which can happen with glargine. So onset of action of glargine 300 is about 6 hours, whereas for glargine 100, it's about 3 to 4 hours. Steady state concentration is 3 to 4 days. Elimination half-life is 19 hours. Duration of action is 30 hours. And patients actually require 10% more glargine to achieve similar HbA1c to glargine 100. It actually reduces all day or nocturnal hypoglycemia and there's no change in weight gain. Can I ask somebody to say what does steady state concentration in three to four days mean for the patient? Um, thank you. Excellent. So that is what we want. You cannot keep on changing your ultra long acting insulins like Degladec or um, Tugio every day. It achieves a steady state after three days. So when you give that first dose, there is a little bit remaining at 24 hours. You're giving the next dose, it adds on to it. 
then you give the next dose it adds on to it so it takes about 4 days to achieve an equilibrium so you cannot keep changing the dose every day you have to wait for a minimum of 3 to 4 days to see what it causes i mean what effect it causes and then you should consider changing the dose that is why it's important to remember the steady state concentration is 3 to 4 days for 2gio deglutec is a new ultra long insulin analog removal of threonine in the position 30 of the beta chain and the attachment via my glute i'll show it as a pictorial representation later after changing from the pharmaceutical formulation to the subcutaneous inter- environment it precipitates in the subcutaneous tissue forms a depot that slowly undergoes a highly predictable dissociation once daily dose of deglutec has almost no peak even 2g also doesn't have much of a peak uh, tracebo is even better there is almost no peak the trough ratio is almost similar and there is very little intra individual variability and plasmatic concentrations are less critically dependent on upon the time of injection so what is the advantage to the patient they can take at 8 o'clock in the morning today it is okay to take at 10 the next day between 8 and 10 up to 2 to 4 hours variation is fine because it works for almost 42 hours so this is the insulin deglutec so you take off the 3 or 9 and you add a side chain so it takes and it works for a long duration so that is how it keeps working so it, if you want to use an insulin for the treatment of diabetic ketoacidosis as an iv formulation what is the insulin you would all prefer regular anybody else analog so what is the difference between using an analog and a regular insulin as an iv preparation both are the same because it is actually the dissociation rate in the subcutaneous tissue which determines the duration of action and not what is there so whatever insulin you use as an intravenous preparation it works the same it lasts for only 2 minutes in the circulation that is when when you give intravenous insulin infusion in diabetic ketoacidosis you should give your subcutaneous insulin at different points of time if you give analogs you have to give at least 15 to 30 minutes before you switch off iv 2 hours before switching off you should give regular insulin before switching off so there are that is because the iv insulin lasts for only 2 minutes so the dissociation rate is what determines the duration and onset of action so it's injected in a dihexamer formation rapid phenol depletion after injection results in multiple hexamer and the zinc there is zinc there which will actually slowly allow it to release gradually and that is why you get a steady state and it gradually releases the monomers so onset of action is about 2 hours i'm sorry for uh, this is for tracebo steady state concentration is in 2 to 3 days elimination half life is 25 hours and duration of action is 42 hours again we continue to use once daily tracebo we are not using once in 36 hours because there is a gradual fall off and you look at the steady state concentration and that is why we actually continue to give it at the same time for uh, 2g for sure at least for tracebo you can have a 2 to 4 hour variation between doses the previous day and the next day nocturnal and all day hypoglycemia similar to glargin there was no extra advantage in this so deglutec you look at the flat curve almost a flat curve and only after 36 hours there is a slight variation that is why though they say it works for 42 hours it actually works maximally for 36 hours so how can you shift from glargin to deglutec take two thirds of the regular dose of glargin for tracebo wait for 3 days to achieve equilibrium before stepping up the dose can have a variability for a couple of hours for the dosing schedule of deglutec much better and flatter profile no stinging sensation but expensive you may waste insulin if tried in younger children this is only insulin which the company itself claims it is stable for about 56 days for the others you are supposed to change every 30 days but since it continues to work and reduces the blood sugar we use it for 40 45 days if the blood sugar continues to become better so insulin icodec is a basal insulin analog administered once weekly among people with insulin naive type 2 diabetes once weekly icodec demonstrated superior hb a1c reduction to once daily deglutec after 26 weeks of treatment 
with no difference in weight change and hypoglycemic events of less than one event per patient year exposure in both groups. So this is ICODEC and this was the recent paper which came out both in JAMA and NEJ. Thank you so much. Uh, for nasal insulin, Afresa, I think oh, quite a few of you might remember Afresa being introduced in 2006. And it was taught because of the variability of absorption during um, infection, respiratory infections. You needed 10 times the regular dose and you were worried about the paracrine effects, risk for malignancy in later life. Now they are working on newer inhaled insulins in uh, hardware, they said. Not sure when it is going to Nasal insulin will always have a lot of issues because anyway, basal you will need separately and uh, bolus will be there. So I think Icodec is something which is there, which may be quite good. If they have a very stable profile, maybe hypoglycemia risk will be lower. So let's say it will take some time, but probably it will come down on that. Or maybe we will not give it weekly. We will give it something like uh, uh, when we started off with Reciba, we said that maybe we give it after every two days, three days, then it is giving daily. Something like that mm. it may be done. So I think, uh, yes, Dr. Rishi. This insulin is very good. Nicotec, the advantage, if you see, all of you will be treating type 2 diabetic children also. 16, 17, 18, 19. So, the combination of this and GLP-1 receptor agonist, the two-in-one injection you've taken and the child is free for a, for a week. So, this would, I believe, uh, would be a very interesting thing to observe. Yeah, GLP-1 unlock actually, uh, the trial is on in the uh, Europe uh, for. Uh... So, yeah, so I'll be discussing a bit about in type 2 definitely. In type 1, it's only some studies, mainly weight loss. These are all sidekicks, I would say. So, if you don't have insulin, you have to anyway give GLP 1 receptor and it will reduce your weight a bit. But ultimately, only the insulin dose will come out. So, it is, I don't think adding another injection may be a good idea for type 1, probably at the moment. For type 2, definitely, we'll be discussing about the role, which is very, very much there. Do we cast? Thank you, ma'am, for such a nice deliberation and enriching our knowledge. I would like to make some humble submissions. Uh, first of all, regarding, as you said, uh, regarding the use of ultra uh, short acting insulin, you are very rightly said you cannot rely upon Libre. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, it is the most commonly used one, but it's failed to give you sugars, when, especially when sugars are rising or falling. When you need the CGMS maximum, it fails. So Dexcom is, is the answer, but it's, it's not available and it's very costly. First, so take, you have to regularly, very, you know, keep on checking your blood sugar by SMBG to make legal decision. Secondly, I label deglutate. My experience is with Tresiva is, I say it's a poor man's pump. Because you, everybody will be agree with this, that basal insulin dosing proper is the foundation of a successful type one management. So if you are able to find, achieve a good basal rate, you are you have the battle will done and dilutate by far the best insulin I have ever used. But 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 the capping is when you start dilutate, give four to five days rather, not two three days to stabilize and don't do not change the dose. And These sometimes the, yeah, they talk about a loading dose as well. So what is your opinion on that? That you give maybe after twelve hours. Like some people use for GNRI analog also six weeks and that. So loading dose is also a concept that maybe you build it up. But that's not proven, but there's some studies which have shown that it may be. A... I would rather give uh, more uh, short acting insulin for a shorter duration till they get uh, achieve equilibrium mm -hmm. and then step down on my shorter insulin rather than uh, giving a loading dose. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Pati. We'll take a last question from Dr. Ruchi, I think. Is there. Ma'am, I had a question. Uh, what are the patients that uh, I, in which we can use Treseba instead of Glargine? I because we have, like I work in a setup set, uh, set where Glargine is readily available to the government supply. So what are the candidates? I would, if I ask for recommendations for Degludec, I have to have a stronger. Um, so first, if it is funded by somebody, then it is different. If the patient can afford, it's definitely much better basal insulin than Glargine any day. The peak, the fall, the flat curve and all is beautiful with Reciba. And for children who are older, particularly after age standard, like 13, 14 years of age, who are teenagers, who play sports, who, do, who like their meal times to be different. They don't like fixed, rigid, rigid meals. Except for breakfast, which I tell them, you have to be specific to be early to avoid the counter-regulatory hormone effects. The other meals can be as per your preference and you don't have that 
midnight high and low with the uh, receiver. It's a totally flat curve and it's beautiful actually. For patients who can afford, I think it's the so best what, option. No, ma'am, not affordability. So what can I uh, advocate as an indication uh, for for patient point of view? Teenager, uh, you know. Only for, teenagers? No, no. For whenever you have difficulty in getting your morning blood sugar under control. Okay. You use glargine, you checked your blood sugars at 2 a.m., you yes, checked sir. at 12 a.m., 4 a.m., still your 7 a.m. blood sugars are high, you are unable to bring it under control, even for the best of children, then I think you have to shift to deep low tech. Thank you so much, ma'am. I just have two comments regarding FIAS. Uh, it's becoming very, very fashionable to use FIAS. But I think very important to remember that it starts early, uh, reaches a peak quickly, and disappears from the system early. So when we have these children who go back to school and then they leave at 7 o'clock in the morning and they come back at 2.30, one dose of FIAS before breakfast, especially if they have no facilities in the school to give another injection with, say, the snack or a mini lunch, usually they come back with very, very high blood sugars. And that is what has been a rate-limiting step for me in using FIAS in school-going children. And somehow I still feel regular insulin is still the uh, gold standard, but you know, I would like to have your opinion. The second situation where FIAS was invaluable was just a few months ago, maybe six weeks ago, a baby who was about eight months with severe DK was at coming. When we were transitioning, we didn't know how much insulin to give because this baby was mainly on milk. And so what we really did is we used, and I want to end, uh, underscore what Dr. Ahila has said, that one of the most important take-home messages from here is if you have an ultra-fast-acting insulin, one of the biggest advantages is you can give it after a meal as long as you don't stretch it, you know, for hours later. So in this baby, we managed to control by giving a very small amount of a long-acting we use Traceba in this case because it is actually, uh, you know, what do you call the license beyond one year. We took the poetic license of using it in eight months and we peppered with a little bit of fiasco after the meals. And, and that is why I think there's a big role for fiasco, but one has to be a little careful in not using it, you know, indiscriminately. And lastly, the cost is very expensive. Yeah. So I think FIASP uh, doesn't add that much probably. There's a lot of debate going on on that. So all these, we have to take the time to evolve over that. I think final comments from Dr. Pradeep and we'll move to Thank the you. next Thank session. You, Thanks uh, Dr. Ahila for this wonderful session. I'll now like to invite Dr. Chetan uh, Dave, who will be talking about uh, okay. lifestyle. We'll be talking about his talk. So Dr. Pradeep, you can introduce the topic. Yes. yes uh, Thank you. Dr. Chetan. Uh, Dr. Chetan will be talking about lifestyle uh, changes or maybe how we can manage that in type 1 diabetes mellitus. Uh, Dr. Chetan is the first fellow you all must be knowing and he is very good orator. Uh, over to you, Dr. Chetan. Uh, thank you, Pradeep, sir. I will be talking regarding uh, what is the difference between lifestyle of a diabetic and normal common kid. Uh, when my nephew, my maternal cousin's son was diagnosed at type 1 at 13 months of age, we all were went through a lot of stress because he was a 13 month old kid and how to give four shots a day, maybe five to six times of sugar monitoring. And till now, if I ask my sister that how is life, she tells in Gujarati, it means I am fed up. So managing a kid in your home with type 1 diabetes is totally different than right now what I am talking. Why? Because you have to be perfect every day, whether it is normal day, whether it is holiday, whether it is sick day or whether it is travel day. Each and every day brings different challenge when you have type 1 kid in your home. And you have to keep very, very close eye on diet, maybe exercise shots and your monitoring of blood glucose as well as sickness management because each new thing gives you a different challenge as far as the lifestyle in type 1 diabetes is concerned. So, 
first of all another important aspect of managing type 1 is schooling of a diabetic uh, when i was in uk and us there were very good protocols fixed written protocols in each and every school as well as each and every other institute where whether it is a sports institute or a swimming pool or or whatever thing but in india there is no country wide rules all school authorities are uncooperative in our gujarat authorities take signature from parents that we are not responsible if anything happens to your child then and then we'll we will give you admission in our school so majority of indian scenario is like this only second thing is bullying by friends if the friends get to know that this kid cannot eat fruits this kid cannot eat chocolates then it's a case of bullying by the friends as well as lack of knowledge on teachers teachers don't know whether it's type 1 diabetes type 2 diabetes difference between two diabetes why this child needs this much of diet this much of insulin and all so definitely this all are a big issues in india and uh, we have isp president is uh, available with us i would request that we can make a nationwide strategy of teacher training maybe training of society as far as the type 1 diabetes is concerned another concern is school meal now majority of the school has a list of meals to be taken and to be made at home and to be taken to the school school will not allow other meal than the prescribed form of table which has been written there and we know that they have written pastas and maggies and i don't know what 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 not so definitely this strategy should be changed there should be a flexibility as far as the meal of type 1 diabetic is concerned second as i told earlier teacher should be trained regarding shots hypoglycemia management even hyperglycemia management teacher should understand the danger signs which can happen to a kid of a type 1 diabetic and special permissions should be there for a diabetic kid whether he or she feels low he or she can take straight away sugary meals or or they, there should be some candy or sugar should be readily available with the kid all the time while he is in the school so this all is related to the schooling now second challenge is exercise now we know that exercise is must for type 1 diabetic exercise will not need insulin for a blood glucose to go into the muscle so if you do it regular exercise then your insulin dose will come down but there are challenges as far as the exercise is concerned first is fear of hypos now majority of the parents believe that our kid will get hypoglycemia if he or she plays too much this is partly true as well but still for this reason they avoid their uh, type 1 kid to go outside and play with the friends second is lack of knowledge again that what exercise is beneficial what is harmful and what insulin doses has to be modified if your kid is on regular exercise and third swimming which is the best exercise as far as the uh, aerobic exercise is concerned is not recommended initially when you have a type 1 kid in your home so exercise should not be done if there is a history of hypoglycemia in 24 hours if your ketones are positive and if your sugars are too low that is below 90 and too high uh, above 270 so this three are the official recommendation of isped that you should not be doing exercise but majority of parents don't check before their child goes to play before their child goes for the exercise but we should be telling parents that you should be checking at least blood sugar if not ketones before they go into the exercise and don't do exercise if the sugars are high wire suppose if the sugars are above 270 they should be giving correction dose first if your sugars come down bil, uh, below 250 then and then they should be allowed to play and of course before going for a activity which is lasting for more than 40 45 minutes a carb that is 10 to 15 gram of complex carbohydrate uh, diet should be given to prevent the hypoglycemia during exercise now another points to consider is these are the uh, list of aerobic and anaerobic activities now all aerobic activities like jogging cycling will lower down the sugar while or anaerobic activities like weight lifting muscular strengthening uh, hardcore running like playing a basketball will tend to increase the glucose so they should be kept in mind while uh, we are considering the insulin modifications uh, for doing exercise as rightly discussed in our previous lecture cgm legs behind so don't trust on cgm while the kid is doing exercise number 2 keep the carbs ready so if he or she is going for any any other sports activity or sports academy 
15 grams carbohydrate maybe 12 two or three bunches of maybe banana vegetable sandwich or whatever should be keep ready of course along with the sugar tablets and third is insulin should be administered in areas which are not actively engaged in the exercise like if he is doing jumping or cycling insulin should be given on the arms if he is doing swimming maybe you can inject in the abdomen as well because due to high muscular activity they tend to get absorbed early and there is a fear of hypoglycemia second we have to modify both the doses before uh, before the uh, even uh, meal before exercise and meal after exercise so if your duration is more than 2 hours then there should be no change in pre exercise prandial dose but if you are doing exercise within 1 to 2 hours of your meal then that meal also has to be dose which has to been reduced like if your sugar as normal till you want 50% reduction in your pre exercise prandial meal as well now we don't recommend generally pre exercise uh, meal dose to be uh, reduced but still this is in uh, recent 2022 guidelines which suggests that even pre exercise meal sh also should be reduced if it is more than 270 still you should reduce right this is another important uh, criteria and if your sugar is low then you should be giving only 25% of the dose as compared to the normal dose so this is regarding the pre exercise now there is no evidence of using specialized uh, high protein or whey protein formula for uh, increasing the strength as far as the uh, diabetic kids are concerned regarding the post exercise we know that all post exercise uh, kid will be having tend to go down so definitely post exercise meal irrespective of the duration should have low dose or decreasing the dose according to the sugar the criteria is same for less than 90 you reduce by 75% if the sugar is fine between 90 to 270 you give 50% of the dose and if the sugars are high still you reduce by 25% so all in all before meal and after meal you should be decreasing the dose even if it is higher say less than 270 but still and of course no alcohol no partying soon after or soon before sports even uh, alcohol is strictly uh, we can say prohibited uh, as far as the uh, diabetic kids and diabetic adults are concerned second most important is traveling because traveling is such a headache you have to carry the insulin you have to carry the needles you have to carry the glucose monitoring kit and also you have to carry the carbs or a sugar tablets so you should be having more than enough supplies because there are chances of supplies which is getting damaged plus you have to be extremely cool environment so you should have a coolant bag in which you can keep the pen glucagon kit and sugar should be always be there with the kid keep a water bottle always because there are chances of that the kid might go into vomiting or any gastritis kind of thing leading to dehydration leading to ketosis which we might uh, misunderstand with the diabetic ketoacidosis and don't store in a hotel fridge is possible because hotel fridge are tend to freeze the insulin because they have abnormally high temperature so if the hotel room temperature is fine air conditioning is there so definitely we should be keeping in the room temperature rather than keeping in the hotel fridge so these are all related to the traveling guidelines as far as the diabetic uh, kids are concerned now coming to the most important part uh, this is diet so there is no diabetic diet in type 1 diabetes now i have seen many pediatricians writing sugars uh, in form of rice should not be eaten potato should not be eaten but there should be no restriction as far as the complex carb is concerned there is no diabetic diet there is no type 2 diabetic diet which has to be implemented in type 1 diabetic there should be a colorful plate kids love colorful plate concern so kids plate should have all colors white in form of dairy products green vegetables maybe purple fruits and other of uh, the millets and uh, ragi and pulses and all 50% should be carb 30% should be fat and 20% should be protein now this is the normal recommendation as far as the sped is concerned and this is recommendation matches with the normal healthy kid or a normal healthy adult and there should be avoiding of raw sugar like cold drinks juices ice cream and all so this is a general guideline which each and every healthy kid should also follow but now there are few concepts which are coming up as far as the diabetes is concerned now we know that insulin is to control the sugar number one right so if we decrease the carb 
intake there should be decrease in the insulin dose as well so there is a concept of low carb diet and there is a concept of very low carb diet so what is low carb diet it should be less than 26% of your total energy instead of 50% and very low carb diet is it should be less than 10% of the total uh, energy requirement which is made from the uh, uh, carbohydrate and there are very good studies indicating that there is a potential for better glycemic controls with reduced insulin dose and greater time in range with the use of low carbohydrate diet another study is also showing the same with very low carbohydrate diet so there are many studies who support the use of carbo uh, low carbohydrate diet but there are few studies which are coming with the negative effect of the carbohydrate diet as well so we know that we need carbohydrate our body needs carbs right for better growth so there are few studies which has been found that the growth might be falter if we put the child on low carb diet as well plus there are chances of theoretical hypoglycemia if we are using low carb as well so this was another study another multi center study which found that there is a drastic improvement in the insulin requirement as well as average hba1c for those who were on low carb diet for at least one year as compared to those were on normal carb diet so the conclusion was that the low carb diet has got improvement as far as the disease control is there but at the same time they showed tendency towards more frequent hypoglycemia so of course low carb diet should be done under the consideration of a proper dietitian or nutrition experts and the kids should not be allowed to choose their own food as far as the low carb is concerned so now we want to replace this low carb with some another energy to prevent the growth faltering so there is another concept of low carb euvolemic diet now what is euvolemic means the energy requirement should be met but not from the carb so this study has decided that carb we will keep at 5% only from the total daily requirement but they added fat as an another source of energy so they they make two groups one with the normal 50% carb another group with 5% carb and 70% fat now this is though different from the keto diet keto is zero uh, carb but this group was given 5% carb and they found that from 12% to 57% of the group having a hba1c less than 7% so this was a very good trial suggested that a reduction from 54 to 24% in clinical level 2 hypoglycemia along with the better control and this euvolemic low carb diet seems to have safe and effective method of controlling the hyperglycemia and overall time in range position but rise in ldl due to high fat content was observed so definitely we should be checking lipid profile as well and from the 70% diet it should be from the unsaturated fatty acid rather than the all poly uh, saturated fatty acid so again this also should be done under the nutritionist expert advice and this is a uh, 23 uh, review in which uh, they have shown that what are the advantages of low carb diet improved hba1c improved time in range and reduced glycemic variability but there are three negative points which we should also keep in mind first is negative impact on growth second is chances of dyslipidemia anyway type 1 diabetic are at more risk of developing dyslipidemia in form of high triglyceride so again low carb or maybe high fat diet can also cause high ldl so again this should be checked frequently and impact on mental health because we are restricting the, the most delicious food that is carb from the diet so in one or two studies it has been observed that it can impact the mental health as well so this review said that the patient will continue but it should be under the expert advice as well so now the second option if we cannot increase the fat so should we increase the protein so this study was compared three diet one with the regular reference diet that is 50% carb another with the mediterranean diet with 40% carb and third was 20% carb with high protein and they found that this high protein had a positive impact on glycemic control and there was a low time of hypoglycemia because this high protein would prevent hypoglycemia we know that the protein can be converted to glucose after 2 to 3 hours of diet and which was helpful in preventing hypoglycemia but this protein high protein diet can also cause hyperglycemia 
So there is another RCT which suggested that additional 30% of the increase in bolus should be done to prevent the hyperglycemia. So whenever the patient is having high protein diet, there is a concept called FPU, which is coming up. That is fed protein unit. So nowadays, not only carb counting is advised, but also FPU should be considered if they are taking high fat or high protein diet. So whenever the patient is having high protein diet, additional 30%, that is 130% of the dose of that bolus should be administered to counter the hyperglycemia due to high protein diet. So anyway, this high fat and high protein diet are coming up, but still they are not in guidelines because of the few negative impact. So overall, if I talk about the lifestyle, that lifestyle modification should be done throughout the life, during the day, during the night, during the older, older days. And these are the way forward, but still long-term studies are needed to see the negative impact of this specialized diet. Exercise is a must, but again, dose modification is necessary. And last, CSSI, that is insulin pump, and CGM makes life very easy as far as the monitoring and PRICS number are concerned. So, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chetan. Uh, very uh, fantastic talk this was actually. Uh, uh, we are running short of time, so we will allow only one or two questions from the audience. Okay, ma'am. Uh, if at all I want to say something to this audience, I would say don't ever take this with you and go. Because one of my patients was on uh, this altered diet and the mother was making idlis with uh, cabbage and then with cauliflower. So he came to me on twice daily, only lentils. And then I told him, see, in the long run, you cannot judge what is going to be done to the health of these children. It is unnatural to go on such diet. It has to be as physiological as possible. And that boy said, ask them to give me food. I would take injections any number of times. You want me to prick my and check my blood sugars 10 times, it's okay. Give me normal food. He was so dis despondent and it will really kill them. And in the long run, you will also remember any number of reports out in the media on people on high protein, high fat diet having sudden deaths. We don't know what this is going to do to these patients in the long run. Be as physiological as possible. Play with the insulin, not with the food. <laughs> Thank you. And we'll be very cautious on this. Yeah, yes, we'll be very cautious in this because anyway, we want to prevent uh, decay and we are talking about more fat. So whether we are going to cause more ketosis and that will only cause a problem. So these are things which we need to be probably careful. But this was what was asked from Chetan to present the current evidence. So he did that. But we have to decide from the evidence. Yeah, Dr. Rishi. A quick, quick comment. Uh, a very nice presentation, Chetan. And I was seeing the image of Dr. Nag in you where he presents. Very nice. Uh, Initially, actually, you told that schools are not uh, permitting, the teachers are not cooperative. Now, there is a national guidelines by uh, secretariat. We have a printout. I think I'll circulate. I'll pass it on to Dr. Anurag, which will go to all of you. And if you put this, schools cannot say no to take care of type 1 diabetes. They will have to bled. They will have to bed. So this is one thing that has to keep in mind. The, the guidelines are there. By government of India. This is this I wanted to emphasize. Sorry. Right. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And we'll now carry forward with the next session. So uh, our next talk is by another of our bright fellows who has now ventured out into uh, Vadodara and she's doing a wonderful job at Cure uh, Hormone Hospital, Dr. Riddhi Patel. So I'll uh, advise, uh, invite Dr. Pradeep to say a few words about the topic of neural diabetes while she comes up and starts a presentation. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so the next topic is neonatal diabetes. And uh, although it is rare, but when you encounter neonatal diabetes, it is very, very difficult to manage the that, especially when they present in newborn period, how we can start, how we can manage with insulin, and if transient form, how we can switch over to uh, all the oral hypoglycemics and how many times we should check the in, uh, this glucose and how we should give insulin. So let's see, uh, Dr. Riddhi will talk on, on that. So good evening, everyone. So uh, as uh, Pradeep sir has said that neonatal diabetes is very, very rare. It accounts for 2 to 5% cases of total pediatric diabetes cases. And 
expected. So this is the case I recently encountered two, two and a half month old girl presented with the rapid breathing, not taking feeds well and a failure to thrive. So the current weight was just 2.5 kg, same as birth weight. Sugar was very high on presentation. RBS was 550, acetone was 660 and pH was 6.9. So there is severe acidosis, ketosis and hyperglycemia. So this is the DK. Sepsis was ruled out, but HbA1c was normal, 5.1. So my residents were like, ma'am, can this be diabetes or this can be another hidden sepsis or can be uh, can this be uh, any IEM? So I was like, no, this can be diabetes because presentation is decay, failure to thrive. There was history of polyuria, significant dehydration and HbA1c is not the marker for diagnosis of diabetes, especially in newborn period, because major portion of hemoglobin is fetal hemoglobin, not the adult hemoglobin. So HbA1c is, can be normal or even low at the presentation. So I did see peptide, which was significantly low at the RBS of 250. And uh, child was managed well with the DKA protocol and then put on the insulin, subcutaneous insulin. GATE antibody was negative. And we did the genetic testing, suggestive of ABCC8 genetic defect. And child was safely sifted on uh, glibenclamide. So neonatal diabetes, as I discussed, it is very rare. All the diabetes diagnosed before six months of age is considered neonatal diabetes, though the onset can be delayed up to one year. And it is very rare. The uh, prevalence is 1 is to 90,000 to 1 is to 1, like 20,000. Most cases are monogenic, have some genetic uh, defect. 20% are transient and 80% are permanent uh, cases required lifelong uh, intervention. Uh, the mode of inheritance can be autosomal dominant or recessive depending upon which genetic defect is there. Uh, but 70 to 90 percent cases are de novo. So you won't find any family history in such cases. So we'll quickly go through the physiology of the insulin synthesis and secretion. So we need pancreas, healthy pancreas for the insulin production. There are three cells in the pancreas, alpha, beta, and delta, from which beta cells are required for insulin synthesis and secretion. And in beta cells, uh, whenever glucose value goes above the threshold, it will sensed by the beta cells. It enter into the cell via GLUT2 receptor. Then it is converted to the glucose 6-phosphate by glucokinase. Then this glucose 6-phosphate enter into the Krebs cycle glycolysis. And this results in increase in ATP to ADP ratio. And this increased metabolic activity causes closure of the potassium ATP channel. And this won't allow potassium to come out of the cell and causes entry of the calcium inside the cell via calcium channel, resulting in depolarization of the cell membrane and release of the insulin from this granules. So all this process, pancreatic development, beta cell uh, functioning and uh, the internal mechanism of insulin synthesis and secretion uh, is controlled by the genes. Okay. So the pancreatic development is regulated by the uh, various genes, especially PDX1, NeuroD1, NeuroD3, and variety of the genes. Beta cell functioning and beta cell structure required the some genes, especially Fox P3, STAT3, uh, EIF2, AK3 genes. And uh, another genes which are required for uh, insulin synthesis is the GCK, which is uh, control the rate limiting step of the uh, insulin synthesis machinery. 
second one is the abcc8 and the uh, potassium atp channel that is the kcnj11 that regulates the potassium atp channel functioning on, on and another genes are the that regulates the insulin transcription and translation process and the genes which regulate the insulin action so whenever there is genetic defect in any of these genes they have different presentation so the genes which are required for isolated insulin synthesis and secretion they just present with diabetes but the genes which are required for the pancreatic development if they are defective they have extra pancreatic features as well exocrine pancreatic insufficiency as well they have other systemic involvement like cardiac defects or neuronal defect or uh, deafness sensory neural hearing deafness and the beta cell dysfunction is also associated some syndromic presentation especially walcott relation syndrome which is a common cause of the uh, syndromic form of the neonatal diabetes so one of the good study done uh, in which there is large cohort of the patients are involved to identify the distribution and frequency of this various genes and how they are distributed among the ndm patients so this uh, study included 1020 patients so very large number of the patients which who are diagnosed with the neonatal diabetes before 6 month of the age and what they have found that more than 80% of their cases have genetic defect and out of which most common cause of the neonatal diabetes was abcc8 and kcnj11 followed by the insulin gene defect ins gene defect and followed by the gck defect so all of this uh, genetic defects leads to the neonatal diabetes and the most common one are the kcnj11 and potassium uh, sorry uh, the abcc8 so which control the closure of the potassium atp channel So, <clears throat> yes. so sorry for the because of the power cut it was the now we have a greater genetic understanding you were talking about yes so this is the large uh, study as we have discussed the most common cause is abcc8 and kcnj11 in this cohort ins was the second most common and the uh, most common syndromic cause of neonatal diabetes was walcott relation syndrome this was uh, eif2 ak3 gene so if there is defect in early uh, genes like pdx1 gata3 or uh, neuro d1 they are associated with some other system is system involvement as well plus they have exocrine pancreatic insufficiency if there is genetic defect in this they have syndromic presentation or they have isolated uh, ndm require insulin lifelong if there is defect in this uh, insulin synthesis or secretory mechanism they also uh, require insulin some of the forms respond sulfonylurea and if there is defective insulin receptor then there is uh, uh, they are associated with insulin resistance syndrome so broadly etiology of the neonatal diabetes is divided into the two category either defect in insulin secretion or defect in insulin action if insulin secretion is defective they are also divided into the transient or permanent as we have discussed 20% cases are transient they require uh, intervention for few weeks of the life and permanent cases again divided into sulfonylurea responsive or require insulin and insulin requiring cases are either isolated or syndromic ones and defect in insulin uh, action that is because of the insulin receptor defect so transient neonatal diabetes uh, as we have discussed it is 20% of all cases of neonatal diabetes where the insulin or the other hypoglycemic agent requirement is for few weeks of the uh, life that is for 12 to 14 weeks 50 to 60% cases may recur at the time of puberty or later on but some of the studies have discussed that uh, the recurrence may be as early as 4 year also genetics is most common cause of the transient neonatal diabetes is 6q24 imprinting defect 
followed by KCNG11 or ABCC8 mutation and followed by INS or some of the cases of H HNF1 beta. Uh, they present with severe hyperglycemia, but without ketosis in the first week of life only. They have severe uh, uh, intrauterine growth restriction. And some of the cases have associated feature of microglossia or umbilical hernia. So if these features are there, you can have clinical pointer to transient neonatal diabetes. Some may, many of these cases respond to sulfonylurea. And at the time of remission, so that is around two to three months of life, they develop hypoglycemia, clinically significant hypoglycemia, and they require uh, diagnosis as well as management for the few periods of time. And uh, as we have discussed, many of these cases relapse during the puberty as like early onset type 2 diabetes. So uh, the genetics of 6Q24 defect is very interesting. So in people who don't have 6Q24 defect, so every baby carries one chromosome from mother and one from the father. So here uh, in 6Q24, paternal, G, uh, paternal chromosome is unmethylated and maternal chromosome is Methylated, sorry, paternal chromosome is methylated and maternal chromosome is non methylated. So, if there is loss of the methylation of the maternal chromosome, then both the chromosomes express these genes and causing neonatal diabetes, and this is transient cases. Second scenario is like both the uh, copies of the chromosome, if baby acquired from the father, and both are unmethylated one. Uh, and both of this scenario A and scenario B is random events occur during the early phase of pregnancy and chances of recurrence is very, very low. And the third scenario in which there is duplication of the paternal copy of chromosome, but mother remains same. So in this case, if the father carries the same duplication, then chance of recurrence in the second baby is 50%. Otherwise, all other defects have very few chance of recurrence. Uh, the another uh, cause of uh, neonatal diabetes, uh, permanent cases of neonatal diabetes responds to sulfonylurea and the most common cause is uh, potassium ATP channel defect that is KCNG11 or ABCC8. That is also this of the uh, uh, of this uh, genetic defects, same, some of the cases are transient neonatal diabetes, behave like transient neonatal diabetes. 90% cases of KCNG11 mutation are permanent while 10% are transient. Like while uh, in uh, ABCC8 defect, 66% cases have transient neonatal diabetes. Their presentation is somewhat delayed as compared to transient 6Q24 defect after one week of the life. And they generally present with the DK as we have discussed in the first case. Uh, their severity of the IUGR is less as compared to 6Q24 defect. This indicating the lesser insulin deficiency during the intrauterine periods. And because this potassium ATP channel defect are also expressed in muscles and neurons, so they also present with the developmental delay or early onset epilepsy. All these cases, many of, 90% of these cases respond to sulfonylurea. Their mode of inheritance can be autosomal dominant or recessive. And as we have discussed, 90% are de novo. They don't have any family history. Now, insulin requiring PNDM, permanent neonatal diabetes, isolated without any syndromic association. This most common cause after ABCC8 is the, sorry, insulin requiring most common is the INS gene and which is required for conversion of pro-insulin to insulin. Uh, if this defect is heterozygous, then the misfolded, insulin, uh, misfolded protein is formed and that will accumulate in the endoplasmic reticulum and eventually lead to the apoptosis of the beta cells and uh, insulin uh, defect. Their onset is little bit delayed, uh, but uh, generally they present before six months of age, but they can also present up to one year of the life. And G second other common cause is the GCK. They are autosomal recessive and you uh, parents have the fasting hyperglycemia because of the heterozygous GCK defect. Others are the 10% cases of the potassium ATP channel uh, defect also not respond to sulfonylurea and they require insulin. Syndromic form of the permanent neonatal diabetes, the common one, there are more than 17 genes are identified uh, uh, nowadays. And the uh, mechanism of the diabetes is because of pancreatic egenesis, 
और बीटा सेल डिसफंक्शन और बीटा सेल डिस्ट्रक्शन द मोस्ट कॉमन वन इज द वॉल्कोट रेलिसन सिंड्रोम इट इज एसोसिएटेड विथ स्कोडाइलो एपिफेशियल स्केलेटल डिस्प्लेशिया एंड रिकरेंट लीवर एंड रीनल डिस्फंक्शन आईपेक्स विच इज एक्स लिंक डिसऑर्डर because of fox p3 defect and associated with immune dysregulation polyendocrinopathy and enteropathy fankani bickel syndrome because of defect in glut2 so there is defective entry of the glucose from uh, blood into the beta cells and these are also associated with liver dysfunction and hypergalactosemia roger syndrome because of defect in sls in 19a2 and this is associated with thiamine responsive megaloblastic anemia and sensory neural hearing deafness Others are the Wolfram syndrome because of defect in WFS1, where there is combination of diabetes insipidus, diabetes mellitus, and deafness, and Donau syndrome that is because of the uh, defect in insulin receptor, and they are present with severe hyperglycemia and severe lipodystrophy because of poor linear um, adipose tissue and muscle tissue. Others are the HNF1B. The, these are the very rare causes associated with renal cyst, microcephaly, deafness. and all of these cases associated with pancreatic agenesis so they have also associated exocrine pancreatic insufficiency and all of this syndromic causes of neonatal diabetes require lifelong insulin when to suspect neonatal diabetes so any sga child is present with the hyperglycemia you have to think uh, this hyperglycemia or insulin deficiency may be the reason for her his or her intrauterine growth restriction polyuria with dehydration dk as in infants or neonat especially many of the im also mimic like dk presentation so we have to consider dk if the c peptide is very low associated history of recurrent low uh, large volume fatty stool so that suggests the exocrine pancreatic insufficiency and if there is hyperglycemia requires some form of intervention to control the blood sugar associated with this features like developmental delay epilepsy skeletal dysplasia liver dysfunction or deafness that points towards the syndromic forms so we have to think of permanent form of ndm in this cases so diagnosis is uh tricky somewhat tricky in uh, neonatal cases because we require rbs that is more than 200 that should be persistent at least for 3 days and that requires insulin to reduce the sugar value also keep in mind the other causes of neonatal hyperglycemia because which are more common as compared to neonatal diabetes and these are the preterm babies parenterally if we are giving high glucose infusion sepsis and some of the drugs especially steroids dopamine epinephrine norepinephrine are known to cause insulin resistance and hyperglycemia so second point is to differentiate transient or permanent variety so if the presentation is in a very early in first one or two weeks of life very severe iogr very severe hyperglycemia but no ketoacidosis uh, associated features if are there like umbilical hernia macroglossia or omphalocele that suggest the transient variety of neonatal diabetes and permanent variety generally present later after two weeks of life they generally present with dk and they have less severity of iogr as compared to transient cases and you may or may not find positive family history in permanent variety they also have other features like syndromic features or exocrine pancreatic insufficiency uh so which laboratory test to perform c peptide should be done in each and every case if it is low at the time of hyperglycemia that suggests there is insulin deficiency or endogenous insulin production is low to uh, control the sugar value hba1c though it is not reliable to diagnose the neonatal diabetes but its value if more than 6.5 it is diagnostic of the neonatal diabetes gaid antibody a uh, gaid uh, antibody should be done only if the age is more than 6 month where we have to differentiate ki this is early onset type 1 diabetes or this can be neonatal diabetes also a uh, fecal elastase to rule out the exocrine pancreatic insufficiency f uh, fasting blood sugar of parent should be done because it is this is the direct pointer to gck defect and as per the recent ispet 22 uh, 2022 recommendation genetic testing is is must in each and every case of neonatal diabetes even we are thinking of transient variety so management is stabilization with the fluids and insulin and if the child presented with the dk as per the dk protocol uh, uh, they are managed 
uh, initially IV insulin given at very, very low dose 0 0.01 to 0 0.05 unit per kg per hour. And uh, our goal is to keep the sugar between 100 to 200 and monitor the sugar very frequently. So the transient neonatal diabetes, if the genetic report suggests you that this is transient neonatal diabetes, then a uh, slow weaning of hypoglycemic agent should be done. Sugar monitoring after weaning and after remission, sugar should be monitored every three to six monthly because as we have discussed, okay, there are some reports suggestive of early relapse of uh, transient neonatal diabetes and 6 to 24 defect are at high risk of hypoglycemia at around six to 18 months of age. So also sugar monitoring is required around this period to identify these cases of hypoglycemia. Now, after stabilization, after excluding the transient cases, and uh, now we shift the patient to subcutaneous insulin. And the giving subcutaneous insulin in neonate is very, very challenging because they have very little subcutaneous fat, very small dose requirement, and they are more prone to develop hypoglycemia. So si which side to use, how much insulin is to go, how, uh, how, how, how uh, much dilution to uh, uh, do is very difficult. So better is to give insulin pump that is continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion where the basal uh, insulin is set at the dose of 0.1 to 0.3 unit per kg per day. And even in the uh, insulin pump, we have to uh, dilute the insulin in the cannula. And goal is to keep the sugar between 100 to 200. Uh, when we are transitioning the patient from insulin to the sulfonylurea, because genetic reports suggest you of the potassium ATP channel defect, so it should be done in in, in patient setting. It should be uh, the uh, transition should be very gradual. Dose is dose of the glibenclamide is 0.2 to 0.5 mg per kg per day. But in some of the cases, we may we may have to give very higher dose that is 2.3 mg per kg per day. Side effects of the sulfonylurea is very, very less. Only reported side effect is transient diarrhea and straining of the tooth. And we can give a trial of glibenclamide. Even we are waiting for the uh, genetic reports because most of these cases of the neonatal diabetes are sulfonylurea responsive and potassium ATP channel defect. And studies have shown that uh, as early as we start this glibenclamide, they can also improve the neurological symptom, especially in potassium ATP channel defects. Now we'll go through these two cases, 10-day-old uh, boy. This, I encountered this case in last month only, presented with the dehydration. Birth weight was 2.6 kg, current weight of 1.7 kg. Bone, uh, the mother was preemie and child was on exclusive breastfeeding. Uh, very severe acidosis, pH was 7, bicarb was 3 only, creatinine was 2.7, suggestive of pre-renal ARF. And RBS was in the range of 250 to 350. So since last 48 hours, the sugars were in this range. So uh, treating neonatologists were very concerned. Okay, this can be neonatal diabetes or this presentation can be DK or not. So what I did, the ketone uh, was done. So ketone was normal. So this definitely hyperglycemia and acidosis was, was actually disproportionate. So not suggestive of DK to me. So I checked the IV fluid dextrose concentration and it was very high. GIR was uh, going at the rate of 6 to 8. So initially, we have shifted the child to dextrose-free fluid and within 24 hours, sugars were normalized. So definitely before considering the diagnosis of neonatal diabetes, we should keep in mind this uh, common causes of neonatal hyperglycemia. This is a one-month-old boy presented with failure to thrive. Birth weight was 2.8, current weight 1.5, significant weight loss, family history of prior sibling loss. RBS was at the time of presentation was 450. There was acidosis, ketosis. So this is DK. Uh, looks like uh, diabetes and shifted to subcutaneous insulin. On subcutaneous insulin, there are high, uh, very frequent hypoglycemia. And even before sent, child was sent to me, uh, there was trial of glibenclamide given, but child has not responded to glibenclamide. Uh, the dose requirement of insulin was very low, 0.1 to 0.2 unit per kg per day. Child has some eczema-like lesion on the skins. So that suggests some of the form of the permanent neonatal diabetes or some syndromic association. Genetics was sent and uh, report suggestive of Fox P3 defects. So this is X-linked uh, disorder. And this genetic uh, report has prompted us to screen the other endocrinopathy at earlier age. 
and uh, we can offer them a option of uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation because it is uh, the uh, therapeutic modality for the Fox P3 defect. So definitely in current era, uh, we should send all the patients uh, of the neonatal diabetes. Genetic testing is must. Thank you. I think thanks a lot, Riddhi, for the wonderful presentation. And uh, we'll have inputs from Dr. Pradeep. Very nice presentation, Dr. Riddhi. I think I wrote many questions, but you already uh, covered all. Uh, especially how we should switch over when we the patient comes, you start with insulin. And uh, now you came to know that this is sulfonylurea responsive uh, neonatal diabetes. How we should switch over to practically so, to so first uh, whatever dose of insulin we are giving reduce by 50 percentage and start the sulfonylurea at the lower dose 0.2 uh, milligram per kilogram per day and then gradually once the sugars are stabilized increase the dose of sulfonylurea and reduce the dose of uh, insulin so this will take around two to three days so in first uh, case, uh, case which i have discussed we took uh, three days to switch from uh, insulin to sulfonylurea Inpatient. Inpatient. So that has to be uh, done in patient, yes. not at home. Any other question from audience? Yes. Uh, before shifting to uh, sulfonyl urease, the sugars should be stabilized. So there should be no hyperglycemia on the uh, the basal bolus. Obviously, because once yeah. we switch the sulfonylurea after getting genetic reports. So by the time, obviously, insulin dose is stabilized and sugars are also in the normal range. So it, the, so it's not urgency. Yeah. So other we, thing that people try to do is that we empirically gave a sulfonylurea trial, but only 40 to 50 percent will actually be responsive. So this is strongly discouraged. Now, genetic testing is easily available. Get it done till the time insulin is the main therapy. Mm. And maybe you get an insulin defect or some other defect in which insulin is required lifelong. So you continue that. But 50% chance, I would say, is there. More important probably is also to keep an eye about the transient form, mm. which Riddhi said very importantly. So earlier onset, milder disease, lesser decay, normal birth weight. Think of more of a transient diabetes in that regards. <coughs> Uh, uh, once we get the potassium ATP channel defect, most of the cases respond to sulfonylurea. So they will take time they, because by the time your channels will actually have start so, acting, so here, it will in take that time. case, ma'am, the defect was different. So folks, P3 defect require insulin. They, they won't respond to sulfonylurea. So that trial was given before uh, re, uh, achieving the report of genetic test. And, and even in the potassium so ATP that, defect, your initial requirement may be very high, very 0.81, high. because by the time the potassium channels start acting, you need that dose. And once they start acting, the dose has come down. This is well known. I think we can take the question during the dinner. Yeah, we'll, yeah. I think we'll be running a bit late. Uh -huh. Now I invite uh, Dr. Vajpayee. And uh, Dr. Vajpayee said, need no introduction. And as you see, the diabetes is rampant among adolescents, so it's equally relevant topic. So I request Dr. Vajpayee to enlighten us with your knowledge. Regarding treatment of type 2 diabetes in Adocent, Dr. Uh, Vajpayee. Thanks a lot, Dr. Vikas. And uh, as you mentioned, that diabetes, pretty much type 2 diabetes, is something which is going to be very, very important from that perspective. And why it is important to really diagnose type 2 diabetes properly is highlighted by this case. We had this 16 year old boy with polyuria who presented with hyperglycemia. The HbA1c was high at 10%, and he had ketosis. So he typically presented with the ketotic diabetes, DK managed with insulin and then somebody thought that okay he is slightly obese that the family history now everybody says type 2 diabetes is very common so we should think that this is type 2 diabetes and metformin was started insulin was stopped now do you agree with this regimen that this child who is obese maybe has a family history you stop insulin just by assuming this is type 2 diabetes so this is not the right practice so what happened this child then presented later with diabetic ketoacidosis and then was found to have GAT positive. So the big message this case gives is that unless and until you have excluded immune diabetes using at least GAD antibody, you should not make a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. And that's very, very important. 
So we know that now we have a greater number of adolescents who have type 2 diabetes. So this I'm talking more in terms of adolescent perspective. We need to be aware about how we manage and how do we diagnose these cases. Now, why are we bothered about type 2 diabetes in adolescents is that they have a much more aggressive disease. A larger number of these people will have complications, nephropathy, uh, hypertension, microalbumina, which Dr. Rishi will talk about right at diagnosis. So they are very different from type 1. And studies have shown that they will have a very rapid progression in terms of diabetes. So they will lose 10% of their beta cell mass every year as against 7% with the adults lose. So they have a much likely chance of progressing very rapidly and there are very few options available in terms of therapy which is there. So I'll talk about these issues and all of you should go and have a look at the ISPAD guidelines, the current guidelines, which I'm trying to refer also in certain scenario. So we'll start off with the first case, 12 year old boy with obesity. He has a BMI, which is plus 2.2 SDS, has acanthosis. There is a family history of diabetes. Now, how do we screen this child? And that's the question. Now, if we go by the SPAD guidelines, the diagnosis, diagnostic criteria are not different from adults. So typically you go for an oral glucose tolerance test. So fasting blood sugar, and then after a 75 gram glucose, and you also talk about HbA1c. Now, if we compare these three values of fasting versus HbA1c versus a glycemic load, I would say that HbA1c is something which we should not use alone. Many patients come to us with 5.7 to 6.4 labeled as pre-diabetes. When you do a proper evaluation, you do not find that there is a good correlation. So in a lower range, as Riddhi was talking about, HbA1c may not be a very good indicator. So what I'm talking about is that fasting sugar, if it's high, it's a very, very specific pointer that there could be a definite dysglycemia, which is there. And after glucose load also will tell you what will happen if you eat a lot. So fasting is like, if you look at, uh, uh, if it's high, it means that even without doing anything, your sugars are high. Post meal or two hour value will tell you if you have a feast like this, what will happen to your sugar and HbA1c is a crude marker in between. So HbA1c definitely, if you are thinking of, you should only be doing using the assays which are standardized against the DCCT database. So that's another important factor to look at. Now, very importantly, what they say is that you don't just look at sugar. You have to look at blood pressure. You have to look at hypertension. You have to look at uh, steatohepatitis. Along with that, you also look at sleep apnea. So all these factors also have to be assessed in that regards. Now, in this case, we found a fasting of 96, which is normal, HbA1c of 5.3 and our glucose load 123. So what do we do? Do we stop monitoring here? No. The very important message is that we need to keep on follow up. And our study also suggests that these metabolically healthy, quote unquote, what we call as metabolically healthy, 40-50% will progress to metabolic complications within the next two years. So what they recommend is that every three years, at least you follow up and measure these profiles time and again in that perspective. The criteria we all know of the fasting, the impaired, the pre-diabetes, and these criteria are pretty much there from that regards. You should do a eight hour fasting, glucose load is standard. So these are the standard criteria which are laid down by the ADA. So very importantly, we will now move forward to this case again that once you have diagnosed diabetes in a child who looks like obese, adolescent, do you really say this is type 2 diabetes? No. And for that, we need to understand that type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes may be very difficult to differentiate in this age group. So while a pubertal onset with a family history in the setting of obesity, acanthosis and lack of ketosis will indicate a high possibility of type 2 diabetes the only most important discriminatory factor if you look at is the autoimmunity. So unless you have done a GAD antibody and GAD antibody is negative, you should not really diagnose somebody as a case of type 2 diabetes. This is a big message and we saw a couple of cases exactly like that in that perspective. Now, what is the importance of autoimmunity versus C-peptide? So the major role of C-peptide is to exclude type 1 diabetes. If your C-peptide is high, you pretty much say, okay, it is unlikely to be type 1 diabetes. While the major role of autoimmunity is to rule in type 1 diabetes, if your GAD is positive, this is type 1 diabetes. I think that's how you should look into that. 
there is a term of obese individuals who have quote unquote type 2 diabetes with autoimmunity these individuals tend to have a lower beta cell reserve they have less metabolic complications and would need insulin so obesity is not a factor to decide about in terms of deciding type 2 diabetes it's the autoimmunity which is the major factor so now this is our algorithm that we use so anybody who is after 6 months particularly in the pubertal age group if there is no dk and the insulin requirement is less you look at gad antibody if it's absent and the child is obese we consider that as type 2 diabetes so obese adolescent not requiring insulin gad negative this is type 2 diabetes for you in that perspective so now this is what the recommendations are and what they clearly say is that it's very important to have the negative islet auto antibodies which is a major criteria which has come from the ispad guidelines as well so insulin should have been continued we have developed a diabetes interpreter which basically looks into all these clinical parameters to classify diabetes and validated in terms of our study and this was presented by apratik in the ispad conference on oral presentation which validates that it's a very good way to differentiate diabetes now we'll move forward we have a 9 year old girl with obesity hba1c 6.5 and sugar fasting is 90 and 2 hours is 120 so this is a question now this is where hba1c may cause confusion so i would definitely not label this child as diabetes right now because i know there is a lot of variation with hba1c so best would be to follow up in this scenario and what we also need to look at how this hba1c was done so if it was done using a point of care test we should better repeat with a standardized assay and in that perspective we found that this was normal now we need to follow up and on follow up at one year the child actually progressed to diabetes there was fasting of 128 and 2 hour of 230 now the question is what do we do in terms of therapy so over the next few slides i'll focus predominantly in terms of treatment options which are available and we always say there were only two options available as far as type 2 diabetes is concerned we had the last session i think 5 years ago we talked about metformin and insulin that's pretty much there but now as we speak new drugs are getting available so what are the options we can use metformin which will cause as sensitization of the liver it will basically cause decrease hepatic glucose production we got tzds which i think there's no one will think about them they will got weight gain bone issues so not for children we can think of very important group of drugs which are the glp1 receptor analogs these are basically the incretins now what incretins are is that whenever you have a meal they are secreted by the duodenum and they go to the brain and tell okay don't eat any more they go to the stomach delay the gastric emptying they increase the production of insulin and they inhibit the production of glucagon so they work on multiple pathways and their analogs clearly are a good way forward in terms of diabetes management because they will cause weight loss and decrease appetite as well you also have dpp4 inhibitor so we look into their evidence which increase the half life of these glp1 receptor analog glp1 which we will see how they work in children alpha glucosidase inhibitors basically decrease the absorption from the intestine from the gut basically and they are very mild agents most of us won't find them to be very efficacious probably around 0.5 hba1c maximum one group of drugs which is really changed the way adult practice is with regards to type 2 diabetes is sglt2 inhibitors which basically decrease the renal excretion reabsorption of glucose so what they are doing is that they will allow glucose to go out of the urine if you are losing glucose your load comes down theoretically you will lose some water you will lose some sodium and very importantly in adults it's been clearly shown that it has a cardio and a renal protective drug so this is one agent which is really now becoming part sacrosanct after metformin and adult so everybody is using this drug now right left and center i would say and of course the glp1 receptor analogs are also coming up so how do they match up in children and of course insulin is a drug which is always available so we'll talk mainly about these three drugs so metformin has been indicated for a long time about 8 years of age especially the hba1c is not very high but if you have a child who has type 2 diabetes whose sugar levels are high in that regards in the beginning insulin is the primary therapy 
and there is a transition to metformin once there is a gradual improvement. So we'll go one by one. Metformin is basically a MAP kinase inhibitor. It acts as a peripheral level as well as hepatic glucose production. So it is very good in terms of inducing mild weight loss. It is pretty much the first drug of choice in type 2 diabetes in all ages. You start off with around 500 milligrams. You should know that there will be a GI side effects which are going to happen. So you gradually build up to 2000 milligrams. Nothing beyond that 2000 gram you will not. 2 grams you won't get much benefit. Always give vitamin B12 because you will be losing B12. And that is going to cause a lot of neuropathic features which may happen. Very importantly in patients who have a compromised renal function, a high level of ALT, or rarely if you have a mitochondrial disease, you should avoid this. And if you are on metformin, the child develops a sick day, stop metformin immediately. It should not be used with contrast or surgery. So these are some of the basic uh, factors to think about when you think of metformin as a therapy. Now, is metformin going to really sustain a glycemic control? And this is the study I was talking about. This was the today's study, which was a landmark study as far as type 2 diabetes is concerned. And what they found was that metformin will not sustain the effect over time. And they, at that time, thought of rosiglitazone, which is now nobody will use. This is a thiazolidinidione to improve. So what they found that after four to five years, metformin is not going to do your work. And you would need to add some other agent. So progressiveness of type 2 diabetes in adolescents was established by this study. So we need more agents to have durable control. So one option is insulin, of course. So you use a basal insulin. You can use a, a Degludec or a 2GO or maybe once we have the Icodec available, that will be once a week preparation. That will bring down your fasting and your sugar control will be better. So this is the way forward. Now, a few words about two important molecules which are now emerging and have been FDA approved as far as management of diabetes in adolescents is concerned. One is the GLP-1 receptor analog. So as I said, it has got four different areas of action. Increases insulin, decreases uh, glucagon, decreases satiety, and also has an effect on gastric emptying, plus reduces weight. So it's a very, very good drug from a multiple factors. It has got multiple effects and uh, the drug which was first approved in children was liraglutide, which is given once uh, daily and it can be built up gradually. It causes around 10% weight loss, which is there. The other options include weekly preparations like dulaglutide, exenatide and semaglutide, which is now also available as an oral preparation in adults. So now if you look at these things, when should we avoid? Rarely, if there is a pancreatitis or there is a medullary carcinoma thyroid, you should avoid it. So the leader trial, which really led to the FDA approval for liraglutide, showed that this was a good drug, both in terms of reduction in HbA1c as well as reduction in pain. So this is a good agent, but again, a daily injection. So this is something and a costly daily injection will limit its use in children. Now, once weekly dulaglutide has also been used in around 150 patients. It's again an easier one. So you give the injection once a week, like Trulicity that's available, which will cause a weight loss as well as improved outcome. We have seen many patients who are on insulin. Once you give them once weekly dulaglutide, they will be off insulin. So this is a very, very good drug, I would say, but it's expensive. Maybe it will cost around 10, 8 to 10,000 rupees a month. And they may have side effects in terms of gastrointestinal symptoms. So this is an agent to watch for a good one. There is now a oral semaglutide, which is available largely from the adult data, not yet approved in children. So this is a pill, you can, a peptide you can take orally. So this is a, some smart technology by which you can take the semaglutide and it will work. So this is going to be a good drug to think of in children. You start off with low dose and build up gradually. Again, cost will be an issue, but I think this will be the work to watch out in children subsequently. What about SGLT2 inhibitors? So these drugs basically are causing decrease the reabsorption of glucose via the sodium glucose link transported to in the, in this, in the kidneys. So it is causing more loss of glucose. You lose more glucose if you lose 50 grams of glucose, your burden becomes less. You are going to also have a better effect on weight loss, reduced fat. And this is one class of drug which has shown cardiac benefit. 
and Dr. Rishi is really fond about the renal benefit that is there of this group of drugs. So this is a wonderful drug from an adult perspective. It is now recommended for heart failure without diabetes. It is recommended for renal insufficiency without diabetes. So this is some drug which is probably coming up as a big drug in that regard. So options are empagliflozin, which was the original molecule which showed the cardiac benefit. Now we have canagliflozin. Dapagliflozin is now available. There are hundreds of preparations available. The cost has become really down. So this is one agent which will be cheap, oral, good response, cardiac benefit. Now remember these adolescents at 16 years, what will be their cardiac complication 25 years later? So this is going to be a big issue. Cardio renal. And if something prevents that, this is the right age to act. So I think this will be a good drug to look at. Of course, really they may cause 5% cases may have lower urinary tract infections. If you give somebody who is insulopenic, you may cause euglycemic DKA. But this is very, very rare from that regards. And uh, these things have to be looked into. Now, there are a couple of studies which have been published. One is about dapagliflozin which has shown a reasonable improvement in terms of HbA1c in the setting. And this is some drug which has been shown to be quite effective. There is a very interesting study which has now been published recently, the Dynamo study, which was published in the NEJM quite recently. And this study is really showing that the use of empagliflozin in adolescents 10 to 17 years reduces weight and reduces HbA1c. So this is a group of drug which has a significant potential. So I think we've got the reprints also. So all of you can go and have a look at this is very recently published. And they also compared this to a DPP-4 inhibitor. And what they found was that SGLT2 inhibitor was good, but DPP-4 inhibitor was not. So this is something which we have to look at. And very recently, just around 10 days ago, FDA has approved uh, the empagliflozin now for the use in adolescence. So based upon this Dynamo study, so this is very, very good data, I would say. So we have got a good option. The preparations are available with metformin. So I think once we start using, this will be a good drug to use in adolescence. And this is something which is there. What about DPP-4 inhibitors? So of course, they are wonderful drugs, particularly being weight neutral, less risk of hypoglycemia. And they have been used a lot in adults. But the problem is whether they are suited for obese adolescents who have got many other views. So the studies which have been done in the setting of the pediatric population with citagliptin or linagliptin have shown to be have limited effect. So citagliptin, which was a wonder drug in adults and which became a multi-billion dollar molecule was found to have very limited effect around 0.2% difference in HbA1c. If we talk about SGLT2 inhibitors, like 0.8 to 1, that is a standard sort of a reduction. This causes only 0.2% reduction. So this is non-superior. So it has not no benefit pretty much. So we are not thinking of DPP-4 inhibitor. And I talked about linagliptin earlier also. So probably DPP-4 are not a good choice in this age group. So now what options can we use? Metformin, of course, remains the number one choice. Insulin, especially in the acute cases. GLP-1 receptor analog, especially once the oral preparations come into the foray, and SGLT2 inhibitors. I would say a combination of SGLT2 inhibitors and metformin will go a long way. It is easy, oral, cheap, safe relatively. So I think this is something which will go forward in that regard. At the moment, we will suggest a protocol that if you have a non-osmotic presentation with the HbA1c less than 8.5, start metformin. If there is improvement, continue. No improvement, think of a basal versus GLP-1 receptor analog, or maybe now a SGLT2 inhibitor added at that point of time. If there is an osmotic presentation with the HbA1c, which is more than 8.5%, start with basal insulin and metformin, and then you can add a GLP-1 receptor analog or a metformin. If the presentation is, of course, with DKA or hyperosmolar state, you have to start insulin. Do not add metformin during ketosis. Only after the child is better, you start and follow from there. So key is very sick child, start with insulin. Don't bother. It is type 1, type 2, start insulin. Milder disease, you can start with metformin and maybe SGLT2 inhibitor will be the way forward in that regards. So this is what the uh, recommendations come from there. So now we have an 18-year-old girl, the same girl with GAD negative. The presentation is not, uh, is she is having HbA1c of 10%. So better to start glargin and after some time you start metformin. On follow-up at 12 months, she has poor adherence. She has gained weight. HbA1c is high. 
has non alcoholic steatohepatitis so in this setting you need to think of something else and i will probably add a glp1 receptor analog or maybe sglt2 inhibitor would be a good option in this perspective 17 year old boy with obesity bmi is 42 so quite morbid obesity there is acanthosis family history hba1c is very high high sgpt so it's a very complicated case of course we are giving everything metformin glp1 receptor analog insulin what to do so i think one option which is there of course in the last stage is whether a obesity surgery and it's been shown that bariatric surgery is really curative for diabetes because of all the syncretin response but that's the last stage once you've done everything in that scenario so to summarize we should consider type 2 diabetes in individuals who are obese non ketotic and pubertal do not diagnose type 2 unless the autoimmune workup has been done metformin insulin and glp1 receptor analog are the mainstay add sglt2 inhibitors i think pretty much soon they will be approved in india as well in adolescents so it will be a good drug to use and of course dr rishi will talk from here on about how to assess and manage complications in diabetes overall i think uh, thanks for all for a, a patient hearing for that thank you dr vashpai it was really an eye opener uh, to all of us that all children are not type 1 so try to get uh, try to find out at least to get you know uh, test for everyone so and everything is been well explained nothing to add so thank you dr vashpai now i invite any any question one or two question quick questions you can take please please yeah. please please SGLT2 has been approved for the age of 10 years. The yes. 10 days back only. Then That's what we should. FDA approval. Yes. Sir. 10 to for 70. 10, yeah, 10 to 10 70. 70. That's what I should. Yeah. Secondly, sir, GLP receptor analog also have a cardiovascular safety. Yes, just yes. comparable to the SGLT2. Yes, yes. I think that's a very valid point. Definitely. So, the, I think the key message is that we now have beyond metformin and insulin two good drugs. GLP-1 receptor analog versus SGLT2 and both are very good drugs which have improved the lives of adults and definitely will have a role on that. So now I'll uh, have liraglutide has not been uh, now liraglutide has been approved. No, dulaglutide. dulaglutide has not in years I think they are pretty much more adult than many of the other adults in, in, in India, I think. So it's really a pleasure now for me to invite Dr. Rishi, who has been the backbone of endocrinology at our department. He is the director of endocrine services in uh, Regency Center and he's been working as Dr. Kapoor said for the last 30 years. And he has seen that all right from the syringes, from the pens to the pumps and how management has changed and how complications happen. So we will have a, a, a wonderful talk from Dr. Rishi about these aspects of diabetes complications and how we can really prevent also becomes important in that perspective. So. Then he had. So over to Dr. Rishi. Yes, sir. What is that going on? Good evening, friends. Um, thank you, Dr. Anurag, for the opportunity and respected chairpersons, Dr. Vikas, Dr. Pradeep. It's been a pleasure to be here. And I'm I'll be discussing. I'm going beyond what you've been seeing. I just before that, I just wanted to discuss good part with uh, pediatric endocrinologists is there that most of you continue to follow your type 1 diabetes, children to adults to middle age, you continue to follow. I have not in 30 years, I have not yet uh, uh, received any references. Now patient is entered into adulthood. So we start seeing. So this is, I believe good part and patients are also comfortable. So this is a good thing. And 
I'm going to discuss certain things that we need to ask. So acute complications have already, already been talked, so I'll not be talking. Microvascular complications, macrovascular, and then certain adult related issues. Uh, Any one of you aware of DCCT trial? I'm just asking. DCCT diabetes control and complication trial. So, I'll, yes. Actually, this is the backbone of type 1 diabetes management. So, all of you should know. It came in 1993 precisely. That was the year I cleared my endocrinology and 94 onwards I started working as endocrinology. And that time people used to ask what is new in diabetes. And till that point of time, the understanding was once complications set in, they are all progressive. Once nephropathy, retinopathy, or anything happens in terms of diabetes, it will keep on progressing. Whatever you do, you can only retard the rate of progression. This trial was the first trial that categorically showed they have two arms. One was the active arm, uh, the uh, intensive arm, and other was the regular or control arm. A1C less than 7 and A1C around 9 in two arms and it was followed up for 6.5 years and it was seen that it, the risk of uh, retinopathy, neuropathy, nephropathy, everything was reduced and if you can see A1C 7.3 versus 9.1 and so it was the first trial that at that point of time showed that the good control plays a very vital role. And then not only it, it was 6.5 years, 19.3, now it is 30 years. So it was followed for 30 years. Edic trial, the continuation of the trial, epidemiology of diabetes intervention and complications. So this is the full name. So edic summary. So it is still being followed. And what the, we have learned a lot. And what was learned that more than 30 years of follow up, microvascular complications are reversible. It was seen in first six years. And it was also seen when the trial was stopped after 6.5 years. So what happened? The A1C from less than 7 must to 8, 8.2, 8.5. But they were being followed. And what was observed that that even with higher HbA1c, the benefits are still there. The neuropathy is less, the nephropathy is there, less the uh, retinopathy is lesser. And not only this, they also noted some benefits in terms of the coronary artery events were lesser. So what was found that initial control is key to success. And here you people are very, 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 very important. Whenever a newly detected type 1 diabetic comes, maybe give up him or her a month, a year's time and try to bring blood sugar less than 7 and sustain it as long as possible. And if you are able to keep it for next couple of years, one thing, two things will happen. The patient and the family will be adjusted and addicted to maintain that level, number one. And number two, if not, then you have at least given first couple of years where it comes into metabolic memory. I always give a negative example, like if you ask a police policeman not to use abusive language, then they come and say, Sali sugar control is sugar control. So the, it is tough to... The, the good things are also entered into our metabolic memory. And these things you can reap later. So this is very important. But barrier is tough to keep a low blood sugar with lesser hypoglycemia. I think Dr. Vikas can comment it to this. Now it is easier. We have pumps. We have pumps with a feedback. The latest pump is it senses. So blood sugar doesn't go down. The golden rule is take advantage of metabolic memory. This is a DCCT trial and the main patients will follow up. If you're looking two arms, on the left side, this was a coronary artery events and the right side, the four major adverse cardio, the, the coronary events plus a stroke. All these things, even with raised hb and they were followed for next 17, 18, 20, 30 years and they found benefits. Now, now coming to the complications of type 1 diabetes, the nephropathy is seen around 15 to 40%. And, then, and what is most important, moment you see nephropathy, 
the risk of cardiovascular disease is tenfold higher in patients with diabetic nephropathy than without nephropathy. So this is this is very very important. The SPAD recommendations are that screen any patient of type one diabetes at eleven years or more, and if it is less than eleven years, then two years after the onset. So I have divided. Normal albuminuria, microalbuminuria, macroalbuminuria. I'll not be going into details. And the recommendations are that one value of albumin creatinine ratio should not be considered as diagnostic unless it is persistent, as demonstrated by two consecutive bursts. So at least two or three values at different time interval, and that gives you. And this is another very very important mortality in type one diabetes with albuminuria. Ten years follow up, nine hundred adults, and the mortality was fifteen percent with normal albuminuria, twenty percent with micro, and forty four with macro. So moment albumin is there, you should be alarmed. So nephropathy is considered as marker of retinopathy, neuropathy, and autonomic neuropathy. And nephropathy is strongly associated with hypertension. So again, nephropathy and hypertension, all these things you have to come. Neuropathy, all these complications are around. 30 40 percent in long term type one follow because now my all children those who are 15 years the after 30 years they are 55 years so I have a follow up I mean more than 50 years of diabetes good number of patients the DCCT showed neuropathy as 39 percent and always ask about symptoms and check um, I, I think I I taught to My fellows, the monofilament test, and at least ask the patient to lie down, look at the sensations. The monofilament test. All of you are aware? Yes or no? No. I think there is a small filament. I don't have picture. You just have to put it with like a ten gram pressure. So put it like this, and it bends. And after bending, if person or child can sense, it is not neuropathy. If cannot sense, it is neuropathy. Very simple. And the deep ankle jerk, the ankle reflex is again a very important thing. Make it a habit to see. Always the risk factors are alcohol, B12 deficiency, and duration of diabetes. Retinopathy again. When should be seen? Same. Less than eleven years, two years after diagnosis, or post uh, after eleven years at the time of presentation. Lipid again is a missed part. This is very very important, and recommendations are if age is more than twelve years at diagnosis, and if settled, then five yearly, and if twelve years, if the child is less than twelve years, and if they are risk factor, the family history of obesity, family history of hypertension, family history of dyslipidemia, you should look at the risk factors, and how should we approach if LDL is what is normal. And what you should do? LDL ideally should be less than hundred, HDL more than twenty five, and triglycerides more than one, less than one fifty. If LDL is less than hundred to one twenty nine, only lifestyle changes up to one sixty. Medication based on risk, and if it is more than one sixty, statins should be advised, but. As lower doses as possible. So this is the very if more than one sixty, you should treat at least. You should look at lipid profile. You should ask family history of hypertension. You should ask family history of coronary artery disease. You should ask family history of any stroke. If these things are there, you need to be careful because you you need to protect hypertension. I think I need not tell this to a pediatric population. More than ninety five centile for the age and gender. What is pre-hypertension? BP one twenty eighty or more in pediatric age group. Is stage one five millimeter above ninety five centile and stage two five millimeter above ninety nine centile. So ninety fifth and ninety seventh ninety nine centile are the parameter. And what to do? Pre-hypertension. Keep rechecking six monthly. Is stage one that is. Ninety-five percentile plus five millimeter plus. You check it more frequently, and if it is persistently high, start with therapy. And the therapy of choice is our ACE inhibitors. And if it is a stage two hypertension, evaluate or refer, and start therapy. So again, you need to look. 
this is these are different cuff size for a different age group for newborn infant child adolescent i think i took it all of you will be using it and knowing it so i need not tell to this then type 1 diabetes and coronary artery disease we sell them because it does not happen in child any type 1 more than 55 years coronary artery disease mortality is six fold than general population and coronary events including ecg i mean this was a data ecg 16% at 10 years of diabetes so any type 1 diabetes diagnosed after 11 years of age if 10 years are passed you have to have risk of coronary artery disease in your mind and the disease is more extensive than normal population and the risk factors duration of diabetes hypertension dyslipidemia smoking again is a very important thing oral contraceptives are being used then metabolic syndrome we call double diabetes again is a very important finding <coughs> and what to do please give a thought about coronary artery disease and at least a basic workup ecg you look i mean even a simple random ecg we find a finding and if the patient is symptomatic please go for tmt or echo at least and the management is lifestyle changes good control from the beginning because i shared with you if the good control is there in type 1 the long term macrovascular incidences are much lesser lipid protection i think after 10 years of diabetes in adolescent age group they should be given protection by lipids and now this is a question sclt2 and glp1 should be given or not in type 1 there have been reports and it was earlier approved that sglt2 can be given and they found a reduction in weight reduction in hba1ac and sglt2 are so promising dr anurag was saying that my understanding is they have a very strong cardio renal protective properties so those of you type 1 now sglt2 is not recommended in type 1 because they have found high incidence of diabetic ketoacidosis so because of this this is not but those who are doing very well they understand they can hydrate themselves they can take it you can write out off level sglt2 glp1 again would be a very controversial topic but i put forward if you want to discuss we can then autonomic neuropathy look at the erectile dysfunction we seldom talk i am a young boy 25 years is sitting in front of you and you are not asking of erectile, erectile dysfunction for what you are endocrinologist or pediatric endocrinologist you should ask i mean this is thing that i wanted to generate and what was found that it is similar in mdi and pump patients and at least 50% above 20, 25 30 years of type 1 diabetics have some sort of erectile dysfunction so this is very important you need to ask so please please ask from all your patients female sexual dysfunction and it was a study i am quoting around the the female dysfunctions are also very common but you need to ask i was asking dr mahila major uh, the the pediatric endocrinologist the female population is quite high 60% so at least you can take advantage of gender ask your female patient if there is any problem in arousal lubrication satisfaction all these things are then if you find many of these ladies will have problem and female sexual dysfunction functions are significantly compromised in in this age group <coughs> are you aware how many of young type 1 diabetics are sexually active i think three of uh, us were discussing there is a meeting in diabetes india and the the major um, ladies were talking to ladies because they are more uh, frank but i also talk to my, my patients more than 50% active but all right they should be active it's all right but are we talking about contraception are we talking about infection are we talking about safe sex i think we should keep in that that mind and then finally are we talking about pregnancy so we simply tell that for pregnancy you have good control but prior to that pregnancy the user relationship that has to be kept in the mind so please prime your patients and maybe you brief them how to go with the safer sex when should they start using oral contraceptives <clears throat> and finally a bit of my work i think i i had a spared oral presentation 
This was the cohort analysis for glycemic control and microvascular complications. Resource contained type 1 diabetes. So we had a paper on type 1 diabetes and resource contained and lack of, and what we concluded that lack of individual self-motivation and parents' motivation could be a possibility of deterioration of disease. However, financial concerns. So, so motivation is lacking in type 1 in many respects. I'm, I'm very much uh, motivated by Dr. Ahila who said that my all patients are doing so well. I'm, I'm very strongly motivated. This is not happening at least to my patient. I mean, we'll take your expertise, but this is the problem. They're not very strongly motivated. Very recently, we had a paper on uh, Pediatric Endocrinology Journal on schools. Schools, I think a lot has been talked by Dr. Chetan, so I'll not be going into detail. So this was another paper. I think, thank you, Dr. Anurag and my entire colleague. I think this is the only worldwide presentation on type 1 diabetes and meditation. Nobody has done this work on type 1. And Dr. Anurag has very nicely guided us. So I'll not be going into it. I think I was looking at my what I did. I wrote a chapter on this, uh, this uh, CDICs, Children for Diabetes, uh, as a clinical examination. So I think exam start how to examine these children. Maybe there is a time we, I think Dr. Nanaj will discuss. And finally, this was one of the meeting in Lucknow where all type 1 children are taking a candle and I wrote a caption, lighten your and every type 1 diabetes life and greetings so much. But we have also been doing, a, I think a, for 26, 27 years, every fourth Sunday, a regular education program, both on type 1 and type 2 diabetes and it is uninterrupted. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Any comments, questions? Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Sir, so, so there uh, a question we regularly ask by the parents, especially who are very much uh, dedicated and motivated. Are these complications are inevitable? I think the answer I have, I have given. The key is uh, early management. The key is initial management. And then whenever patient comes. In type 2, um, I'll share my experience. The similar trial to this DCCT was UKPDS, United Kingdom Progressive Diet. And they were certain at conventional versus intensive control. And then when diabetes is 10 years, 12 years, 14 years, the, the outcome is not as good. So initial control is key to success. When you control initially, they are going to live near normal life. Thank you, sir. With this message, I would like to convey one more message to the, to the audience that if you diagnose a child with type 1 diabetes, don't give any options. You are not treating malaria half-heartedly. He is shattered. He might be arranging money, but say MDI with, with short acting and, and no and lentus is the only option. Don't give further options so that you can initially save that time as assisted by sir to avoid the complication. To avoid nephropathy, it's better to shift, shift on over rapid and, and lentus. Don't talk about no big start. It's the only option available to you. So bombard this in the other mind. This will help, I suppose, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot, Dr. Vikas. Thanks a lot, Dr. Rishi, for this wonderful presentation. I'll now request Dr. Dhwani to kindly hand over the mementos to Dr. Uh, Vikas and Dr. Pradeep. Dr. Vibha and... So it was a long session, but it was a very fruitful session. We discussed everything about diabetes. And what is remaining, we'll be discussing in the next 45 minutes or so, which will be focusing more on genetic aspects. So till now, we talked about different aspects. We'll talk more about genetic aspects of diabetes. So thanks, uh, Dr. Vikas, Dr. Pradeep, for this long uh, session. Dr. Rishi, for really having this wonderful uh, part on that. So I think we will now move forward with our last session for the day. So we are running around 15, 20 minutes short uh, ahead of time. But I hope that uh, we should be able to catch up. So all of you will have a dinner at the right time. Maybe 9.15, that's what we are looking at. This is going to be a session which is going to be largely a case-based discussion. And uh, for this session, I'll also be inviting Dr. Dhwani who will be there, who will be posing many of the questions. So for this session, I will now be inviting the... Uh, the experts who will be coming uh, and who will join us on the stage. 
and uh, definitely the we'll uh, this will be a very good session because we have got stalwarts from different parts of the country in this session i'll invite dr subrato day who is as we have already seen such a wonderful orator as well as the wonderful uh, uh, developer of pediatric endocrinology in the eastern regions dr subrato please come up on the stage dr ahila ayavu who is the president of ispe who will be part of this program and uh, thanks dr ahila again who gave a wonderful talk on uh, the newer insulins dr riddhi who has already talked about neonatal diabetes please come up i think dr rishi dr rishi dr rishi you will be <clears throat> you will like to join or you have a engagement i think okay so dr rishi has some personal engagement so he'll leave so we will be uh, transferring the question of dr rishi to some of you basically because he has some personal engagement to go forward on that so this session is largely about genetic glucose disorders and what we'll be discussing and dr subrato all of us know about him he is a wonderful uh, speaker and he has done fellowship training in us and he has been uh, around the globe he is a globe trotting person who has gone through every part of the world and well known everywhere so we don't need the much introduction for him dr rishi we already listened to him dr ahila is the ispe president we discussed and dr riddhi also will listen so we'll switch over quickly because we want to not interrupt your dinner too much we'll talk about two basic topics monogenic diabetes and hyperinsulinism so monogenic diabetes is a very very important part of diabetes as we discussed maybe 2 to 5% will have it but then you will have huge implications in terms of diagnosis treatment and other aspects which are relevant and you need understanding of this very importantly this graph i have already told is stable so individuals with modi will typically be ones which are lean with strong family history three generations which are being involved and typically they will have up onset usually after puberty that's a typical thing we'll discuss but we'll also show cases who may deviate from this phenomena so modi basically would be the ones who are 10 to 25 years of age who have autosomal dominant inheritance three generations involved and they have rarer acanthosis and ketosis and these parameters will be important and again gad antibody is pivotal so don't uh light off type 1 diabetes just because the requirement is less so when do you evaluate for genetic causes in apparent type 1 diabetes if you have reduced or no insulin need and detectable c peptide beyond 1 year of diabetes and if you have a strong family history and antibodies negative in what you think of type 2 diabetes if they don't have any obesity or acanthosis you think this is the graph that we already shown with regards so if you have a onset before 6 months of age think of neonatal diabetes after 6 months of age you have a lean individual with no insulin requirement negative gad antibody think of monogenic diabetes the monogenic diabetes could be insulin deficiency or insulin resistance the most common form is glucokinase defect which is basically a defect in glucose sensing so they will have mild fasting hyperglycemia then the levels don't go up the more important ones are hnf 1 alpha and 4 alpha which will have a more persistent hyperglycemia and they will respond to sulfonylurea you also need to think of renal anomaly especially in hnf 1 beta which becomes relevant and insulin resistance like scenario acanthosis which will happen with lipodystrophy like syndromes so we'll start off with the cases uh, dr uh, um, dhwani yeah the first case we have a 15 days old uh, baby girl with failure to thrive had a low birth weight of 1800 grams and at 15 days has a even less weight of 1600 grams she's sick looking has a blood glucose of 425 uh, mg per deciliter no ketosis but and appears dehydrated so think... the important uh, thing to uh, am i audible yes yeah. yeah looking at this basic data uh, this is a uh, are you gr or a preterm uh, whatever so yeah, you're, you're, you know. so <clears throat> So sixteen hundred grams, the baby has lost weight, sick looking, and uh, is ketone negative. So this is hyperglycemia, because for all uh, in the audience, I'm sure that point six and below is ketone negative. So point two ke um, nanomol is uh, so there is a neonatal diabetes out here. 
So that's the impression looking at this. So uh, management wise? The so management wise is, as uh, Anurag had mentioned and the earlier speakers, is don't waste time. Insulin, small doses, uh, you can give basal bolus, you can give small uh, doses of short acting insulin, but yes, rehydrate and give insulin. So beyond this, what is the important investigation wise? How will you go forward in this case? See, basic thing is you have to understand that this is in the neonatal age group. And I think the most important resounding message for the evening is it is now very clear cut, not only in the 2022 ISPAD guideline, but even the earlier ADA criteria, below six months, if you have onset of diabetes mellitus, first and foremost, consider some genetic cause. And I think this should resound because, you know, way back 10 years ago, I had a baby with neonatal diabetes. And in those days, we didn't have access to uh, genetic tests, which we now clearly have. And uh, there are many, many resources available. So there we continue to treat with insulin. And very interestingly, the baby outgrew the insulin. And I think, let's see what happens with this case. So this uh, child was again, not uh, could not afford to get a genetic test done and improved over time. That's right. So improved over time means with time, the insulin requirement went away. And so everybody was happy, especially the parents and mostly the relief doctor, the cello balato hat senegal here. But in reality, this today in today's day and age, we know differently. And this is called transient diabetes mellitus. Anytime it disappears between one month and 18 months, it's called TNDM with the caveat that they can again relapse up till 18 months of age. And worse still, it can come back and hound Dr. Rishi Shukla if he's still here, an adult diabetologist, much later. Yes, so I follow up. At 12 years of age, this child had polyuria, high blood sugars, and an HP1C of 8.4%. And so what happens, and just to very quickly just enunciate what uh, Dr. Anurag so elegantly spoke in the 20 minutes of rapid fire type 2 diabetes, is for some reason monogenic diabetes does not strike the mind of the adult endocrinologist, diabetologist, and sometimes us as well. So it is very important to ask that history in every patient, even with garden variety type 2 diabetes, was there any sugar problems in infancy? And so I in think fact, this, this child right. came to us with the second presentation, and then we took the history, okay, That's he had right. some diabetes. So this is what's so the point. This is a very important point that if you have a child coming to you in the adolescence, as Dr. Anurag had so well said, is that's the point, a cusp point where we really have to look at all the options. But yes, uh, was started on insulin. We did the genetic test. And mind you, genetic test in a child who doesn't fit the Modi profile, three generation lean, non-obese, and all that. It's because there was a past history of transient neonatal diabetes mellitus. And it changes life with sulfonylurea, off with insulin, in with the drug. So I think very good method that genetic analysis is mandatory for neonatal diabetes in this day and age. Maybe 10 years ago, it was not available. Early onset neonatal diabetes may be transient as we discussed. And it recurs as Dr. Subrato said and responds to sulfonylurea in that case. Moving on to the next case. So now we have a two-month-old boy. Later <laughs> presentation as compared to the previous case with failure to thrive. Had a near normal birth weight. And now uh, at two months is only 2,800 grams. Has hepatomegaly, myopathy, and neurological weakness. Very high blood sugar, HbA1c of 9.9. .9, and an hypertriglyceridemia. So uh, Dr. Ahila, ma'am. I think uh, oh, it's working. Yeah. yeah. So the presentation and the discussion, I think Subrata and Anurag and Dhwani have already finished everything. So it's uh, typical again, it's a two month old boy. So as already mentioned by Subrata, it has to be worked up for neonatal diabetes. Uh, the main, uh, well, probably the point which would help you towards uh, focusing on some particular diagnosis, myopathy and weakness 
which actually comes with some forms of neonatal diabetes. And they may be associated with hepatomegaly too. But that weakness is something which really triggers, a, a, what do you say, a red flag in your mind to watch out for something. Because the most important point is early pickup of these patients and giving appropriate treatment can save them from neurological sequelae in early life, I mean, in later life. Because delay in diagnosis can definitely harm them in the long run. So <clears throat> they've already started, as mentioned by again, Subrata, that uh, basal bolus with small uh, quantities of uh, bolusing with a short-acting insulin, and then a targeted panel and a KCNJ11 defect. Because of the myopathy and weakness, yes, it is probably a dense syndrome. Uh, and this dense syndrome, it's very difficult to predict the long-term sequel. Even yesterday, I had my patient with dent. You're not sure whether it was the diabetes which harmed their neurology or the uh, mutations that are manifested in the neurons in the CNS, which actually led to the long-term sequelae. But yes, there are a lot of thoughts on whether early start of sulfonylurea could have saved these children much and had a better life. I think that's a very, very important point that it's not just the glycemic control, it's the potassium channels in the neurons. And if you not activate at the right time, you will have a problem. So that's the very important. So people say, okay, we cannot afford, we'll continue insulin. You're not only missing on giving sulfonylurea, you're missing on this neurological outcome which becomes very, very important, very, very valid point. So again, we are talking it many times. We are looking like a brand ambassadors for maybe some of these genetic testing groups, but definitely every child should have a genetic analysis. It's freely available also through the Madras Diabetes Research Foundation who do this for free. And late onset, as we saw, could be permanent and genetic testing will give you a clue in that regards. 12-month-old girl uh, with failure to thrive had a birth weight of 2,500 grams, had RVS of 360 and normal ketones, no ketosis, family history of consanguinity, and this is the x-ray that we see. I would like to pose this question to Dr. Riddhi. Um, and I think this was the case Riddhi had seen yes. here on the... So this is the uh, little bit later presentation at one year of the age, uh, and child presented with significant uh, failure to thrive. Sugar was high, there was no ketosis and history of the consanguinity. So that suggests some familial forms of the diabetes and the x-ray suggests you of small phalanges. So uh, there is some problem in the skeletal development. So this can be a skeletal dysplasia. And uh, yes, so X-ray suggests you have small phalanges. So when, uh, whenever the diabetes associated with some skeletal problem, skeletal dysplasia, especially spondyloepiphyseal uh, skeletal dysplasia. So uh, a Volcourt relation syndrome comes first in our mind because it is uh, frequently associated with the skeletal dysplasia. And also there was uh, this uh, Volcourt relation syndrome is caused by this EIF2AK3 gene. And this is a uh, homozygous defect. So you may find history of the consanguinity in the family. It's in so fact the most is... common uh, diabetes in consanguinous yes. family. Yes. But we do see a lot and often people used to say that this is a fatal disease. They will have liver dysfunction and they will die by one month. We have seen so many cases, five years, six years, 12 years who are surviving. And there have been reports from Dr. Baman as well. I think you were also mentioning about the report. Yes, please. Just a point. I think uh, I'm not sure. I welcome all of you to the ASIS meeting. And Dr. Mohan was uh, and his team was talking yes. about the um, a neonatal diabetes and the monogenic diabetes. They said Wolcott uh, Rallison is quite common in India and they said that was a third common mutation yes. that they were seeing. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was quite interesting because it's supposed to be very, very rare. But and and we said, always heard that it was fatal when we read it earlier in the textbook, but now we are seeing cases who are like pretty good. They're doing reasonably well. They have got a lot of digit abnormalities and I think fingers become very, very important. I think Riddhi had seen this girl who had come to right. us. Right. What are the skeletal dysplastic features in these uh, children that you have seen? So this, there was some epiphyseal... Uh, Predominantly epiphyseal small epiphyseal. phalanges which were there. There was like a acrodysostosis like picture which was looking out like resorption of digits. That's what was the, there. But there was no significant skeletal yeah. dysplastic. And the and hepatic... They were, short. they were also short. Short, but with not the, hugely with, short. Not like a proper... Uh, a short trunk. Is... No, no. Predominantly the fingers we found in this case. And mostly a couple of cases I've seen is this, this sort of phenotype. So if you have any skeletal abnormalities, always think of this. I think that's the message from the general audience we would like to give probably. So Volcott... genetics of uh, Volcott relation is like uh, the misfolded protein accumulates yes. and then causes beta cell apoptosis. So onset can be delayed as long as three to four years. So literature yes. is... So it's more like a double hit model. So if you have a later onset quote unquote neonatal diabetes, think of two conditions, insulin defect 
and Walcott Rallison. These are all later onset presentations. They are not like, they're like star defect, which presents a bit later than CAH. Same thing happens. It's a double hit hypothesis. So anybody in the consanguinity, if you have a family history, skeletal dysplasia, monitor for SGPT. Often it's maybe bad, but we didn't find any problems in these cases. Two month old boy with failure to thrive, high blood sugar, history of skin infection and diarrhea. I would like to, and had GAD 65 positive. So why did you do a GAD positive GAD antibody at two months? So again, uh, less than six months, we think of uh, genetic causes. Yeah, I think but he has given the clue. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, this is a. So is know, it type one, Dr. Subhan? No. That is the interesting thing that all that is GAD positive is not type one. But having said that, not the garden variety type one. Let me put it that way. Yes, GAD positive means there is an immunity problem. It immediately doesn't transfer to a garden variety type one. Now, uh, I like uh, Anurag's these uh, bullet presentations because they give you all the nuggets which I will encourage the doctors in training to be looking for. So he has looked at skin infections or dermatitis or eczema. And he has looked at diarrhea, which is an entropathy. And then he has asked for the GAD 65 because it is a pattern recognition. Out of the blue, a two-month-old will not get GAD 65 done. This is the message. That ultimately, it's all clinical and not algorithmic. It's not that you take a protocol or a guideline and go down. It is still cognitive. You have to see, and that's where your clinical acumen. So you have a two-month-old, failure to thrive, diabetic, with you know some skin infection, dermatitis, with diarrhea, which is entropathy. Some red flag is running in your mind. Next slide, please. And this, so this is the immune defect. That's so right. So this is your IPEX, which is immunoregulatory defect with polyendocrinopathy with entropathy and x linked so it's only seen in boys and the important thing is that uh, if you recognize it you'll be looking for other polyendocrinopathies like the thyroid disorder and then they have the eczema and uh, thrombocytopenia. So it's a pan disease and the type 1 diabetes needs it. And Riddhi presented very well that they need a very aggressive course. It's a bad prognosis disease, of course, and they will ideally need a hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. It's a difficult one. Do not give them uh, immunization. So it's a, it's a challenging disease. It will require a proper workup in that. So early onset immune diabetes, it's actually the earliest immune endocrinopathy. We say men 1, men 2. This is the first one to come out. Multi-system involvement. Think of a progressive, which may be a fatal disease also in that regard. 16-year-old girl with increased urine output underwent a screening investigation, which showed RBS of 258 and HbA1c of 8%. Ketones 0.8, so just the mild ketosis. Now, BMI is 16, and uh, that is she is underweight and has no acanthosis. She was, so she was labeled as type 1 diabetes. Or started on insulin therapy, she developed recurrent episodes of hypoglycemia. I would... So, Dr. Rishi is not there. We, they will take over this case, okay? So, this patient, a uh, 16-year-old girl and a uh, typical presentation of DK, uh, initially managed well with the insulin and uh, started with the uh, insulin. But on insulin therapy, uh, she had recurrent hypoglycemia. Uh, and even off therapy for more than a year. Okay. So, and we got a C peptide done also, which is detectable. But so, I have a question. You know, the ketone of 0. 0.8 means there was ketonuria. Uh, Do they have ketonuria? So, this was, was not really DK. It was like ketotic diabetes. It was managed on our, probably on our outpatient basis. So, it was ketotic. It was ketotic, mild ketosis. Mild, mild, ketosis. mild ketosis. Mild ketosis. Which is indicated by the HbA1c also. So, this is the flag. These are pointers that you said that you, when you don't have that high HbA1c, you don't have ketosis, it can still be type 1, but start thinking, okay, this is something else also going on in that perspective. 
So, Riddhi, now what will you think of? So, typical presentation sense? like type 1 diabetes, but uh, the markers are lean individual, no ketosis, requirement of insulin is very, very low. So, suggest uh, some monogenic form of uh, diabetes and also GED was done. That was negative. That also points that this can be monogenic defect. And uh, the genetic testing was done, suggestive of HNF alpha defect and that responds well to sulfonylurea. Was any family history? Uh, yes, there was a family history which was because noted. That on, is one on, thing I would put there. Yes, yeah. So that was there. History. We deliberately didn't put it in that regard. So often we don't take that much details. But later on, he had a sprang uh, family history on that. So HNF one alpha defect clearly I just discussed is a defect in which you have got a transcription factor modi. So your fasting levels will be high. Post meal may not be very high. It's a progressive disease. They respond very well to the uh, management with sulfonylurea as Riddhi has already mentioned. So sulfonylurea at a very low dose, you can also use a GLP-1. So this is the opposite, where the fasting is okay. That will come, that will come. No, there, That case will come, I think. No, GCK. That, that case is where the fasting is high, the postprandial, GCK. Uh, postprandial is normal. Yeah, so I think, yeah, so GCK, I think we might have skipped it out. So the second type Modi, type 2, which was the next case, I think we have removed that case, is when your fasting is slightly high, but your post meal becomes normal because your glucose sensing is defective. So body is not able to recognize till a particular level after which says, okay, come down. So this is opposite of glucokinase deficiency, which is a mild diabetes, does not require you. But Modi 3 is the commonest. Modi, Modi yeah. These one will be the Modi most common. The yes, commonest yes. Modi. The commonest Modi is GCK. It is not picked up. No, Modi 3 is no, still no, the no. common. No, no. If you look at the prevalence study, if you actually study genetically, it will be the most common. Nobody diagnoses them because nobody gets their sugars checked. This is the most commonly identified form of, which is absolutely right. That's what you're saying. Is the most commonly identified form of diabetes. But the actual, if you ask, GCK deficiency is absolutely common in the community. 5% GDM patients were found to have actually GCK, uh, GCK deficiency. So you removed the GCK case. I no. think I uh, will see. No, it, no. Then it's very important to talk about GCK to say it is very much present. Hmm. And then you pick up GCK because some alert uh, subspecialist sends the patient to you saying that the sugar is a little all right. The fasting is high, but the PP is normal. Yes. What do you make out of it? So there again, gene study and you get the diagnosis and she's walking around scot-free without medication. But with the caveat, when you get pregnant, Better come back, you might need insulin. Yes, that is a very important message. So HNF and 1-alpha mode is lean, low insulin requirement, three-generation family, do a targeted panel, low-dose sulfonylurea. We have a 15-year-old girl with osmotic symptoms, has a high fasting sugar of 220, two-hour postprandial is again 380 milligram per deciliter, has an HPA1C of 10.4, presence with DK and has started on insulin. She is, however, lean, has no acanthosis and family history of diabetes and mother. Has fluctuating sugars on insulin had to be stopped uh, from insulin therapy? She takes one unit of insulin. Her sugars will go down and then high. So it's like a very mess. And this has been now there for one and a half, two years. So yeah, that's a typical uh, red flag for watching out for Modi or monogenic diabetes. Whenever beyond one and a half to two years, you are still on less than 0.7 to one unit per kilogram per day. Then you're looking at some other diabetes other than type one. And then lean and does not have any other features of type 2 either. But there is a strong, strong family history of the mother also having diabetes. And Again, I think grandmother diabetes. also had that because she came in the onset course, I think that this girl came. Yeah. But there's one point, you know, nowadays I'm convinced you don't need the three generation. Yes. Because this identical case, I have just diagnosed in a 14-year-old boy who have been treating as type 1. He takes one unit and he gets hypoglycemia. And you may have de novo mutations. So, of course, you can have a de novo mutation. So, this concept was when the genetic testing was not easily available. Now, I think when you have a doubt, we took very good criteria in which if you have tracking, you should get it done because it will change a lot of factors and we'll see how it changes here. So, what we found, she had multiple renal cysts and mother also gave a history of multiple renal anomalies. So this was a very, very interesting case of HNF 1 beta. So we have now the HNF 1 alpha, 1 beta. So how do you go in terms of further management, Dr. Ahila, from here? Again, uh, for any diabetes, when you diagnose, you always start an insulin. But when you have this fluctuation.
definitely so if we compare the three most common forms which we are discussing one of course is hnf1 alpha that you will manage very well with sulfonylurea hnf1 beta you would need insulin here or there later and gck is the best except for pregnancy that was a very very important point if you have a mother who has diabetes but the child is also affected no problem but if the mother is affected and child is not affected that will be a problem then the child will develop macrosomia so in that scenario you monitor the child's weight and if you see a baby who is developing features of uh, overgrowth or something fetal overgrowth then you treat with insulin in the mother otherwise glucokinase deficiency is a benign condition doesn't require treatment but this condition have you actually encountered this is the case we saw this case in the on site you did no yeah yeah so this is the same ultrasound we showed so insulin resistance temporary role and it will be lost usually insulin will be required ultimately so hnf1 beta is fluctuating renal cyst progressive disease insulin requirement is there uh, we have a 11 year old girl diagnosed case of type 1 diabetes at 8 years of age uh, requires insulin about 1 unit per kg per day has visual complaints and was taken to an ophthalmologist who uh, gave uh, diagnosis of retinopathy so i would like to ask this question to so dr riti so i she developed such early retinopathy she is the girl uh, diagnosed at 8 year of age and within 3 years uh, she developed retinopathy and this is falsely uh, interpreted as this is the diabetic complication early diabetic complication but she was on only 1 unit per kg per day of insul uh, insulin requirement was less even uh, and her control was also good. control yeah. was good. so on controlled diabetes uh, we don't expect retinopathy very early so in this case we have to think of the uh, genetic cause especially wfs1 uh, that is the wolfram syndrome which presents with diabetes followed by optic atrophy and followed by the uh, diabetes insipidus so if you have a very early onset first decade involvement of non immune diabetes and eye symptom that is the most common constellation for did mode now di may develop later on optic atrophy will develop earlier deafness may develop uh, dr bifina will be presenting a very interesting case tomorrow in which she actually had deafness also and di also so generally we say second decade third decade but you may have or it's a genetic condition it may present whatever you can't say that you will have to do this to present dr ahila yeah, i have had quite a few of these ulfram because i have a huge uh, uh, what patient with diabetes and uh, retinopathy refers they are all progressive the long term it's a very bad it's a it's a bad disease the neurological uh, outcomes yeah. they gradually evolve and not a very good for a long so it's period. a bad it's a bad disease i would say two bad diseases are ipex and definitely this wolcott rallison don't be too worried about it's not that bad in that regards the only thing about wolfram is the one which we have been following is uh, this kid is kind of chugging along presented with diabetes <clears throat> then developed di <clears throat> and some you know i uh, impairment which uh, was actually a mild optic uh, you know optic nerve uh, involvement but uh, he is lost to follow up because he is 18 but till 18 he was coming you know ever since now and then uh why do you say that they are uh... so they have a very bad renal and a cerebellar outcome death is usually by 30 years so it's a bad bad so it's like third decade only they have bad prognosis so it's not a good disease to have neurogenic degenerative disorder it's basically a endoplasmic reticulum stress disorder so anywhere you have got those endoplasmic reticulum gradually it will keep on hurting and that would be the scenario we have an 11 year old girl um... so, so if you have a non immune diabetes of early onset with optic atrophy deafness and di may be late manifestations okay so we have this case 11 year old girl on routine investigation was found to have a higher fasting blood sugar and a normal postprandial blood sugar she was lean had no acanthosis and an hba1c of 6.4 and non ketotic uh she was started on insulin because of the high hba1c and developed hypoglycemia so this was actually referred from an adult as you said and they thought to start insulin sugar is high fasting is high but developed hypoglycemia so uh dr rishi is not there also brother this is your favorite case then we yes, i think this is still there here <laughs> yes yes there normal uh, 
I mean, normal in the sense, as he as uh, as Anurag had pointed out, uh, very important that 100 to 126 is impaired glucose tolerance, and this is impaired glucose tolerance. But this is not, uh, you know, diagnostic of diabetes, and neither is the postprandial diagnostic of diabetes, and is not even in the impaired uh, glucose tolerance. So this is the a classical test. presentation of uh, GCK defect. Yes. So you will have very little rise. So opposite of HNF 1 alpha, 3 alpha, 4 alpha, where you have high fasting and PP will be, uh, fasting will be not very high, but the delta will be very high. Here the delta will be very less, less than 40 is generally what is recommended. So this is classically a glucokinase modi. It's basically a condition in which you don't need to treat. Usually we already discussed this about that. And manifestations of fasting glucose, limited prandial rise, and HbA1c will remain stable throughout that. The only indication for treatment is if you have mother who is pregnant and the baby is not effective. So then you will behave like IDM. So in that case, you will have to control. And the, the other caveat is, yeah. which I faced in this chart, is you must write in block letters because if they need surgery, yes. if they need some, immediately people do a fasting blood sugar. And they will say, is a diabetic? You better get a clearance. So you write there, this patient is fit for surgery. Yes, I think this is a very interesting case. Uh, Moving on, we have a 12-year-old boy with polyuria, history of developmental delay, hyperphagia, infantile hypertonia, fasting sugars of 140, two hour postprandial of 220. And this is the clinical image of this child. <laughs> this is for Dr. Subrit. What do people think about this boy? Yes. <laughs> this is a classic Prado will. And the only thing is, the uh, the diabetes part is unfortunate, but it does happen, and it is very difficult to treat because it increases their appetite, and they eat like crazy. And guess what? The drugs we had were only metformin, and I had a patient I followed for six years. He doesn't like metformin; has loose stools. Hates insulin. And guess what? At that time, GLP-1 analog wasn't there. So if there is one medication we want to give this kid, is a GLP metformin, GLP-1 analog, and SGLP inhibitor. Because and in fact, there are studies on Pradavili without type 2 diabetes also where GLP-1 receptor analog has been tried. And the newer one, the semaglutide in an injectable form has been used in Pradavili. Yeah. Correct. And semaglutide has now been since December 22. Obesity. For obesity, it has been passed by the FDA, hmm. where you give an injection once a week. But yeah, unfortunately, that's a problem that we don't have that injectable hmm. semaglutide. We've got the oral one, but maybe we can try that. By the but time. apparently the oral one uh, the, is not big it, enough. Yeah, it's, the, it's not big enough. You have to give a high dose, 2.4. Yeah. No, 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 not yet. We prefer in a weekly dulaglutide, as Dr. Subrato said. So I think uh, this is a very challenging case. Diabetes is just one part of the story. He will have huge number of problems. Sleep apnea, he had, uh, he was there, in fact, in the ICU. He was ventilated. I think Manoj was there at that time. Uh, probably Viva was also there. So it's a very, very stormy course. And if you give me just one minute, yeah. uh, in fact, uh, this... I want to share, not because of anything else, is as pediatric endocrinologists, we have a huge role uh, in not only diagnosing these things, but motivating the family. Because last year, two days before Diwali, I lost a 12-year-old who weighed 120 kilos, who had everything, had sleep apnea, type 2 diabetes, had hypertension, and pulmonary hypertension. And this child, unfortunately, came to my orbit with about six, eight months before, made him lose weight. He was 
he was in BiPAP all the time, even during daytime, but he started walking without oxygen. From that stage, the parents, they felt they can manage it all because they have been managing it for the last seven, eight years without seeking any medical assistance. And so then I get a call three days before Diwali, lost to follow up for six months, that he's not waking up, he's unresponsive. He was a diabetic too. So I did the blood, uh, blood sugar karo, 285. Then I said, bahut jaldi ke, you go to our ER. I alerted my team, my team was ready. It was a DOA, death on arrival. So Prader Willie, you have to actually nurse them. And on the other side, the son of the current Prader Willie president, She's from Bengal. I don't want to name her name for you know confidentiality. Her son is only 82 kilos and is six foot two inches tall. So, which makes me feel that I should probably repeat the fish test or what. But anyway, this so it can be done with Moti. So I think this is a very, very challenging condition. Of course, much things have to be done in that regards. 17-year-old girl with hirsutism had an FGS score of 21, amenorrhea, severe acanthosis, but a BMI of 16. So she was a lean phenotype, had high fasting and postprandial blood sugars, uh, and ultrasound showed large only with a PCO appearance. So she was one of the most severe PCOS that you will see, but she was lean. But when you looked at the neck, she had very, very severe acanthosis and developed diabetes. So Dr. Ahila, I think you take over. Right. It's a lipodystrophy syndrome because uh, she's lean, though she's a lean PCOS like uh, because of the large uh, ovary, the PCO appearance, the, particularly the uh, Ferryman Galway scoring of 21, amenorrhea, and uh, as he mentioned, the severe acanthosis in the neck. That And if you look at the hands, it's a very, very important clue. They have slender, long, and you can see the veins stand out. You have absent fat, they look like a muscular, but actually a weak muscular person. And that's a very typical clinical feature of lipodystrophy syndrome. So you have a spectrum, a hair AN syndrome, yes. hyperandrogenism, insulin resistance, acanthosis, nigricans, which can become more severe into the other forms of lipodystrophy. They're very, very difficult to treat. It's quite heartrending to see the girls go through this, but they do ultimately well, but we don't get... Uh, all the drugs are not available in India, but uh, they are on high-dose insulin. And many times they develop virilization very severe and that becomes a problem because this hyperthicosis will cause testosterone in 200-300 mg per DL. You'll have clitoromegaly. It's like a mess. Alopecia. I have seen all sorts of problems. So this is a bad condition again. Uh, very high-dose metformin. I had given GnRH analog and entire... Uh, aldectone, everything was given, but it's a difficult one. Yeah, to I've treat. seen the whole spectrum of all the life food dystrophy. Don't know you, Raps and Mandenhall, this one, and the worst forms of uh, Baran Ali, Saibson. So we'll now quickly move towards the hyperinsulinism part. So we should think of hyperinsulinism if you have persistent hypoglycemia, which is non-ketotic, and your reducing substance is negative, and you have a detectable insulin. So essentially, Detectable insulin in a child who has got no ketones, think of hyperinsulinism. And very importantly, hyperinsulinism has got a sensitivity of only 82%. So in 18%, you may have a, nor a zero insulin also. So this is also important. You have to be aware of that. C-peptide may be a better marker. So people talk about C-peptide, but ketone is a very good marker. If you have hypoketosis, it's got a 100% sensitivity and specificity. Some people tend to look at glucagon response as well. You give glucagon and everybody who is hypoglycemic should not respond to glucagon unless they have hyperinsulinism because it's an antidote to insulin and low IGBP. These are rarer scenarios. So anybody who has a high GI. Yeah? But this is basically what uh, venous plasma plasma. Uh, This is basically uh, in terms of uh, after the, in the presence of hypoglycemia. Uh, yeah, so it will be like below 50. Yeah, yeah. That is the definition. Mm. Having said that, this one caveat there, which I have seen over the years, mm. is if you take at the, what happens is when you take at, uh, uh, when the glucometer shows a number, usually in the lower levels, the glucometer is not that accurate. Yes. So you'll get a number like 40, 
But when you send a plasma venous glucose, it comes back at 50. You know? So this is actually from one of the big studies which had come from UK, yeah. which looked into the sensitivity specificity. Huh. So the message is C-peptide is also a very helpful test because it has got a longer half-life and insulin we discuss in the morning will be very labile. So often insulin, how it is carried also becomes important. C-peptide right. is a robust test to look at. So increased insulin effect can be because of increased insulin levels. We're largely talking about congenital forms, which can usually be, I'll be focusing on monogenic forms largely and very rarely you can have increased insulin action. So we'll focus mainly on the monogenic forms of hyperinsulinism and one scenario of prolonged hyperinsulinism. So how do we approach? If you diagnose hyperinsulinism, you give them dextrose, start diazoxide right away. Diazoxide is easily available. Start from 5 to 10, go up to 15. Within 5 days, their sugar should become normal. If they are responding, then your job is very much done very well. You may do basically in the form of giving, uh, getting ammonia level, which will diagnose you GDH. Otherwise, you continue diazoxide. Problem happens. a genetic study or specifically looking for the potassium ATP channel. So genetic study with potassium ATP channel, both for the father and the mother. So if you have basically a recessive defect, if you get the mutation in both these cases, in that case, clearly it is mostly a diffuse disease. So a homozygous K-ATP channel defect is, a, uh, is basically an uh, extensive disease, will require surgery. It's a very, very difficult scenario. However, if you have a paternal defect, heterozygous defect coming from the father, this could be a focal disease. And in that setting, you can do a PET and you can avoid surgery. Now, this is easier said than done. Many cases, you will not get a diagnosis. We have a child whom we are going on. Our CT was normal. Our every genetic study was normal, but he's responding to diazoxide. But then we realize that his one month cost is 20,000. He's requiring so much diazoxide. So it's not an easy disease. Here we have said, okay, diazoxide continue, but how long to continue for a poor family will be an issue. So main approach over is start diazoxide, response good, no response genetics, and then imaging. That's what we will say in that perspective. So I, have, I have one caveat to that because in real terms, how a baby actually comes to us? They have a baby in the nursery or in an ICU who is hypoplasic. Now, who among all of you are neonatologists? Anybody here? Because the message for any neonatologist or general pediatrician is refer these hypoglycemic patients to a pediatric endocrinologist soon rather than at the age of seven days, 10 days, when you are the, you know, at your wit's end. So one real-time scenario I want to just inject for just, you know, 30 seconds is if you have an IUGRB who is not being able to keep the sugars up, who is non-septic, these babies, oftentimes when you do a critical sample, you will find low sugar and high insulin, you know, two, three, four, whatever. And these babies respond wonderfully to that. So this is the case. This is the case. This is the case. This case which we are presenting is the same one. Okay. So you are somehow predicting our cases. <laughs> no. The important message why. No, this is vis-a-vis -vis what in the general algorithm you say. Yes, said. yes. Yeah. So you start them on dioxide. If they respond jolly well. But then they are not scrawny. They are actually a little macrosomic. Maybe infant of a diabetic mother. Maybe a Beckman, uh, Beckwith Whiteman. Or maybe just a genetic baby, there you give disoxide and then you move to octreotide. And you stay on octreotide because of one such baby who's on octreotide even now, diagnosed as diffuse disease by genetics as well as by DOPA screening. But the treatment still remains. So are you giving the long acting one? You know what? I have zero experience with the long acting one. Okay. And yeah. so. If you have... It's a good uh, one, actually. Yes, it's a good one. I will take your thing. But mm -hmm. well, the child has been lost to follow for the last three months, but they have been taking the injections. Yeah. So we'll. this is exactly the case which Dr. Subrato said. We wanted to so, show that everything is not genetic. So you have to think of other things as well. Yes. 14-year-old boy uh, had birth asphyxia, admitted in ICU, had low blood uh, sugar, despite being on GIR, having high GIR requirement, 
ketone was negative, insulin was detectable in uh, presence of hypoglycemia, had a birth weight of 1.6 kgs. So, I would Dr. Like <laughs> so, Dr. Subrata has already discussed that this is prolonged hyperinsulinism basically. This is because of the hypoxia inducible factor because they were in perinatal stress and the body has accustomed to this state and that's why they're producing more insulin, which may be a safety mechanism. You can, I just have some few points to add, not only pertaining to this. So, gallium exandin actually yeah. gives much better uh, results for uh, scanning of the uh, hyperinsulinism. As you already mentioned, spending so much money, even long-acting octreotide is also quite expensive. Yes. And we don't get too many patients at the same time to share the cost. Yeah. And the dose also seems to be just sufficient for one child. So in the long run, for some families who can't afford, we still offer pancreatectomy. Because we just want to save the child. And even in focal disease, I have not been very successful with uh, just focal surgery. We have had to convert it into near total pancreatectomy again. So it's again, so if you respond very well to low dose, if you have this form, you are happy. Otherwise, life is not very simple. That's what the message would be. And uh, just one point, one single episode of hypoglycemia can damage the brain forever. That is why, as Dr. Subrata said, don't wait too long. Any neonatologist, you have significant hypoglycemia, refer immediately to preserve the brain. And the length of stay, preserve the finances. Yeah. So prolonged hyperinsulinism, basically in birth asphyxia, SGA, no macrosomia, of course, and stress, severe hypoglycemia, which lasts to six to eight weeks. This is the best outcome you will see, basically. Three days old boy with severe hypoglycemia had a birth weight of 4.6 kgs, high GI requirement and a negative ketone. Insulin was detectable in the presence of hypoglycemia. So, Riddhi ma'am, if you could take So, this is the typical case of hyperinsulinism, uh, detectable insulin at the time of hypoglycemia and non ketotic. Uh, uh, as Sir has discussed, we have to give diazoxide trial, and diazoxide was started at a dose of uh, 10, mg 10 mg per kg per day, and then it was uh, increased to the 15 mg per kg per day. But uh, uh, Still, there was hypoglycemia and uh, the baby was not responding to the higher dose of uh, diazoxide also. So, we started with the glucagon infusion and uh, genetics was sent, suggestive of uh, potassium ATP channel defect. Homozygous, homozygous. homozygous form of uh, potassium ATP channel defect. So, this was a diffuse disease, uh, require uh, to surgery uh, anyway. So, in these sort of cases, what is your experience with long-acting octreotide? Some of them respond quite well. What, what do you use? Uh, the, uh, Somatostatin. The, the one, uh, the yeah. sun farm. Yeah, 20,000 to... Hmm. Yeah. So uh. We calculate, I go up to 40 my, my, micrograms per kg per day. Total uh, accum cumulative dose for a month and then give it. And one of my... my, patients, my. So one of my patients actually has been on long-acting octreotide now for almost more than two, two and a half years. On a monthly dose, totally well doing extremely well. So I just uh, take the cumulative dose and they just come for an annual follow-up because they're... When you transition, how do you transition? Once the child settles with the short-acting octreotide and are able to maintain their blood glucose, then I convert it into a long-acting. No, then you just abruptly stop the short-acting and give the long-acting? No, I put the long-acting and then gradually wean off the short-acting. Because the dose may vary depending on each... No, how much case. of dose have you given through the day till Correct. you achieved... You glycemia, and then I calculate that as a wholesome dose days. for the, yeah for thirty days, and then put it. And it's usually quite high. It goes up to even forty. I just had a question for you. So, how many of you start uh, diuretics when you start uh, diazoxide? Not true till we skip that slide. Oh, so I basically, do, but, you know, I yeah. Do. So yeah. I would I do, do usually after three four days we find fluid retention okay. and we'll start with thiazide. One message: never start frusamide because frusamide will potentiate the effect of diazoxide. You will have decay. I had seen a case which was referred in Australia a long time ago with a similar thing. Somebody gave fusamide and developed DK. But yes, we I agree that thiazide will be helpful also in other forms as well because of the potassium effect as well. Now, just for one second, this is mainly a debate really. What you said, you start low, then build up. Now, in our cost-cutting scenario, what I've found is you start high and mm -hmm. rapidly you reduce it over the next three, four days. You can come down to 5 mg per kg per day and then maybe just send them on that and stop it after a week. So, yeah, so protocols definitely. So, we started around 10. You will start probably at 15, 15. or something. That's fine. But very importantly, think of cardiac overload. Maybe many times we get an echo done. There are a lot of other issues. 
renal dysfunction may happen so you have to be careful dioxide is not the same you must get an echo done because, <laughs> because they can get a cardiac overload. open yes exactly and uh, you will have platelets. So there, it's not an absolutely safe drug, but it's the drug which is very good. It's easily available now. And uh, Jolly Pharma is available. So I think that's a good thing which has happened from that regard. So this case, again, is a very severe form. And if you have this case, you would need a pancreatectomy most likely. 18 days old boy with hypoglycemia at a birth weight of 3.4 kg. High GIR requirement and ketone of 1.2 millimoles. Insulin was again detectable in the presence of hypoglycemia. Uh, so, so, sir, maybe you could take this case. So, it's slightly different from the last one. Not much different, I think. Hmm. The weight is lesser. And ketosis. And uh, the ketosis is there mild. So, it's a bit different hmm. from the last one. So, again, you will start with diethoxide. I think that's what we have discussed. And what but we why is there hyper uh, Why is there ketosis? So if sometimes if your insulin is not very high, you may develop, you may go up to 1.6. That's why they have used the criteria of till 1.6, you may have ketosis. And if you use less than 1.6, you have 100% sensitivity, 100% specificity. So on follow-up on diazoxide at 10, there was no improvement. Hypoglycemia was there. But on analysis, we got the pattern. So this was a okay, second. Okay. So this, this is, is more like a focal. Disease. So it's a milder disease. The focal disease. Yes. So, so on a focal disease, I must say this, that uh, just a caveat to the previous case. So we gave octreotide, the sugars didn't stay up. And then we had to do on site, we did a near total pancreatectomy. And that baby went home and is now lost to follow up because the sugars are totally fine. Maybe we'll come back with diabetes later. But I had a focal disease presenting at six months of age. And that baby's lesion was so close to the head that the pediatric surgeon said, I'm not going to operate on the head. So focal disease itself doesn't mean that you can operate and come away. Yes. There are some nuances there. It's but definitely. I think the message here is you are, it's a heterozygous and you have done the Sangers on both the parents, isn't it? Yes. You're sending all three. Yes. That is the important thing. So rapid genetics, that is the recommendation of how often you will be able to do it is different, but ideally you should do for all three. So if it's a heterozygous from the mother, doesn't matter. Heterozygous from the father is what you will have this focal disease because this is like a two hit model again. That's what we have written two hit. So we have not gone into theory specifically in this one because it's all available, all the resources. So what we did was on that focal, we did the scan first and the genetics later. Okay. Yeah. So if you have access to but, a scan and... But to no avail, patient went Lost to follow up. So early onset, normalish birth weight may have a paternally inherited KATP defect. Focal surgery may be effective in this scenario. 21 days old girl with hypoglycemia, birth weight of 3.2 kgs, high GI requirement, had ketone, again negative ketone, and insulin detectable in the presence of uh, hypoglycemia. So, Riti, you will take this one. Hyperinsulinism and uh, 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 she uh, she was also given a diazoxide trial. And uh, uh, she had a very good improvement, improvement in diazoxide. Uh, GIR was reduced down. Ammonia was on the higher side. Uh, that suggests uh, that may suggest the HEHA uh, syndrome. That is the hyperinsulinism, hyperammonia syndrome. And uh, this found to be GDA defect that responds well to uh, diazoxide. I think this is a quick clue that if you are responding to diazoxide, get a ammonia. It will be like 100, 120, not too high. You know it's a defect which will continue on diazoxide. Low dose will continue on this. But again, this coast become very... I know it's a long-term treatment is very yes. difficult. But what do you do? Like uh, you have to, otherwise option would be to remove the whole because they don't have a focal lesion. So again, this is a late onset, normal birth weight, diazoxide response, high ammonia, which will be there in that scenario. So the di diazoxide gets rid of the ammonia, is it? No, no, no. Ammonia is a different mechanism altogether. It does not affect anything. It is not, it's just a marker that GDH is not working, is activating mutation of the GDH. But your ammonia is not doing any harm. So you don't treat that ammonia. So GDH meaning? Uh, glutamate dehydrogenase. So this is the activity in which the activity is increased. So your internal ATP levels increases. So we've got three defects, GCK activating mutation, you've got the 
uh, SCAT, which is the fat pathway, and this is coming through the protein pathway. This was known as the leucine sensitive hypoglycemia, so in which your put a protein dependent ATP production is more. So if you take more of a high protein diet, you will develop hypoglycemia more in this case. HADH mutations causing hyperinsulinism. I've had yes, two patients. Yeah. So if you take non-witch, they typically have land up with uh, uh, hyper, I mean, hypo, hypoglycemia. And that mother was very specific. The day she takes fish, she's uh, gone hypoglycemia. So earlier they used to say leucine and, sensitive, yeah. protein and sensitive. She, she grew out, as they grow older, they, some of them grow out of Many of these disorders, like even these things, these are milder defects. So later on, you may be able to eat so much, you don't develop hypoglycemia. A 12 days old boy with lethargy was found to have hypoglycemia, low, uh, no ketosis, insulin was detectable during low glucose and had a birth weight of 4.2 uh, kgs, had umbilical hernia and ear crease. Uh, Ahila ma'am? Typical, um, uh, your ear crease and I back with Weidman syndrome, the birth weight, everything. I have one boy, only thing we are just watching for future complications because they are at higher risk for malignancies in later life. But otherwise, uh, the child is doing quite well. So generally, it's a transient hypoglycemia, dioxide responsive, and often they will behave like a prolonged hyperinsulinism, which will go off in that regard. So I think this was a mammoth discussion. We covered 15 cases exactly in an hour. So I promise 9.15. It's 9.17. So I think it was uh, on time. And it's been a mammoth session right from uh, around 1.30 we started. No, actually, we started at 11. So it's been going on now for around nine hours. I think your energy is amazing. But uh, you must introduce the presenter. Yes, Dr. Dhwani. Dr. Dhwani is our fellow. She is our, new, our now second in rank in terms of the, the order. Dr. Dhwani is from uh, Jalna in Maharashtra. She did her uh, graduation uh, from GMC Nagpur. GMC Nagpur, post graduation from PGI Chandigarh, and then trained at AIMS, and then she has joined in fellowship, ISPE fellowship recently. Wonderful. So I think uh, this because was a wonderful. She's got a voice like, you know, in the airline. <laughs> I, I, I like the way she presented. Very... She might have recorded for all the voices, maybe. No, <laughs> I like her throw because it gives you no clue at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think this was a wonderful program and just we'll be having dinner now to cure all the hypoglycemia which is there. A lavish dinner is there. Just a few uh, points. 8 o'clock tomorrow we're going to start because a lot of people have flights. So we don't want to delay the presentations. The, uh, the breakfast, more, many of you are staying here only. So breakfast will be starting from 7. So we can start dot at 8. We have got very interesting case conundrum session. There are 7 cases. Dr. Sobrato has got two wonderful cases. Dhwani is presenting, one Vibha is presenting, Dr. Bifina, Dr. Nitya and Dr. Anushal is going to be a very interesting one to start off. Then we have a session on uh, latest developments and that we'll talk about growth hormone, long-acting growth hormone, novel treatment of growth by Dr. Ahila. I'll talk about uh, non-GHD indications and then we'll talk about refractory records, Dr. Sobrato and two big similar grand rounds on calcium and then on testis. So this is going to be a packed one. We want to finish by around one o'clock so that a lot of people who want to leave, they leave uh, safely, that flights they can catch up because it's raining also. So it's a monsoon coming up there. But I think this was a wonderful session. I'll thank uh, all Alapan. I think they deserve a big round of applause, Alapan, Vibha and Dhani. They have been standing on one feet for the last four days. So I think tomorrow we'll get some rest from there. And thank all of you for being here for such a long time. There's a lot of audiences there. And even on the internet, there are, I think, 20 people who are watching still from the morning. So it's still the numbers are going on. So it's a long one. So thank you all. We will join again tomorrow exactly at 8 o'clock.